Patience. Symbols of Love series. Written by Leah Connolly and published by Starfall Publications. Available on Amazon and free with Kindle Unlimited. Enjoy. Chapter 1. This really is beyond the pale. The Earl of Chester was not generally a man given to yelling. His tenants and compatriots all held him in high regard as a patient, reasoning sort. His eldest son, however, was enough to drive any man to lose hold of his temper. At least that was what the Earl had told, well, shouted at, his aforementioned eldest son on a bright, sunny late summer day. The London season was well and truly done, and the ton were departing for other locales. The dining room was bathed in warm morning light, and the table was laden with coffee, ham, buns of every description, butter, and a selection of small cold pies. The Earl had been in the midst of reading the newspaper. His wife, the Countess of Chester, was in a morning dress and a light shawl, thumbing through invitations and letters. And their younger son, Jack, was doing his level best to wolf his breakfast down without looking like he was. It was, in short, a scene of domestic bliss. If one stopped their ears to the shouting that had commenced the moment that Lord Tom Norman, oldest son of the house and heir to the earldom, had made his appearance, he very much wished that he could have stopped up his ears with wads of cotton. He was not one for early rising, and was already rankled at being summoned at such an ungodly hour. He was still bleary-eyed with a head that was subtly pounding when he had made his entrance, trousers and shirt hidden beneath his quilted dressing gown. His hair, a dark chestnut hue that favoured his mother, was tousled into charming disarray, or so he liked to think. It had only been two hours at most since he had fallen into bed. Being awoken at the crack of dawn by Stolton, the redoubtable and stony-faced butler, was not how he had envisioned spending his morning nor was receiving a lecture at such a pitched volume. When his father had fixed him with that withering look Tom hated so much, he knew he was in trouble. He had not yet even sat down when the shouting began. His elegant entrance was completely spoiled and was reduced to sitting heavily in a chair at the foot of the table. Tom managed a glance at Jack, who only gave him a tight-lipped grimace. He could usually count on Jack to forewarn him about any coming trouble, but all he managed to convey this time was that it was not the usual mischief Tom was due to be lectured about. Automatically, Tom's eyes shifted to his mother, who was steadfastly ignoring him. Well, dash it, Tom thought grimly. You have caused some adulpated mischief before, but this, this is the final straw, the Earl continued folding the newspaper and slamming it down on the table so hard that the cups and plates rattled and the family seated around. Leaning forward, he pointed one finger sharply down the table at Tom. This will not go unpunished. You have my word on that. Tom, affecting a great show of being unworried, blinked languidly at his father. May I at least know the nature of the complaint, sir? You have disgraced yourself and this family, was the snapped reply. Tom pulled back a little, stealing a querying look at his mother again. The Countess met his eyes only briefly, then glanced away, her cheeks colouring and her shoulders slumping a little. His father's disappointment and anger he could be bare, was used to it even. But his mother's disappointment, that was new, and it stung. I, I... If I might know what you are referring to, Tom tried again, stammering uncharacteristically. Usually words came easily to him, perhaps too easily if certain acquaintances were to be believed. Therein lays the problem, the Earl said, placing both hands flat upon the table. His greying brows were knitted together in consternation. You find yourself in so many fixes that you do not even know which has landed you in the pot this time. Tom shot another glance at Jack, who steadfastly looked down at his plate, clearly trying to stay out of it. Tom turned in his chair, crossing his long legs elegantly while gesturing with a flick of his hand to his coffee cup. A footman darted forward to fill it, then withdrew. All of this was in an effort to give Tom a moment to think. Everything from last night was in a haze still. 
The Earl watched this display with obviously mounting irritation. Your cool manners will not work on me. I am not one of your ivory-turning friends. Tom shrugged one shoulder and nodded in acknowledgement of the truth of that remark. With all ease and careful manners, he lifted his coffee cup slowly and inhaled appreciatively. Sir, if you might simply tell me what I have done this time, then we might all get on with a perfectly enjoyable breakfast. The sudden scraping of chair legs across the floor heralded the Earl's sudden rise to his feet. Still holding his linen napkin, he gestured sharply at Tom. No, we certainly shall not. Your perfectly enjoyable time in London is at an end. I shan't be funding your carousing for one day longer. It is high time that you recollect yourself and your station. You're banishing me to the country a whole week early, Tom asked, his lip curling slightly in amusement. This was a good cover, as in truth he detested the country, finding any and every excuse to make his way to London or Bath. The Earl laughed mirthlessly. Oh no, dear boy, you mistake me. You are not welcome under my roof until you prove yourself respectable enough to do so. In the meantime, we shall see what we can do to mitigate your latest stunt. Very well, I still have my flat in. No, you do not, the Earl interjected. When I tell you that you are cut off, my boy, I mean it. You will not receive another farthing from me until I am convinced you are worthy. Tom simply stared at his father for several moments during which there was not the slightest sound. No scraping of forks on plates, no clearing of throats, not even the servants could be heard breathing. Everyone was staring either at Tom downward, waiting to see his reaction. He was not unaccustomed to being stared at, but it was always on his terms. He was not used to being stared at in humiliation. You can't cut me off forever. I'm still your heir, Tom replied, only a little petulantly. It was the only card he really had to play. For now, the Earl said, his voice low and cool. That can easily be changed in favour of your brother. At the mention of himself, Jack looked up, stricken. Father, please, you know I... Very well, Tom said, rising from his seat and lifting his chin grandly. Since my company is distasteful to you, Father, then I shall remove myself. I will need a few moments to find suitable lodgings. Go to your cousin, my nephew, the Countess said, lifting her warm brown eyes to her wayward son for the first time all morning. He is lately married and at his estate. Tom's eyebrows flew up at the suggestion. Oh, Mama, you can't be serious. The Duke, he's so, so... Tom trailed off, unable to find an adjective that wasn't wholly untoward. Wooden he finished at last. The Duke of Brandon is a respectable peer of the realm, and I will thank you kindly to remember that when you address him, the Earl snapped, and I do not believe it was a request. He is the only relative who would take you on such short notice, and some time under his charge will do you good. Yes, I cannot wait for endless lectures on the joys of duty and familial obligation, Tom groused inwardly. He did not give his father the satisfaction of complaining aloud, however. Instead, he made a polite bow to the table at large and swept from the room. It was only when he had crossed the grand tiled hall and was halfway up the stairs that he realised he had not even had a sip of his coffee, which he was sorely in need of this morning. And there was brown sugared ham on the table too, he grumped, his elegant posture slumping as he tromped up the stairs. I love brown sugared ham. Whatever he may have done, he was fairly certain that it didn't warrant a man to forego breakfast. A quiet knock interrupted Tom's packing. Well, at least, his overseeing of the packing being done by his fastidious valet, Pickens. The two were in disagreement over the necessity of packing a tawny velvet jacket when the knock came on Tom's dressing room door. Come, Tom said, making a great show of holding up two different pairs of gloves to study them. Jack's coppery head poked into the room. Oh, good, he said, sighing in evident relief. I had half expected to come up here and find you back in bed. The thought did cross my mind, Tom admitted, waving his brother inward. Do you like the green or the grey gloves better? I personally favour the green, but there may be occasion for shooting, which will make the grey the better choice. 
Jack simply stared for a moment. Well, and here I was thinking you were taking this seriously. Tom straightened and met his brother's level blue gaze. I am taking this with all the seriousness it is due, he said, turning away quickly and tucking both pairs of gloves into an open trunk. Are you? Jack said, taking Tom by the shoulder and peering into his face. Tom sighed, closed the lid of the trunk and sat on it. The old man will come out of his rage in a couple of weeks. I'll be bored to tears until then, but nothing I can't manage. Jack shifted, his eyes widening a little. I'm not entirely sure you understand the gravity of the situation here, Tom. Father received a note from Lady Stanton at the crack of dawn and nearly turned purple when he read it. Lady Stanton? Tom's brow furrowed as he thought hard, memories of the night before flashing dimly through his mind. Suddenly his face fell and the colour drained from it. Oh, Lord Lady Stanton, he repeated, dropping his head into his hands. Jack watched all of this happen, only frowning a little severely at Tom's choice of words. So you begin to understand what you have done? A little, Tom admitted. I must confess to being rather in my cups last night and don't entirely remember what transpired. Well, you had best recollect quick-like and find a way to get yourself out of this fix. I've no interest in being the heir, especially not an earl, Jack said firmly, sitting next to Tom on the trunk. Despite his turmoil, Tom couldn't help but regard his younger brother with amusement. None at all? Still longing for the life of a quiet country parish, then? Every time you come home and tell me of one of your capers, I only become more convinced that I have chosen the right vocation, Jack replied dryly. Tom barked out a laugh. Well, I do have that effect on people, I suppose. He sighed, watching Pickens walk back and forth with stacks of shirts and cravats. Well, at least the season is already over. Tom stood, straightening his cream and burgundy-striped waistcoat and reaching for his dark green jacket. Pickens, ever the particular valet, darted forward and helped Tom shrug into it effortlessly, smoothing invisible wrinkles. Tom, I really must ask, Jack said, also rising and eyeing all the accumulated luggage. How on earth are you going to manage all these cases? What do you mean? Tom asked distractedly, trying to choose between a dove grey and a caramel top hat. What I mean is, how do you expect it to travel with you? You can't possibly fit it all in a hack, Jack said slowly. A hack? Tom repeated, confused. Why would I... Oh, oh, that's just petty, he groaned. Father did say that you were cut off. Jack said simply with a shrug. That means the carriage. Tom cast a despairing look about him at the assembled trunk, cases and hat boxes. I can't possibly fit it all in a hack. Wait a moment, he said, another terrible realisation dawning on him. I'm not even sure I have the notes to hire a hack. Down to your last bob, hm? Jack said. With a grin, he withdrew a stack of banknotes from the inner pocket of his plain dark blue jacket. I thought you might be. Jack, no, Tom said, remembering that he was in fact the older brother. He gently pushed the stack away, shaking his head. Tom, yes, Jack countered, thrusting the notes at him again. I'll be fine, I can... Tom paused to swallow distastefully. Take the stage. Well, at least let me pay for a seat on the inside for you. Wouldn't want to ruin that lovely new hat of yours, hmm, Jack said, playfully thumping Tom on the arm. Sighing, Tom accepted a portion of the notes. Banished from London, cut off, sent out to a dreary cousin's country estate in the middle of nowhere, he groused. What else could possibly go wrong? The worst part of all was that he still wasn't entirely sure what he had done. A different man might have reflected on that, but Tom was not that sort of man. Chapter 2 Window her breath fogging the glass. Though the view outside could not really be called scenic by any stretch of the imagination, the flat rolling fields were as new and exciting to patients as if they had been an exotic landscape. Though the destination was two days' travel from London, for patients it may as well have been a trip around the world. 
The day was cool and dotted with grey clouds, but this did not dampen Patience's enthusiasm in the slightest. Across the carriage, her mother's Abigail did not even bother to stifle a sigh. She had told Patience at least a dozen times to sit back in her seat and be still, as befits the daughter of a duchess. She could not help it, though. She had never been allowed to take a journey of this length before. Well granted, it was only a couple hours, and it was to her older sister's new home, but this was a taste of freedom that she had never experienced before. As the carriage passed beneath the grand stone and iron gatehouse, it was all Patience could do to keep from bouncing in the finely upholstered seat. The maid sighed again. Please, my lady, I beg you, please sit still. This carriage bounces quite enough on its own. Oh, but look, we are here now, Patience said, pressing her face even closer to the window. And indeed they had arrived, the carriage pulling into the circular drive. The house rested proudly at the end of a tree-lined lane, with a fountain at the centre of the drive. It rose above perfectly manicured lawns, its edifice supported by columns. It was a study in perfect symmetry and proportion, a part of the landscape rather than merely a feature. Patience inhaled appreciatively, allowing herself to be awed for a moment. This feeling was short-lived, however, for standing at the top of the stairs that led to the grand front entrance was a tall, familiar figure. The carriage had barely pulled to a stop before Patience had flung the door open, not bothering to wait for the footman that darted forward. She nearly tumbled out in her excitement, righting herself and dashing forward to the waiting arms of her sister. Annabella! she squealed, arms thrown out wide. Annabella, the newly minted Duchess of Brandon, was a little more tempered in her excitement, but no less enthusiastic. Though they were relatively new at this whole sisterhood thing, having only just discovered each other within the last year, both had embraced the notion wholeheartedly. Patience smiled openly at Annabella, who grinned down at her, holding her shoulders so that she might fully inspect her. Though Patience was shorter than Annabella, they had similar bronze-hued hair, though Patience's was straight where Annabella's waved. Patience did not have the stately grace and features of her older sister, but her face was undeniably sweet and heart-shaped, with round cheeks and a delicate pink mouth. I'm so glad you're here, Annabella said, tucking Patience's hand into her the crook of her elbow and leading her into the grand house. I've been longing for company. This big house feels so terribly empty sometimes. Patience tilted her head upward, craning so that she might see the ceiling of the grand entrance. It was painted in a geometric pattern, with a massive glass lantern hung directly in the centre. I can see why, she murmured, mindlessly reaching up to untie the ribbon that held her bonnet in place. Now, I've nothing planned for this evening, so you may rest and recover from your journey as you please, Annabella said, gesturing forward a waiting maid to assist in removing Patience's travelling cloak. We shall have a quiet dinner, just the three of us, you, me and the Duke. Oh, Patience said, her face falling just a bit. Don't you worry, Annabella said, smiling and playfully pinching Patience's arm. I simply wish you to be rested for the activities we've planned for the rest of your stay. There shall be riding and playing at bowls and shooting. Shooting? Me? Patience asked, pausing in the act of removing her mauve-coloured gloves. I suspect we both need the practice before we are invited to any shooting parties, Annabella said pragmatically. We are safe to humiliate ourselves in front of each other, rather in front of the ton. Patience grinned in reply. It was a very fine thing indeed to have a big sister. Annabella guided her up the stairs and through the winding halls, letting Patience take it all in. More than once, Patience caught Annabella smiling gently, indulgently at her. At last, they arrived at a sturdy wooden door, richly carved and painted white. Annabella bestowed an airy kiss on Patience's cheek and promised to see her before dinner. The rooms that Patience were shown to, that would serve as her private apartment for the duration of her stay, were bright and airy. 
they faced the rear of the house, with a fine view of the gardens and rolling fields crossed with stone fences beyond. She had been provided with a maid, a girl with bright eyes and a round figure that seemed generally well pleased to be waiting on the daughter of a duchess. Patience sat patiently, letting the maid chatter on as she unpacked the trunks, not really listening but enjoying the humming of her voice. Patience was settled in a cushioned window seat, her shoes kicked off and stockinged feet tucked up under her. Her mother would never have approved of her sitting in such a manner, but then that was rather the point of this whole trip. It was not long before that a trip of this nature would have been entirely out of the question, unheard of even. Patience had lost her father and older sister before she was even born, and as a result her mother, the Duchess of Carnegie, had developed an overzealous protective streak for her surviving daughter. And then, like a miracle, there was Annabella, alive, so clever and capable, and ready to love Patience as if they had never been apart. For all her excitement, one might have thought she was taking the grand tour instead of merely visiting her sister and new brother-in-law. It was a small, tenuous step into freedom, but Patience was glad of it, nonetheless. If she were being completely forthright, it was also a little frightening. She had a strange, exhilarated feeling in her chest. She was not usually one given to flights of fancy, but she had the strangest feeling that something new and wholly unexpected awaited her. Naturally, Patience was not expecting the wholly unexpected thing to occur as soon as dinner was begun. The Duke, her new brother-in-law, had escorted both herself and Annabella into dinner, and they had passed a companionable hour all together at the table. Patience liked the easy, teasing way that Annabella and the Duke had about each other, and she couldn't help but sigh a little each time they grinned knowingly at each other. Though rain lashed harshly at the grand windows, the dining room was warm and surprisingly cosy, with a grand fire burning in the fireplace. The conversation and the excellent meal was interrupted by the arrival of the butler, Stowe. Forgive the interruption, Your Grace, he began, bowing slightly. Yes, what is it, Stowe? the Duke asked, clearly more focused on gazing warmly at his wife. Patience ducked her head, suppressing a giggle. There is a man that has come calling, the butler replied. This caused all heads at the table to swivel as one to look on him in surprise. A man? What man? the Duke replied, his handsome brow beetling slightly. He claims that he is Lord Tom Norman, son of the Earl of Chester, the butler explained. But he has arrived with neither case nor a man, he continued, lifting his nose and sniffing at the indignity of such a prospect. My cousin, the Duke said, glancing at Annabella. What on earth can he mean coming here? This had better not be a lark of some sort. You'd best show him in, Stowe, Annabella said after only a moment's hesitation. The butler took a fraction of a second to compose himself and withdrew to admit the interloper. I feel I should warn both of you my cousin is... Well, he's a bit of a... the Duke said, searching for the right word. He glanced at Annabella and then at Patience. Not to put too fine of a point on it, but he has a bit of a reputation he finally concluded with a significant look at Annabella, who glanced at Patience. Ah, Annabella said with a knowing nod. What? Patience demanded, looking from one to the other. The Duke looked to his wife again. Cousin Tom is a pink of the First Order, the Duke explained carefully. He's known about London as something of a dandified rake. Patience was just at the point of answering when Stowe returned, a young man in tow. The butler walked with his nose so far in the air that Patience was not entirely sure how he could see where he was going. Lord Thomas Norman, the butler announced, stepping aside and allowing a full view of the young man. There must be some confusion, Patience thought immediately, as this fellow resembles a drowned kitten, not some society dandy. Lord Tom did indeed have the aspect of a creature half drowned, his brown hair plastered down on his head, and his greatcoat weighed down from the water. Still, Patience could not help but favourably note a chiselled profile with sharp cheekbones and a dimpled chin. His hat and gloves were clutched in his hand, dripping, much like his hair. Tom, the Duke said, rising from his seat. Good Lord, man, 
Did you walk here? Why on earth didn't you send a note? To his credit, Tom did not appear to note his somewhat bedraggled appearance. To Patience's eye, he appeared to swagger forward to take the Duke's hand with as much ease as if he were dressed in a king's robes. His limbs were long, and though he moved gracefully, it was an ambling, unmindful sort of movement, as if he were completely unconcerned about the state of his natural bearing. Hello, Alan, Tom said in a light, pleasant voice. I do apologise for catching you at table, and especially to the ladies for my somewhat lacking appearance, he added with a bow in the general direction of the women. I found it necessary to travel by the mail coach and walked up from the village. Why didn't you send a note? You must be chilled to the bone, Annabella said, rising and taking Tom's arm to guide him closer to the fire. For his part, Tom watched Annabella's solicitous concern with a somewhat bemused expression. Ah, you must be the charming new duchess I have heard so much about, he said smoothly. Cousin, I congratulate you on your excellent choice. Patience frowned. Though his words were all politeness, he bent his words strangely, as if there were a hidden meaning to them. It was like he was used to speaking for an audience, hoping to win approval. The Duke was rushing to make the proper introductions, which were a bit tight due to the circumstances. When he got to Patience, Tom bowed prettily enough, but his eyes passed over her in such a way that she felt as if she had been assessed rather than introduced. I must apologise for my debris appearance and beg your hospitality, Tom said, clearly missing the blank way that Patience stared at him. My trunk is still in the village, and I have only what I stand before you in. Of course, let us get you some dry things at once. My husband's valet shall see to you, Annabella said immediately, all warmth and genial manners. Would you like some dinner on a tray? You must be exhausted. Once again, Tom seemed somewhat perplexed by this generous and genuine speech. He took Annabella's hand and patted it quickly. Thank you, fair cousin. May I call you cousin? You are a rare treasure indeed. Patience was not particularly well versed in the ways of the world, nor society at all, really, so she could not really place the strange feeling she had. Annabella herself was showing Tom to his rooms, and he seemed induced to treat her civilly. Despite the polite phrases that fell readily from his mouth, Something in his manner made Patience uneasy. Though it was an irrational thought, the image of a cat sprang unbidden into her mind, all soft fur and pretty purring until the claws came out and took a swipe. Chapter 3 After wringing himself out in a series of drying cloths and finding himself in dry but borrowed clothing, Tom was feeling much more the thing. The clothing was not to his particular taste, but well made with little embellishments that added a sort of country charm to them. He was very much amused to find a tiny green butterfly embroidered into the lining of his waistcoat, right where the Duke's heart would be. Tom had just finished an excellent, if someone cold, repast on a tray when there was a knock on the door and a footman entered. His Grace requests an audience with you in the library presently, he announced. With a sigh, Tom stood and threaded his arms into the grey jacket that had been left for him. He imagined that his cousin would not be particularly impressed by his arriving in only shirt sleeves before the ladies. To his surprise, and then apprehension, the library he was shown into was only occupied by the Duke himself. Tom was not much of a reader, so he did not fully appreciate the scope of the shelves, stacked floor to ceiling with books. There was such a collection that there was a ladder set on wheels to reach the upper shelves. What Tom did appreciate was the thick Persian rug before the fireplace in shades of red and purple. Situated just right to take advantage of the warmth and light of the fire were two thickly stuffed chairs in a dark, polished leather. There was the customary desk and some lecterns holding open volumes, but these weren't particularly noteworthy as far as Tom was concerned. The most pressing thing in the room, however, was the Duke. He waited for Tom with impeccable posture, looking every bit the country nobleman in his tawny-coloured breeches and polished black boots. He stood with one fist on his hip, his fair head tilted as he observed Tom's entrance. Apologies for keeping you waiting, cousin, Tom said immediately. 
He had a policy of always apologising for something small right out of the gate when it was clear a disagreement was incoming. It disarmed the other party more often than not and set a more genial tone. Not to worry, the Duke said easily, gesturing to the chairs before the fire. I trust my valet found you something comfortable to wear. It's dry and warm, which is the greatest possible compliment right now, Tom said, settling himself carefully in one of the chairs. If a bit roomy, he added, just a little bitterly, he could not boast the same broad-shouldered physique as the Duke. I shall send someone to the village for your trunk at first light, the Duke promised, settling himself into the chair opposite. Very much at ease, he crossed one of his legs over the other, stretching his boots toward the fire. Do you remember that time we climbed the cherry trees and ate ourselves sick? Tom started his dark eyebrows rising. How could I forget? Your father made us help with the harvesting as punishment. The Duke laughed softly. Not much of a punishment really since I believe we ate our fill all over again. Tom hummed non-committally, unsure where this was leading. The Duke seemed inclined to let him stew, however, and Tom wasn't going to dissuade him from this tack. Tom wasn't some deb in her first season. He had navigated more drawing room intrigues than he could remember. As it was, the Duke was content to stare into the fire, reminiscing if the wistful look on his face was anything to judge by. I believe that was the last time you were here before my father's funeral, the Duke said conversationally. Was it? It may have been, yes. It was, the Duke confirmed. As I recall it, that was also the occasion when you claimed that you would rather walk over hot coals than return to a place so boring and inconvenient to socialising. Well, I'm not sure I meant... Tom began. I believe your exact words were, I've had more fun in a mausoleum, the Duke countered dryly. I can't help but wonder now what it is that brings you here. I have to assume it is because your father has chased you to me. Tom could feel his temper rile up against his cool facade. That had ever been one of his faults, and he had worked hard over the years to become a man of composure and coolness. The problem was that it was entirely true and it was impossible to outright refute it. So he decided to settle on honesty. I may have gotten myself into a bit of a fix, Tom admitted. The Duke said nothing but arched an eyebrow at his cousin. I myself do not even have the full facts. I only have the vaguest recollections. He trailed off, looking down at his hands. He was not sure why, but away from the crowds of London, in the home of his honourable cousin and his sweet wife, Tom's actions felt a little unsavoury. I imagine there was a quantity of wine involved, the Duke supplied. Tom nodded sheepish. Well, punch more like, but I suppose that is not the point. More importantly, Lady Stanton has a very charming daughter. There was a ball a few nights ago, sort of a send-off for the ton, and Lady Eve Stanton and I, we are old friends, you see, and it we... Let me guess, the Duke broke in. You were found in a dark room, alone with Lady Eve, in a compromising situation. Tom winced but nodded. That seems about the size of it. Her mother began yelling down the heavens, but I don't remember any of it. I know that I was in my cups, that much is true, and we were alone, but beyond that, I could not tell you. Well, that is a fix indeed the Duke murmured, shaking his head. I assume you are prepared to safeguard the lady's reputation. I certainly do not intend to spread it about town, if that's what you mean. No, the Duke said slowly, leaning forward. You intend to marry her, in order to protect her good name? Tom couldn't help but splutter out a laugh. Good God, man, no! The Duke reared back at this, his expression caught somewhere between surprise and anger. Well, that is about the answer I expected, he said lowly. But I can't say I'm not disappointed. I understand why your father has driven you out now. Now, that's not entirely fair, Tom protested. I have no way of knowing that I have damaged this girl's relationship. It's no secret that her darling mama is on the make, doing her best to reel in a fellow with a title before the blushes off the rose. The Duke simply stared for a moment 
weighing Tom's words. Tom hoped that his cousin, so recently married, could remember what it felt like, being a bachelor with good expectations and a title. Who needs hunting safaris when the London season is on? Tom thought sardonically. At last, the Duke spoke, leaning back in his chair again. Very well. You may remain here for the time being, until the truth of the matter is sorted out. I would urge you to be on your best behaviour. You've no other cousins to run to. Tom stared, feeling the weight of that true statement. Feeling well and truly caught, he at last nodded, his brown hair flopping into his face. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button this way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. Unfortunately for him, the effect was quite lost on the Duke, who had zero patience or regard for his boyish charms. The Duke rose, offering his hand to Tom, which he took eagerly. However, the Duke pulled Tom a little closer, and staring at him directly in the face said, If I find that you are lying and taking advantage of my good name, I will be very, very disappointed. Though Tom was a grown man, only a couple years younger than the Duke, he swallowed reflexively. Whatever his bravado and fashionable manners might indicate, he was in truth a very sensitive person. He did not care to disappoint others or have them think less of him. Now how about we join the ladies? I'm sure they are desirous of our company, the Duke said, jovially thumping Tom on the back. Inwardly Tom groaned, Oh, will the joys never cease? I shall now have to pay court to a pair of dowdy country rubes. Do you mean he is notorious? Patience said lowly to her sister, trying to keep her voice down lest they be interrupted. They were seated quite close together, their heads nearly touching as they looked at fashion plates from Paris. Before them a fire was crackling merrily in the salon, in defiance of the cold rain that still pelted the windows. I'm not sure I would go that far but the whole family is apparently in despair over him lately, Annabella replied, deftly turning a page. I cannot say what has brought him here, but I know Alan, and he was surprised to see him here. Patience considered this. Well, it could be he hopes to get up a shooting party as the season is concluded now, she remarked. Hmm, Annabella hummed in agreement. Maybe. He does not strike me as a man familiar with country pursuits, though. He really does not, Patience agreed with a giggle. Did you see the cut of his jacket? It's a wonder he could breathe. Annabella laughed softly. Perhaps it's best he left his trunk behind then. Oh, look at this one. So many flounces at the hem. Oh, made from a shot silk, too. You'd look a dream in it, like you were floating on a cloud. Patience could feel her face growing warm the old shyness taking root again. Oh no, not me, she stammered. I was the centre of attention enough already at that ball I made you attend with me. Don't worry, darling. No one will ever put you on the spot like that again, Annabella said with a reassuring pat of Patience's hand. But, well, I can't help but think that maybe you might like to make some friends. Not many, just a couple, so that you don't only have me. After all, I'm an old married woman now and not much on the town. No such thing, Patience protested. But that's just it. I'm not sure I should like to be on the town either, Patience said, biting her lip. It all seems so complicated and big and loud. Patience, you can't stay locked in the library forever, Annabella admonished gently. Why ever not? she demanded. Annabella looked up pursed her lips playfully in mimicry of their mother that never failed to make Patience laugh. Because, young lady, you will wilt without sunshine. It was just as Patience was dissolving into a fit of undignified giggles that the door to the salon was opened and the Duke and his cousin were admitted. Her head instantly turned, and beholding the gentleman she blushed thoroughly and snapped her mouth closed audibly. Automatically she averted her gaze, looking down at her hands. I'm glad to see you in high spirits, dear Patience, the Duke said gently. She glanced up long enough to see him smiling kindly at her, 
having crossed the room to sit in his favourite chair of blue damask. The cousin Tom, however, chose to remain standing, resting one arm on the marble mantelpiece and the other on his hip. His leg was turned out elegantly, and if his clothing were not ill-fitted and borrowed, he would have cut quite the figure. Secretly, Patience suspected that this posture was the product of many evenings of study. As it was, he stared openly at Patience, an inscrutable look on his face. She could feel her blush deepening and was tempted to hide it with a scowl. Beside her she could feel Annabella shift slightly, pushing herself forward so that Patience might be partially hidden. Patience was instantly relieved and felt a rush of affection for her sister and for her ability to understand her. Good gracious, Patience, look here. Have you seen the shocking haircuts the women in Paris are wearing? Annabella said, pointing down at another fashion plate. The illustration showed a young lady with close-cropped hair, as if she'd been suffering from a fever. Oh my, Patience breathed. That is quite... something. Well, they're French, the Duke said with a shrug and a lopsided smile. From his perch at the fireplace, Tom barked out a laugh. All eyes turned to regard him, and he quickly composed himself. Please forgive me, I just... It is refreshing to see what passes for shocking in the countryside, he said in chummy tones. Cousin Tom, do you really mean to tell me that you would not find this shocking to see in a Mayfair ballroom? Annabella asked, holding the illustration up. I should think not particularly, no. Tom said with an elegant shrug. Some of the fashionable ladies are considering adopting it. Do you all know the story behind it? No? I shall tell you then. It's all down to the Robespierre and the Guillot. That's enough, the Duke said firmly. Tom, looking about himself as if he had forgotten that he did not, in fact, have his usual rapt audience, quickly changed his route. In any event, he continued, inspecting his nails. One does see far more shocking things in ballrooms. This last phrase was spoken with such emphasis that it was impossible to mistake his meaning, especially when he pinned his gaze on Annabella. To Patience's great surprise, Annabella looked down for just a brief moment. If one did not know her, the look would surely have passed unnoticed. However, Patience did know her, and she could tell that the remark stung. It was no secret that Annabella's origins were not the usual for a duchess, regardless of her bloodline. It was also no secret that her engagement had come about as the result of a scandalous and most public evening. Though the Tun was willing to overlook these faults for a rich and beautiful duchess, they clearly would not be forgotten any time soon. The Duke, making a low rumbling sound of disapproval, uncrossed his legs and was preparing to stand when the most curious thing happened. Somehow, without her even meaning to, Patience found herself on her feet, her light green eyes boring hotly into Tom's. She was not entirely sure what she meant to do. She knew only that her dearest, best, most beloved sister had been wounded, and this fact was enough to overcome her innate shyness. Everyone waited silently as Patience stood, a strange kind of rushing sound in her ears. Tom stared directly back at her, and to her very great credit, Patience was not coweed. She lifted her chin a fraction of an inch and something in the tone of Tom's stare changed. Satisfied, Patience, without a word, simply swept from the room, head held high. It was an exit so grand that her mother, the Duchess of Carnegie, would have been jealous. That man, Patience thought, climbing the stairs to her room with her heart pounding. That man. Chapter 4 Patience was thoroughly tucked into the large four-poster bed that had been provided for her when a knock came at her door. She had her nose buried deep in Mrs. Radcliffe's latest offering with a single candle lit, so naturally she was inclined to jump a little at the sound. Her mind, still half in the book, raced, wondering who could be knocking at such an hour. Her curiosity was quickly answered, however, by a quiet voice saying, It's me, Patience. Annabella? Come in. Patience pushed herself up on the bed a little, reaching down for a blanket and wrapping it about her shoulders. Her sister entered, likewise dressed in a white night trail, with a long jacquard shawl wrapped about herself. 
Like a much younger girl, she quickly towed across the cool floor and sprang into Patience's bed with her. Move over, my feet are freezing, she declared, all knees and ankles. Patience, laughing, pushed right back until she felt the ice blocks that she could only assume were Annabella's feet. Upon this, she squealed and retreated. Oh, for heaven's sake, where are your stockings? The grave is warm compared to those things. Well, thank you kindly, Annabella grumped playfully, scooting into the bed and obligingly tucking her feet in. She spotted the book Patience had been reading and lifted it, reading the cover. The Italian? she asked, arching an eyebrow. I suppose this is another that Mother wouldn't approve of. Definitely not, Patience agreed. I've got such a collection of gothics under my mattress that it's a wonder my spine is still straight. Annabella chuckled softly, flipping through a couple pages. Is it very improper? Patience nodded, biting her lip a little, worried that her sister may not approve. She was, after all, a duchess now. Excellent, you must let me borrow it before you leave. Patience snorted out a most undignified laugh, which only made Annabella laugh too. Well, since you've not come to chastise me for my choice of reading, what brings you to me? Has the Duke chased you from your bed for those horrible cold feet? Playfully, Annabella swatted Patience with the book before tossing it down gently. No, you mercenary thing. I came to tell you that I am so very proud of you, first of all. Me? Yes, you. I believe you put the fear into Lord Tom earlier. It was a magnificent showing. Oh, Annabella, I cannot believe I did that, Patience said in a rush, curling her hands into the bedding. I don't know what came over me. I just, I just couldn't. He, I know, and you did splendidly, Annabella said, gently taking Patience's curled hands. Honestly, he looked like a schoolboy about to be scolded, and rightly so. Patience laughed breathily. I suppose he did. I can't believe he would say that. It was so unnecessary. Annabella shrugged causing her long bronze-coloured braid to fall behind her shoulder. It was not the worst thing that has been said to me since I married, and it will not be the last thing either. Have people been horrid to you? A little, Annabella admitted. Of course they fear Mother a bit too much to be too overt. I was worried about the county out here, but the neighbours have all been cautiously congenial. I suppose it's because they've known Alan's family for centuries. Annabella sat up a little and nudged Patience with her elbow. That brings me to the second part of my errand. Oh? I'm giving a dinner two nights hence, Annabella explained. It shall only be a few neighbours, but I thought you might like to know in advance. Patience resisted the urge to worry her bottom lip with her teeth again. I shall do my best to be, to be... She faltered not even entirely sure of what she was trying to say. She knew that she had been a disappointment to her mother in this regard. She did not know how to make conversation at dinners. She did not know how to be a wit in drawing rooms. Gently, Annabella laid a hand on Patience's arm. I don't expect you to be anything other than yourself. I didn't tell you so that you might alter yourself, merely so that you would not be surprised. Forewarned is forearmed as my dear husband would say. Patience nodded, not meeting Annabella's eyes. I just get so nervous about people and I don't even know why. I'm not sure I have it in me to be very brave. Annabella's light scoffing laugh surprised Patience, who looked up with raised brows. You are not brave? You? Annabella demanded. When it is you who organised the entire scheme last spring? Patience couldn't help but smile and blush a little when she thought of it. I suppose that is true, she allowed. I still can't believe I did all of that. In any event, you shouldn't worry. It will only be a few neighbours, not the Prince of Wales, Annabella said, patting Patience's arm reassuringly again. Now please do not use all the candles in the house staying up to read all night. Taking a deep breath to steal her feet for the undoubtedly freezing floor, Annabella swung her legs out of Patience's bed and leaned back to press a kiss to her little sister's head, all in one motion. 
Patience giggled a little at the mincing, nearly running gait Annabella used to get to the door so that her feet touched the bare wood as little as possible. She knew that Annabella had meant to be reassuring, but her mind wasn't quiet about the notion of attending a dinner. As she settled back into the propped pillows behind her, she could not help but replay scenes from the last dinners she had attended, not to point too fine of a point on it, but they had not gone well by anyone's estimation. With a sigh, she picked her book up again. Compared to the scenes of social humiliation that played in her head, Mrs Radcliffe was rather tame. Through darkened hallways, Annabella tripped along lightly on her toes, hurrying in a way that she was sure was highly undignified for a duchess. She found it hard to care, however, as she had a loathing for cold feet and the thought of her warm bed drove her onwards. Though it was only September, the weather had turned cool and a steady rain had fallen all day. That same rain still lashed at the windows, which made Annabella pull her shawl tighter about herself. Though the Duke's estate was grand and beautiful, it was rather more prone to draughts and cold spots than Annabella had expected. Reaching the door to her private chambers, all outlined with warm light and the promise of a crackling fire, Annabella turned the door handle quickly and slipped through. She tried to close the door as quietly as possible behind her, but as it was a grand and old door, this was in vain and she winced at the sound. And here I was about to come in search of you, the Duke said, tucked up in bed with papers scattered about him, a pile of feather-down pillows behind him. I wouldn't recommend it, Annabella said, hustling to the richly carved and upholstered bed on a small platform in the centre of the room. She whipped her shawl off and draped it over the chair near the bed. The floors are like ice. Bess, come and warm yourself then, the Duke said, looking bemused and flipping the covers down on her side of the bed invitingly. Annabella eagerly slipped into the bed, immediately cosying up to Alan's warmth. Resting her head in the sheltering place between his heart and his arm, she could feel his light chuckle. She too grinned a little musing on the fact that if the Tan knew that she slept in the same bed as her husband every night, that would surely be another black mark against her. Neither of them saw the point in the convention that the Duke should sleep in his own chambers, and neither of them preferred that in the least. Especially on nights like tonight, Annabella thought, burying her cold nose against the warm, solid form of her husband. It is unseasonably cold tonight that I'll grant you the Duke said, as if he had been reading her thoughts. With one hand, he tucked the blanket tightly against Annabella's back, then shuffled the papers he had been looking at into a loose pile with the other. Shifting slightly, he placed them on the table next to the bed and snuffed the candle before settling back into bed with a comfortable sigh. Annabella hummed an agreement, listening to the driving rain tapping against the window. In the dark and cold, Annabella was grateful for her husband's encircling arm and the soothing rhythm of his heart through the thin cotton of his nightshirt. Still, her mind was not easy, and she had trouble willing herself to sleep. What is it? The Duke murmured against her hair, his voice rumbling in his chest and under her ear. I don't know, really, Annabella sighed. I suppose I am uneasy about this dinner. And, well... I had planned it all so carefully, with the greatest possible concern for patience, and your cousin is an unknown factor in my plans. Alan grunted in agreement. That is certainly one turn of phrase for him. You don't think he'd do anything to spoil things, do you? Annabella could feel rather than see Alan shaking his head. I don't believe so, no. He isn't a bad person, just... The Duke hesitated just a thoughtless one sometimes. He was a great friend when we were younger. He caused more mischief than you'd think one boy could, but he'd always find a way out of it too. A small grin spread across Annabella's face, as it always did when she contemplated the grand and proud duke as a stripling running wild across the estate. Well, hopefully things will go well, and he will be well behaved then. The duke hummed in agreement again. Do you know what has brought him here? Only partially, Alan admitted. I intend to write to my uncle to find the particulars. 
I only hope he hasn't brought some London scandal trailing after him. Annabella said nothing, for she knew how important the family's honour and his duties were to the Duke. I'm sure we can manage him, she said gently, stifling a yawn. I'm sure we can manage anything, the two of us together, he replied with such quiet confidence that Annabella smiled again. She burrowed closer to him, sighing happily. We can bear anything, so long as we do it together. He paused, holding his breath a little for a moment. Anything but one, he amended. Oh? Annabella asked, turning her neck so that she could look up at the Duke, his profile barely visible. What's that? Anything but those frozen toes of yours, the Duke said with a delicate shudder that made Annabella laugh. I'll thank you kindly to keep them to yourself. With a mock gasp of outrage, Annabella reached up for one of the pillows and promptly swatted the Duke with it. This only led to more laughing, and the Duke wrapped Annabella up tight in his arms. She was only mollified when he pressed a dozen kisses to her face, which was perfectly fine with both of them. Thus pacified, Annabella listened as the Duke's breathing settled and became even, until he was lightly snuffling as he slept. She had not always been a grand lady, and much of her life she had to rely on her ability to read people. Her time living on her wits had taught her to trust her instincts, especially regarding her fellow man. She could not really justify why, but something about Lord Tom had unsettled her. Chapter 5 Despite the previous day's downpour, the morning dawned bright, with the sun quickly burning away the grey morning fog. Patience had always been in the habit of rising early and was down to breakfast in time to eat with the Duke. Annabella, as a married woman, was entitled to take her breakfast in bed. Left alone with her brother-in-law, Patience could not help but feel a little shy of him. She was exceedingly fond of him, but the notion of talking to a man of any stripe while unaccompanied was still alien. The Duke seemed to sense this, for he spoke to her gently and sparingly. He was inclined to read the newspaper or correspondence, but always looked up to give Patience his full attention when speaking. Though she began the morning with her hands clenched tightly in her lap from nerves, within the hour she had relaxed enough to eat with enthusiasm. Her sister kept an excellent baker, and the buns were softer and more fragrant than any Patience had ever experienced. By the by, the Duke said conversationally, pointedly folding his newspaper and turning his attention to his plate. I would like you to know that my library is at your disposal. Your library, Patience repeated, her fork and knife stilled mid-cut on a strip of thick bacon. Instinctually, her eyes darted to the door in the direction of said library. All of it, all of it, the Duke confirmed. Patience did not quite know how to take that. She was a voracious reader, had been her entire life, but her choice in reading material had been highly censored. Her mother was loving and took great care for her daughter, but was something of an autocrat. Patience had become quite adept at smuggling books in and out of the house and creeping about the library at home in the middle of the night. Slowly she smiled at the Duke, and when he grinned back at her, she could not help but giggle a little. Thank you, she breathed and tucked back into her breakfast with renewed vigour. Breakfast thus dispensed with, she made her way eagerly to the library and spent a couple happy hours there. In fact, she had amassed a stack of books on a small table next to one of the overstuffed chairs before the fireplace and was determinedly making her way through them. They ranged from history to Latin to the castle of Otranto. Even a small treatise on the proper nesting habits of pheasants had found its way in there. Patience had lost all sense of time and place with her nose buried firmly in a pamphlet on Robespierre when the door to the library swung open. The sound startled her back to awareness, and she blinked as she looked around. Annabella, smiling indulgently, was walking toward Patience, her steps softened by the legion of thickly woven rugs. She wore her hair simply, but her gown was of moss-green silk that rustled pleasingly as she walked. Patience, her mind still half in her book, could not help but sigh as she observed her graceful, beautiful sister. 
She doubted that she had ever felt out of place or ill at ease anywhere. Self-consciously, she sat up and tugged a little at her chemisette with its large, ruffled collar. There you are, Annabella said, her expression teasing. I might have known I'd find you in here. The Duke said I might, Patience replied, a little defensively. Quite right, too, Annabella said easily, perusing the stack of books next to Patience. She clearly caught sight of the pamphlet in Patience's hand, and her brows shot up. I did not think you had an interest in French politics. Well, that's just it, Patience said, leaning forward a little. I don't know either. There is much I don't know, and I should like to fix that. There might be things out there I've a keen interest in, but simply don't know that I do yet. Annabella nodded slowly, then looked back to the door. I hope Lord Tom didn't put you out of sorts with his comments last night. Patience shrugged one shoulder in a gesture that was identical to one Annabella made regularly. In truth, he did, but not in the way that you might think. It just really highlighted that I am essentially a dowdy shut-in, and I know very little of the word. Dowdy, Annabella said, taking Patience by the hand and pulling her up out of the chair. Sheltered, I will grant you, but dowdy? No, not in this lifetime. Annabella spoke so firmly that Patience felt that she could not possibly disagree with her. She allowed Annabella to tuck her hand into her elbow and gently guide her out of the library. Now I am all for you expanding your horizons, but I shan't be letting you go hungry. Oh, Patience said, looking about at the sun shining in through the windows. Is it luncheon already? Before Annabella could answer, Patience's stomach grumbled lightly. Annabella only favoured Patience with a pointed look, who had the good grace to look a little sheepish. I suppose I am a bit hungry, Patience admitted. Luncheon was served in the dining room, but with the windows thrown open brightly and a light lace tablecloth on the table. The Duke awaited them, taking his customary place at the head of the table, while Annabella sat to his right and Patience to the left. Meals had been simple but hearty for much of Patience's life, and she could not help but stare at the repast laid on the table. There were hothouse oranges and grapes, plates of cold roast beef that glistened, bowls of various jellies, and a platter of cheeses. There were also small plates with butter paddled into various shapes, some with herbs dotted within. Of course, there were also plates and plates of buns and dainty little cakes, some glazed and others with fruits or nuts over the tops. It was a rich tapestry of colours and smells, and it made Patience's mouth water. She sat still, however, awaiting the cue from Annabella that they might begin eating. For her part, she looked about the dining room, then arched an eyebrow at her husband. The Duke looked from one lady to the other and sighed. Stolton, have you informed Lord Thomas that luncheon is ready? The butler, stationed just behind the Duke, glided forward. He has, Your Grace. I saw to it myself. The butler paused, watching as a number of irritated looks were passed around the table. Shall I inform him again? No, the Duke said, nodding to Annabella. This splendid luncheon should not be wasted just because he cannot be bothered to be punctual. Taking this as her cue, Annabella nodded in agreement, and sighing only a little began helping herself to the food. The Duke and Patience followed suit, for which Patience was grateful. The smell of the fresh buns with currants was driving her mad. Just as the trio had begun filling their plates, the door to the dining room opened with a clatter, and Lord Tom entered. Everyone at the table froze, staring at him. His hair was dishevelled, and though he had gotten as far as a fresh shirt and trousers, he was wearing only a banyan atop his clothing. It was a shockingly red silk, with Chinese dragons and plants woven into it, and a pattern of blue waves along the bottom. He had not even bothered to fasten it, allowing the belt to trail behind him like a crimson tail. Unceremoniously, he looked about bleary-eyed, wincing a little at the bright sun. Patience could feel a blush beginning in her neck and creeping into her face, for she had never seen a man in such a state of undress. She did not wish to stare, 
so she concentrated on looking down at her plate. Still, she stole glances at him, his bare neck peeking from the loose collar of his shirt as he wore no cravat. Good of you to join us, the Duke said dryly. Lord Tom only grunted and sat without preamble in an empty chair at the opposite end of the table. He did not pull his chair up fully to the table, opting instead to sit Widdishins, one long leg crossed over the other. Though he was clearly not fully awake yet, this was clearly a calculated posture intended to show himself to good advantage. Across the table from Patience, Annabella caught her eye for a moment, and in the way common to fond sisters, rolled her eyes slightly. This small expression was enough to convey a dozen sentiments to Patience, who understood completely. A small giggle escaped Patience, which drew Lord Tom's cool gaze. Patience lifted her napkin delicately to her mouth, covering the sound with a delicate cough. I am glad to see that you feel right at home here with us, Annabella said pointedly down the table. Lord Tom looked down at himself as if realising what he was wearing for the first time. He glanced about the table, then lifted his chin slightly. Forgive me, I seem to have lost track of the hour. I also find myself without my man and am quite at sea at neckcloths without him. The Duke sighed. Stolton? Would you ensure that Lord Tom has someone to look after him? That's quite all right, Annabella said, smiling gently at the lost lord. It has given us the opportunity to admire that lovely banyan. It is, isn't it? Tom replied smugly, holding out an arm so that the wide sleeves fell and revealed gold lilies. I picked it up in Paris before, well, before. Annabella nodded sagely, her face a study in sympathy. It's terrible, isn't it? It's so hard to get proper silk these days. I'm as much of a patriot as anyone, but our own silk weavers have nothing on the French and Italians. Some of the gentlemen in London have replaced their waistcoats with patterned cottons, Tom said, leaning forward conspiratorially. I personally can't countenance it. I might simply hide in the countryside until I can get some new ones made up properly. Tapping one finger on her chin, Annabella made a great show of considering. You know, I believe we have some good silks in the attics here. You are more than welcome to it. The merchant was a dear friend of mine and always sent too much. There's a shot umber and gold that I think you would fancy very much. Patience watched this exchange carefully. She knew very well that Annabella was up to something, handling Tom as deftly as a pernickety dowager in her former shop. Tom seemed completely befuddled by this exchange. Indeed, it seemed that Annabella's generosity had completely disarmed him. I, that would be very kind of you, thank you. As if seeing the dining room for the first time, Lord Tom uncrossed his legs and sat more properly at the table. Patience, watching from beneath her lashes, saw a look flit across his face that bore a striking resemblance to shame. The moment passed quickly, but Tom was quiet the rest of the meal, only murmuring requests for more tea. Patience, feeling a curl of amusement in her stomach, looked to her sister again. Annabella said nothing, but the arch glance she sent to Patience spoke volumes. Patience ducked her head hurriedly again, thinking that an air of triumph really did suit Annabella nicely. Turning to the Duke, Annabella said, I am so pleased that dreadful rain has cleared up. It seems the weather will be fine for the afternoon. Ah, yes, you are to host some young ladies for tea, the Duke said. What? Patience blurted. She caught a rustle of silk from the far end of the table, but Lord Tom and his absurd wardrobe had taken a back seat. Oh, nothing too exciting, Annabella said carefully. Just a few of the young ladies from the neighbourhood. I thought you might like to know a few people your own age. How charming, Lord Tom said, clearly angling for an invitation. Despite her distress, Patience suspected that the promise of a salon full of young ladies was one of Lord Tom's favourite things. I'm afraid you shall have to do without our company, the Duke said, pointedly ignoring Tom. As you say, the weather is quite fine today. And Lord Tom is delighted to accompany me on a ride about the estate. It will allow him to become familiar with the grounds again. 
actually, I'm not sure I... Delighted, the Duke repeated, smiling beatifically at Tom. Tom resisted the urge to grumble as he stared at the Duke's back. The Duke, ever the rigid stick in the mud, maintained the same ramrod posture in the saddle that he had on the ground. He rode a sprightly chestnut mare with elegant white legs that flashed as she trotted delicately around the estate. Tom's own mount was a surly bay that seemed inclined to plodding and also seemed to share Tom's assessment of being forced to ride about the estate. It wasn't that Tom didn't like riding, he was something of a noted Corinthian in London, but being forced to stare at field after field was absolutely mind-numbing for him. Give him a fox to chase, pack of hounds baying around his horse's ankles, and he was like a veritable centaur. The Duke, pointedly ignoring his dour demeanour, nattered on contentedly, pointing out this boundary or that. The root of his poor attitude at this direct moment was the fact that the Duke had pointedly shuttled him out of the way of the ladies, as if he could not be trusted around them. As much as he might like to pretend that he did not have pride to wound, or more accurately, a tender heart, the insinuation had struck him. He could not countenance that he had been a figure of ridicule at lunch. Imagine that frowsy little bird tittering away behind her napkin at me, and her, with that absurdly high collar, he sneered. Still, he had to admit that he had underestimated the new Duchess. He had heard the basics, and even attended the wedding, as if he would not. His attendance ensured that he would have first-hand knowledge and be a favourite among gossips for months. What he had not anticipated was her being so quick, so generous, and he did not only mean the business with the silk. She seemed to possess a large heart, and did not carry a grudge for his boorish behaviour of the night before. I say, Tom, the Duke said, his voice pointed. He had pulled up his own horse next to Tom's and was staring at him. Tom started a little, clearly having drifted off. Sorry, old boy, I seem to have been in a world of my own making. That much was obvious, the Duke smirked. When did I lose you? I don't know, sometime about the third or fourth barley field. Tom sighed, exasperated. The Duke absorbed this. I see. Well, what had you so absorbed anyway? Tom hesitated, then decided to try a bit of honesty, just to see what it was like. I was thinking that your Duchess must have a real generosity of spirit. This seemed to completely disarm the Duke, who nudged his own horse onward again, Tom's following suit automatically. That she does he agreed, a satisfied, slightly wistful look on his face. If you let her in, even a little bit, she will be the most loyal of creatures. I already have one mother, Tom sniffed. Yes, but have you any sisters? Tom opened his mouth to reply, then snapped it closed again. Seeing this, the Duke smirked again and nodded, satisfied. Well, anyone could tell that she is the type inclined to mothering with the way that she dotes on the young lady. Tom said, clearly meaning patience. Patience? Yes, Annabella takes great care of her, the Duke agreed. Mind, there's great pit of mud at the bottom of this hill. Tom braced himself in the stirrups and leaned back slightly, expertly ensuring that his weight wouldn't upset his mount's balance as he doggedly picked his way through the mud. When they were clear of the little bog, the Duke resumed speaking. Given that Annabella is greatly concerned with her sister's welfare, it would behove you to treat her with the utmost kindness, the Duke advised. I've got enough society ladies snapping after me. I don't need another, thank you, Tom muttered. Besides, she's just a little slip of a thing, too much the waif for me to bother with. The Duke chuckled from deep within his belly, not the polite tittering of the ton, but born from true mirth. She may be shy and retiring, but she is far braver and cleverer than you could ever imagine. Tom turned to stare at the Duke, trying to see if he was funning. Lady Patience? Tom's brow furrowed as he tried to form a clear picture of her in his mind, but all he could come up with was large, round blue eyes in a hazy, heart-shaped face. It occurred to him that he had not really given her a second look merely dismissed her as the uninteresting second daughter of an impossibly antiquated duchess. 
Well, she certainly didn't seem to think much of me, he said at last, remembering the stark way that she had stared at him. No, the Duke agreed. Probably for the best. Humph, Tom said, vaguely incensed. He had taken about enough aspersions from every corner. Never mind that it was all, well, mostly, his own fault. He still did not care for the insinuations about his character. The real question, Tom thought, is how to go about rectifying that particular problem. How does one begin to make amends for something they are not even sure they have done? Chapter 6 Patience simply could not quell the feeling of butterflies in her stomach. Though Annabella had reassured her at least a dozen times, she still felt as if she were a bundle of nerves. She was seated in a back salon, with large French-style doors that looked out into the meticulously manicured gardens. Nervously, she shifted about a little on the Louise Philippe chair, one hand worrying at the bow that held her ruffled chemisette closed at the neck. Annabella was busy overseeing the laying of the tea things, using her artist's eye to good effect as the platters of candied fruits and cakes were arranged just so. Patience sighed a little, knowing that her sister had gone to great pains to ensure that Patience would have a good time. It was difficult, though, because Patience did long to be one of the collected, confident young ladies she had glimpsed in London. At the same time, it seemed an insurmountable hurdle to dip her toe into unfamiliar society. She just didn't know what to say, not to anyone. They all spoke about places she had never been, and doing things she never had done. Satisfied at last, Annabella took up her chair next to Patience. Impulsively, she reached over and squeezed Patience's hand for the briefest moment. Don't fret, Annabella said with her kind smile. You will be fine. Patience blew out a sigh, hoping that she was right. Stolton appeared in the doorway to announce the first guest, and Patience did her best not to hold her breath. Miss Imogen White he said in carefully enunciated tones. Behind him, a round girl in gossamer white cotton batiste with a superfluous amount of ruffles at the hem, sleeves and neck was veritably bouncing with excitement. Having dispensed with her bonnet and gloves, her hair, a shockingly platinum blonde, was on full display. Eagerly she bounded forward, making a slightly awkward curtsy to Annabella. Your grace, she said her voice light and her vowels as round as her figure. Thank you ever so much for this invitation. You are most welcome, Miss White. Patience, allow me to present Miss White. Her father is the local parson. Miss White, my sister, the Lady Patience, Annabella said, smoothly gesturing to Patience, who had risen cautiously. How do you do? Patience managed. Oh, I am ever so pleased to meet you. We are very much in need of the company of elegant young ladies in the village. I hear that you have spent time lately in London. Fancy that. I should like to visit London ever so much, Miss White said, her rosy cheeks lifted in a perpetual smile. In fact, as Patience watched her talk about the weather with a level of enthusiasm she had never suspected possible, it seemed to Patience that Miss White had a face that was simply made for smiling and cheerfulness. With her ruffled white dress and propensity to bounce on the balls of her feet excitedly as she spoke, it was a bit like being accosted by a very happy meringue. Patience, unprepared for this onslaught of goodwill, found herself only able to manage the slightest responses. Without quite knowing how, her right hand had been put into Miss White's elbow, and she was dragged to the refreshment table to discuss the elegant merits of such finely laid repast. Helplessly, she threw a glance over her shoulder to Annabella, who only smiled blithely at her. Miss Gertrude Smythe, Stolton announced, having arrived with another guest trailing behind him. Patience craned her head around to see the new arrival, but Imogen had beaten her to it. Oh, Gertrude, are you here too? I'm ever so glad that you're joining us, she cried as she stepped forward. The new girl, Miss Smythe, was everything that Imogen was not tall, willowy, and straight as a sapling. Her hair and eyes were dark, and though she was not a great beauty, she had a dignified, graceful way of moving that Patience instantly admired. Her voice, 
when she greeted Annabella and was introduced to patients, was surprisingly warm and smooth, like melted chocolate. Dear Imogen, it is always a delight to see you, but let's not overwhelm dear lady patients with the first five minutes of her knowing us, Gertrude said gently. Patience smiled shyly at her, grateful for this intervention. Oh yes, you must tell me if I prattle on too much and your head begins to ache, Imogen said gravely, though with no less enthusiasm. I just get ever so excited and then I... Imogen, Gertrude sighed, taking a seat with a fluid movement. Miss Cassandra Evergreen, came Stolton's ringing voice again, the butler straining to be heard over the collection of voices in the salon. The last arrival was a girl with mousy brown hair and a pert little nose with spectacles perched upon it. Her cheeks were pale and freckled, framed by brown locks that had once been bouncy curls but were falling down a bit. The most striking thing about her was her eyes, which were large and liquid like doe's eyes, magnified by her spectacles. Her dress was plain and serviceable, of brown linen. Why, Cassandra, is that really you? I thought you'd been sent to some frightful Austrian convent, Imogen said, dragging Patience forward for another hasty round of introductions and curtsies. No, I haven't, she said, in a voice so light and delicate that Patience wasn't sure she had spoken at all. From there it was a whirlwind of seeing everyone served and seated, seated among the chairs and settees. Watching the conversation of the local girls, it was clear that they all had long history together as they spoke about things like old friends. Patience could feel herself beginning to shrink inwards. Just as she thought she might find a way to slip away quietly without offending Annabella, she felt a hand on her arm. Ladies, thank you so much for joining me today, Annabella said, quieting the girls. My darling sister shall be staying with me for some months, and she was desirous of some company. Naturally, I assumed you three would be just the ones for the job. Oh, yes, Imogen cried, her face lighting up even further. We are just ever so glad to have such a dignified person in our circle. Me? Patience blurted, looking about at the faces around her. Well, yes, Gertrude said in her velvety voice. You are the only one here who has been to London, and the only lady besides. She paused for a moment, considering. Though your cousin is a lady, isn't she, Cassandra? The girl nodded in response. Imogen was just beside herself, thinking we might get to see some London fashion. Well, all of my dresses are from last season. I didn't even really have a proper season, I... Patience began. But still, you must tell us everything about it. We are simply dying to know, Imogen insisted. A round of nods met that. Patience, a little apprehensive, looked about at the faces staring eagerly at her. To her great surprise, none of them looked at her unkindly, judging her every word and look. They looked at her with all the interest and eagerness of children awaiting to be told a story. Well, Patience allowed, what would you like to know? Did you curtsy before the Queen? Imogen asked. I did. Patience confirmed. Weren't you terrified? I think I should have fainted straight away, Cassandra said, leaning forward, her plate of cake forgotten. You must be very brave. Brave? Patience repeated, tasting the word. It felt foreign when applied to herself, but she found that she rather liked it. I know I shouldn't be able to do it, Gertrude said to nods all around. Did you attend any balls? Were they very grand? Imogen asked taking a great sip of her tea. A couple, and yes. One had a sugar sculpture in the shape of the Parthenon, Patience said. It's a shame there's no dances at the village hall, Imogen said with an exaggerated pout. Gertrude is quite the best dancer among us. Yes, but Imogen has the best voice, Gertrude replied. She has every one in rapturous at the piano. Patience's eyes slid of their own accord to Cassandra who did not seem put out in the least to be temporarily forgotten. Imogen was smiling broadly at Cassandra, and Gertrude's dark eyes were sparkling with humour as well. Cassandra is the cleverest of all of us, Imogen explained. She's read simply everything about the natural world, 
and has a collection of insects and, what do you call them? Fossils. I've lately turned to reading about the study of electricity, Cassandra said with a little wave of her hand. Like lightning, Patience asked, curious in spite of her shyness. To her surprise, Cassandra lit up. That's right. I've some great treatises from Switzerland if you're interested. Patience is very fond of reading, Annabella interjected, gently steering the conversation. Cassandra looked at Patience with renewed appreciation. Are you? We must compare reading lists. I'm afraid that most of my reading has been romances and fairy stories, Patience said apologetically, wincing as if she expected to be told off for her taste. Have you read Radcliffe and Walpole then? Imogen said, leaning forward, her grey eyes sparkling. You simply must tell me all about them, for my father has forbidden them from the rectory. On familiar territory, Patience found herself relaxing bit by bit. In fact, they conversed easily, passing an enjoyable afternoon. By the end, they were crowded about each other, browsing through the stack of fashion plates that Annabella had procured from Paris. Before Patience knew it, a scheme had been devised wherein all the ladies would have their hair cut and styled by the famous Mr. Newright, who would be passing through on his way to Bath. By the time the gaggle of ladies was ready to make their departure, the clock was chiming four times. With many fond farewells and kissing of cheeks, they left reluctantly, and only after they had extracted promises to pay calls on one another again, perhaps with music and dancing next time. Patience felt a little dazed when they had gone, and flopped a little dramatically onto the brocaded settee in the salon. Annabella, re-entering the room after seeing her guests safely out, smiled sympathetically. Was it perfectly frightful for you? No, Patience answered slowly. It was not. It was tiring, but they were really very kind and I didn't feel like they found me lacking at all. I never expected to have so much in common with other young ladies. I imagine a lot of that is down to the fact that you only had our mother's friends to socialise with previously, Annabella pointed out. These are also country girls. Anyone with even a whiff of London about them must be the height of sophistication and gentility. I'm not sure I fit that description, Patience said, her brow furrowed in doubt. Patience? Annabella said mock seriously. I would bet you a guinea that at least two of them are running out to have dresses made up exactly like yours as we speak. Patience laughed. Well, I have you to thank for that, don't I? I look forward to having my hair set too. Your great rebellion, going to your sisters and having curling tongs applied, Annabella said. Both sisters laughed because both knew this wasn't true. Patience's greatest rebellion had been her scheme to ensure the Duke and Annabella ended up together. Still, Patience mused, looking about at the aftermath of the enthusiastic tea party. One really never knows what tomorrow might bring. Chapter 7 The evening of the much-anticipated dinner party was temperate, with the smell of apples ready for harvest floating on the wind. The guests arrived in good humour, and Patience saw only smiles as the Duke and Duchess greeted them. This dinner was ostensibly to finalise plans for the traditional harvest supper, but it also seemed to be for some of the neighbours to become better acquainted with Annabella. Despite the triumph of the tea party, Patience found herself hanging back. She did not mind being overlooked for the moment, and was quite content to observe the arrivals from a position near the wall. She was not alone for long, however. Lord Tom was loitering near the back wall as well, clearly having been shuffled to the rear of things. His expression was a little sullen, clearly unused to being deemed unimportant at social events. Patience was almost moved to pity for him. Almost. As if he sensed her amused pity, he locked eyes with her. Patience froze, unsure if she should look away and pretend that she had not been observing him. This paralysis meant that she ended up only staring at him more. She watched, transfixed, as his eyes briefly roved over her, and she had the distinct impression that she had just had every bit of her toilette and wardrobe assessed. His mouth quirked a little, as if he wanted to smile but had tamped it down. 
Please don't come over here, she thought desperately. Much to her discomfort, it seemed that he had heard her. In a great show of collected grace, he unfolded his arms and pushed off from the wall he had been leaning against. By the time he had walked the couple of steps over to Patience, she had recovered enough of herself to turn her gaze away, studying the floor. Well, well, Lady Patience, he drawled, propping one shoulder against the wall as he spoke to her. It would seem that we have been relegated to the second string, he said with a nod to the Duke and Duchess. Patience didn't answer verbally, but shook her head a little. The motion caught Lord Tom's eye, who turned back to Patience, his expression a little bemused. What, we haven't been shuffled to the back of the room, or is it the we you are objecting to? Patience nodded, which only seemed to confound Lord Tom further. Yes to which? Both? Patience hesitated, then nodded again. Well, that's me put back in my box then, Lord Tom drawled. Patience glanced up long enough to see an inscrutable look pass over his face before his carefully studied expression fell back into place. Swallowing hard around the lump in her throat, Patience decided to be very, very brave indeed. I can see the whole room from back here, she murmured softly. There are no surprises. Tom, clearly surprised, whipped his head back around to Patience, one brow arched aristocratically. I suppose you can, he agreed finally. Patience could see him thinking, and his eyes narrowed as he turned to observe the room himself. You get to see everything going on, he said slowly, his eyes dancing over the small crowd. Patience nodded again, lifting her head a little. Somehow, through this short exchange of words, she had managed to wriggle past the sardonic mask Lord Tom perpetually wore. He had spoken to her, not at her. Perhaps it is not so terrifying to speak after all, Patience thought. I can see the value of your position, Tom continued nodding. But don't you ever long to be in the midst of things, surrounded by friends and admirers? This question took Patience aback a little. She tilted her head a little as she thought. Maybe, she admitted, her voice so quiet that Tom leaned in a little to hear her. His proximity made her heart thump nervously, but she soldiered on. But if you're in the middle of everything, how do you see people? Now it was Tom's turn to tilt his head quizzically. What mean you? I mean, if there is a crowd of people all pressing into you for your attention, how do you take their measure? How do you know that they are your friends and not merely someone looking for some of your guilt to rub off on them? Tom did not have a ready answer for that. Patience was worried that she had offended him, for he opened his mouth to answer, but closed it again with an audible click of his teeth. He settled for sniffing and tossing his head proudly, his artfully shaggy hair flicking perfectly. Well, I wouldn't expect a lonesome little dandelion like you to be able to tell the difference. Patience accepted this barb with a nod, for it was true. This seemed to only further confound Lord Tom for he was clearly expecting her to return fire. You're probably right, she agreed, but unless I am very much mistaken, she hesitated, took a deep breath, and finished in a rush. You have not received any correspondence since arriving here either, nor any callers. Lord Tom stared openly at Patience, his eyes blazing with something Patience couldn't name. From across the sitting room, Patience saw Annabella beckoning her over. She took a deep breath, steeling herself. Perhaps we are both weeds, then, Patience concluded, daring to look up again at Lord Tom, passing her eyes over him in much the same manner as he had done to her. Swallowing hard again, she curtsied to Lord Tom and hurried to Annabella's side. It was only when she had reached Annabella and the Duke that she realised what it was that Tom had looked at her with. It was admiration brief and fleeting, but admiration all the same. When Annabella had summoned her, Patience had been more than a little petrified to realise that there was an older gentleman in her company. Unbidden, she had flashbacks to her brief, disastrous season 
in which older, frequently widowed gentlemen of every stripe had practically thrown themselves at her. But no, Annabella would never, Patience thought confidently. Her sureness was borne out when Annabella made introductions. Patience, may I present Mr Fitzgerald? This is my dear sister, Lady Patience. I thought perhaps he might escort you into dinner. Shyly, Patience curtsied and nodded her assent. Her first impression of Mr Fitzgerald was one of an abundance of white whiskers that contrived to never stay put. His vest pulled tightly across a round belly, and his light blue eyes sparkled with good humour. He did not wear the customary evening black, but rather a brown homespun jacket. She immediately warmed to him, especially when he spoke to her quietly in soothing tones, like she was a skittish horse. Good evening, milady, he said, automatically reaching up to touch his forehead in salute. I'm not sure who will be helping whom into the dining room. I'm mighty glad of a young arm to lean on. Patience couldn't help but smile at his self-deprecating nature. Mr Fitzgerald responded in kind. His manners were easy and without pretense, which could only set Patience at ease. Satisfied, Annabella gave a smug little nod and turned away to make other introductions. She does it like she's born to it, Mr Fitzgerald commented, watching Annabella flit from person to person easily. She was born to it. Patience reminded him, a little defensively. Aye, true enough, Mr Fitzgerald agreed. There's some has been a bit sniffy about our new Duchess, but not me, milady. She's a good sort. Anyone with two eyes in their head could see that. Patience found that she wholeheartedly agreed with this statement. When dinner was announced and Mr Fitzgerald offered her his arm, she accepted it gladly. She was further pleased to find that she was seated next to him, and on her other side a Mrs White whose round figure and proclivity for smiles announced her as Imogen's mother. She was seated near the head of the table, not far from the Duke, which was also reassuring. Dinner passed easily, and though Patience did not speak much, she found that Mr Fitzgerald did not seem inclined to chatter, and Mrs White was only too happy to fill any silences. It was not the company that Patience had been expecting from her time in London. There she had to mind every word, every gesture lest the ton fall upon some minuscule fault. All the words people had spoken at London parties had seemed to have three sides, and Patience only understood one of them. Gathering her courage at some point between a helping of the most succulent roasted goose she had ever had and calf's foot jelly, Patience turned slightly to Mr Fitzgerald. Might I ask, do you live very near? Yes, my lady. Just over the rise to the back of the estate he replied. Mr Fitzgerald's family has provided the county the finest horses for centuries. They've taken prizes at Newmarket and carried our cavalry all around the world, the Duke broke in, smiling proudly at Mr Fitzgerald. This praise seemed to embarrass the kindly man who dipped his head in recognition. Kind of you to say, Your Grace. You breed horses? How lovely, Patience agreed. Can be, my lady. I learned my business from the father, who learned it from his back to the Normans, he explained, picking each of his words as carefully as if they were made of glass. Something in this simple statement, and the man's quiet pride in his work, touched Patience's heart. Quite unexpectedly, she found her face breaking into a smile. This was not one of her regular timid smiles, but one of such golden radiance that her whole face lit up. Her blue-violet eyes crinkled at the corners, and the rosy apples of her cheeks lifted. She did not know it yet, but as her face was naturally sweet, when she smiled so openly the effect was delightful to see. Well, isn't that a sight to put in your eyes? Mr Fitzgerald breathed quietly. Begging your pardon, my lady, he tacked on hurriedly. This only made Patience laugh, a sparkling sound like a tinkling bell. In turn, this made the wrinkles in Mr Fitzgerald's face jump upward in a smile of his own. Patience didn't fully understand the feeling of happiness and truthfully power that was coursing through her. It had never occurred to her that her own joy could bring such delight to someone else, nor that she could enjoy company at dinner so much. 
It could not be said that Lord Tom was having a brilliant time of it down at his end of the table. He had been stationed between a so-called gentleman farmer whose name he couldn't recall and an ageing beauty of the neighbourhood who seemed inclined to simper and coo at him. As he was seated quite near Annabella, he was obliged to be on his best behaviour. Tom decided the best course of action was to focus on eating, as he could not be jolly well expected to reply if his mouth was full. This was a wise decision, as most of the conversation revolved around county politics and intrigue, which amounted to farmers insulting each other's cows or some tripe. Eventually the Duke directed conversation to the matter at hand, which was the planning of the harvest supper. As a newcomer, Tom was thankfully spared from much of this. Oddly enough, it occurred to him that the highlight of his evening so far had been the few moments he had spoken to the reserved Lady Patience. He had originally dismissed her out of hand as being uninteresting. He had never expected her to be clever. She was a little confounding, though, as she did not play by the expected rules of engagement. She did not trade barbs or bat her eyelashes. She simply said what she saw, which, Tom realised, was quite a bit. And then the strangest thing happened. From down the table there came a light laughter unlike any he had ever heard. It was Lady Patience, her dark blue eyes sparkling, her cheeks glowing in the candlelight. He had not seen her smile as she was doing now, all humour and kindness. Truthfully, he had not seen anyone laugh like that, with no reservation and no malice. The effect was spellbinding, and the old codger next to her clearly shared Tom's assessment. In fact, Tom was so taken by the sight, like a painting come to life, that he automatically inhaled sharply. This was unfortunate for him, however, as he had been in the middle of sipping an excellent white wine. He coughed and spluttered a little, and the farmer next to him was obliged to thump Tom once, twice on the back with a broad hand. By the time his lungs were cooperating again, the moment had passed. Whatever spell had temporarily enchanted Lady Patience had receded. Tom shook his head, tutting a little to himself. Been too long out of London, old boy, he chided inwardly. Even these simple country girls are beginning to seem appealing. Chapter 8 Breakfast the following morning was a quiet affair. Patience took her customary seat at the Duke's left hand and was fully prepared for another quiet breakfast with just the two of them. To her surprise, Annabella ended up joining them as well, looking tired but content. To everyone's much greater surprise, Tom entered the dining room a few minutes later as well, looking splendid in a jacket of stony grey and light grey trousers. How kind of you to grace us with your presence, the Duke said pointedly. My apologies for my tardiness. The footman that's looking after me isn't familiar with the knots worn in town, Tom said with an elegant shrug. The Duke absorbed this and Annabella seized on the moment. It's nice to see you in your own ensembles again. That jacket is exquisitely cut. Stuart's? The very one, Tom confirmed with a smile that bordered on genuine. He does excellent work. He has a whole back room just full of blocks and slopers of his customers like a library. That's how he's able to get them cut and made so quickly, Annabella said, helping herself to some boiled eggs. Does he really? There's a folio with my name on it just waiting for someone to come along and select it? Tom asked, amused. Come now, surely there must be a whole shelf with your name on it at least, Annabella said gently teasing. Patience and the Duke held their breath for a moment, waiting to see how Tom would receive this jibe. To their great relief he chuckled, low and soft. Patience found the sound to be warm and inviting. You're probably right he agreed, reaching forward for some sliced ham. The Duke lifted his chin, eyeing Tom closely. Well, that brings me to why I have asked you all to join me for breakfast today. First, I would like to say that our plans for the harvest supper are proceeding swimmingly. Thank you, darling wife, for your help. And it promises to be a great event. Second, I have decided that Tom shall be staying with us for a few months, unless he decides to leave sooner. Here the Duke leaned forward, placing his forearms on the table. While you are here, we will see to your needs. That does not mean that you shall be running off to the races or card tables. Patience, slightly embarrassed for Tom's sake, looked down at her plate. 
She stole a glance over at Tom, who seemed suitably chastened by this frank discussion of his means and accommodations. To his credit, however, he did seem to be grateful as well. He dipped his head and in a soft voice said, Thank you, cousin. I, I am in your debt. That'll be enough of that, the Duke said, sitting back upright and reaching for his coffee. I do expect that you shall be a good guest while you are here. Make yourself useful to the ladies. The familiar facade slipped back over Tom like a silk sheet. Me? Why I shall provide sparkling conversation and wit whenever called upon, and an elegant car for all the ladies to admire? Patience blushed a little at this, as she did find the muscular calves in evening breeches to be most exhilarating. The Duke gave Tom a warning look, who raised his hands and smiled to show that he was in jest. If you will all excuse me, I must see to some estate work today, the Duke said, draining his coffee in one gulp and rising. He stopped long enough to press a kiss on Annabella's forehead, which made her smile. I think I shall retire as well, if no one minds, Annabella said. I'm rather worn out this morning, and there is a shooting party to prepare for Wednesday next. She hesitated before departing, catching Patience's eye to see if she would object. Though the idea of being left alone with Tom made Patience's stomach do a little flip, she nodded anyway. She did not wish to overtax Annabella, and the whole point of this trip was to learn to stand on her own anyway. Satisfied, Annabella sent a lingering look down the table to Tom, who blinked back at her with wide-eyed innocence. Patience caught a small eye roll from the corner of Annabella's eye, and she looked down and bit her lip to keep from laughing. She knew that Annabella generally had very little patience for flippant people, and Tom was putting her through her paces. Still, she went willingly enough, the door to the dining room closing softly behind her. After Annabella's departure, the only sound was the soft clanking of plates and silverware as footmen glided forward to remove the abandoned plates. Patience decided the best course was to focus on eating without rushing too much. She didn't want to appear as a glutton, nor did she want Tom to think she was running away from him. Did you end up enjoying yourself last night, pulled away from the wall as you were? Tom asked, his voice carrying down the table. I did. Patience replied softly. Did you indeed? Tom asked, his tone one of amusement. Even wedged next to that old codger. Mr Fitzgerald was excellent company, Patience sniffed. An awkward silence followed, in which Patience toyed with the eggs on her plate and Tom seemed to be floundering about for something to say. Well, this is just ridiculous. I can't even hear half of what you're saying, Tom said at last, exasperated. Standing, he took his plate and his cup of coffee, napkin draped over his forearm, and sauntered down to Patience's end of the table. She watched his approach with some alarm. What? What are you doing? she asked, her eyes darting from him to the table, to the way that he was skillfully balancing everything. Without bothering to wait for a footman, he used the toe of one of his highly polished hessian boots to pull the chair directly across from Patience out. I'm coming to sit nearer you, he explained, as if it were patently obvious. I can't hear you all the way in Siberia where I was sitting, and I refuse to shout down the table any more. There was a simple kind of logic in what he said, but it did not fully quell Patience's trepidation. She watched him lay his plate and cup down, then sit with a graceful swivel of his hips and folding of legs. There, isn't this more social? Patience nodded, feeling like she couldn't understand how much was acceptable to make eye contact with him. Though he was related to her brother-in-law, he was still a bachelor, and her experience with them was limited to novels. You're a quiet little bird, aren't you? Tom commented. Patience nodded again, which made Tom exhale through his nose in either exasperation or mirth. So, you ended up enjoying last night, then? Yes. Patience said, far more than I thought I might. At this, Tom cocked his head, smirking a little around a mouthful of marmalade and a Sally Lun bun. Oh, did you have low expectations of the company then? No, 
Patience said deliberately. I had low expectations of myself. Tom's chewing slowed, clearly confounded by such an honest and self-aware statement. Patience looked back at him, sure that she should be doing something with her face. You are not much in society, I take it. Is it that obvious? She laughed breathily. Yes, Tom said bluntly. In fairness, I know a bit of your story, but, well, I mean, just look at you. I beg your pardon? Patience asked, her temper beginning to spark at the edges of her voice. You're far too fresh-faced and honest to have been in society long, Tom explained, gesturing at her mean with a vague motion of his fork. You've a sort of flighty, bird-like air about you when you're around people. Patience took a deep breath, accepting the truth in what he was saying. I see I'm not the only one practised in the art of observation. Tom shrugged. Only when it comes to horses and young ladies. Patience harumphed a little at that, swallowing the urge to follow up with a snappy, I imagine you are. Besides which, Tom continued, replacing his fork to sip delicately at his coffee, you're not arrayed like Maiden of the Tun. Patience, blinking rapidly, looked down at her daydress. It was a sprigged cotton, cream with little pink rosettes, and trimmed in matching pink ribbon. The sleeves were suitably puffed at the shoulder and tapered down her arm. What do you mean? This was made by Annabella when she... During my season, Patience responded incensed. It's lovely, and a work clearly made by a master, Tom explained, trying to soothe Patience. Please, I do not mean to offend. I merely mean that you wear it like... Well, like you've been dressed by a dowager who wishes to make you like herself. Patience glared back at Tom, trying to figure out the best way to respond. Her temper was in full bloom now, not helped by the fact that it felt as if the high-necked chemisette was choking her. Her cheeks flushed, and her face grew warm. She did not like feeling embarrassed, not one bit, especially when it was so true. In a show of pique, she stood and tossed her napkin down on her half-empty plate while a footman scrambled to pull her chair out fully. Oh, wait, please, Lady Patience. Tom said, jumping to his own feet so quickly he rattled the table. I did not mean to offend. I, I am unused to conversing with... That is, do not think on what I say. Patience, having been gifted much more than strict rules for dress by her mother, lifted her chin in a great show of pride. That is easily done, she said haughtily, grander than any duchess could hope to be. For I do not think on you at all. With a pointed sniff, she flounced from the dining room, leaving Lord Tom half standing still and staring after her. Once in the hallway, she allowed herself to huff and mutter under her breath. Of their own will, her delicate hands had curled into fists as she stalked angrily to the library. Just who does that rapscallion think he is? she grumped, flinging open the heavy wood door. The exertion felt good. She commenced pacing her footsteps falling much heavier than one would have thought possible given her slight frame. Rake's coming into my sister's home, as if I care a fig for his opinion. In the midst of her ranting and pacing, Patience found herself standing before the fireplace, which had a large mirror behind it to reflect the light that poured in from the windows opposite. She stopped and stared at herself. With one hand, she reached up and touched the frowsy ruffles at her neck. Turning her head to the side, she saw the severe bun at her crown. She sighed, blowing air out of her mouth as if she were a horse. Well, of course he's right, she admitted grudgingly. She turned her head this way and that, getting a good look at her profile in the reflection. She wasn't sure exactly why his opinion should matter to her, and that rankled her too. Sighing again, she threw herself into one of the chairs before the fire, with enough force that it scooted backward by an inch or two. Folding her arms, Patience slumped petulantly, in a decidedly black humour. Perhaps it's because he's the first young man I've met in ages, or because he's such a fashionable person. He has the guilt of London all about him, Patience reasoned. That thought was a little comforting. It was simply that he was a society buck, not because she was developing any girlish notions toward him. Looking down, 
Patience took in her day dress again. The neckline was already high, as society demanded for young ladies in the daytime. But her mother had insisted on filling out the rest of her dresses with these ridiculous chemisettes. She knew very well that Annabella had not made them with this in mind, back when she was sewing them for Patience's would-be trousseau. I could ask Annabella for help, Patience thought, tapping her chin with the fingers of one hand. No, I must prove that I can be a proper society lady without Annabella. I must be able to stand on my own merits. With a determined nod, Patience stood and made her way to the grand desk before the windows. Rifling through the drawers, she found a sheaf of writing paper and ink. Feeling very daring, she began to write quickly before her nerve would fail. Chapter 9 Tom had the distinct impression that he was being avoided for the intervening days between the breakfast he had shared with Patience and the shooting party. He knew that at some point a gaggle of girls had appeared again, but they had disappeared immediately to Patience's rooms. They passed each other in the halls and spoke cordially to one another, but not once did Lady Patience meet his eyes. The day of the shoot was sunny, though an autumn chill had begun to creep in again. This manifested in a cool mist that slithered across the ground every morning and took longer and longer to disappear. Still, even Tom had to admit that the day was a lovely one, with the tops of the trees beginning to turn golden. He still longed for London, but he did enjoy the clean, crisp air instead of the dust and smoke of the city. It was a strange mishmash of guests that were attending, ranging from local so-called gentlemen farmers to the other ranking aristocracy. The Duke and his new Duchess appeared to be egalitarians in their invitations more concerned with balancing numbers and finding people who could make interesting conversation. This was a little amusing to Tom, if not a little frustrating at times, because there were only so many times he could be asked his opinion on one breed of pig or another. Still, he had to admit that Annabella was a rather splendid hostess with excellent instincts, questionable invitation lists notwithstanding. She had set up tents and pavilions with tables of food that nearly groaned from the food piled upon them. The servants were kept running back and forth to ensure a steady supply of coffee and tea, as well as hot punch. There were chairs and lounges, with thick rugs underfoot. As the Duke of Brandon was quite fond of shooting, he kept a retinue of servants that were all dab hands at reloading. He also paid generously to the village men and boys to act as beaters, driving game toward the shooters. When there were no more pheasants to be found, there were clay pigeons to fire at. Don't expect you'll be shooting today, ma, a farmer in an ill-fitted suit and prodigious sideburns said as Tom walked past. Don't want to muss that splendid neckcloth of yours. Tom said nothing in reply, merely gave a slight bow and continued on his way. The truth of the matter was that he was an excellent shot, but it suited him to let the county think he was not an outdoorsman. This would ensure that he would not have to endure evenings spent next to a fireside while a country lass with buck teeth and hair like straw warbled away at an out-of-tune piano. So instead, he spent his time loitering about the tents, making a grand showing of watching the shooting and clapping politely. He would have taken this opportunity to eavesdrop and glean whatever gossip he could, but honestly, what gossip was there to be had out there? This pastime, too, was cut short when Annabella offered to take the ladies on a tour of the gardens. Tom was left alone, listening to the shouts of the men and the crack of the guns. The acrid smell of gun. Smoke was thick in the air, burning his nose. With a frown, he left the tent he was currently in and was absent-mindedly meandering to another when he spotted a fine figure of a woman standing with her back to him just under the edge of the last tent. Rather than watching the shooters, she was staring out across the fields, which still shone with the sun on them. Immediately Tom's eye was fixed upon her. She was tall, but not overtly so. She wore a dress of polished cotton in warm sienna brown with a subtle luster. Her bronze-coloured hair was stylishly cut and curled into the pile of ringlets favoured in London. A ribbon that matched her dress was threaded through, setting off the warm tones in her curls. This afforded an excellent view of her neck, which was long and pale, like a swan's. 
When she turned her head every so slightly, she had the aspect of a Renaissance portrait. Tom was instantly transfixed. He made up his mind at once to introduce himself, no matter the breach in manners. If she were a country girl, the daughter of a provincial squire or some such, she would surely be shocked. But no, Tom was fully convinced that she must be a fellow London transplant. Good afternoon, miss, he began once it had reached her shoulder. Actually, it's Lady, oh, it's you, she said, her voice falling as she turned. As she did so, Tom was shocked to find that it was, in fact, Lady Patience. Disappointed? he asked archly. To his surprise, Patience merely continued to look at him levelly. She finally answered his question with a delicate little shrug. It was more than a little infuriating to find that despite her stylish showing, the transformation was only an exterior one. Within, she was still the same unprepossessing, sheltered girl. It was doubly infuriating that her hair had been styled to embrace its natural curls, no longer slicked sharply to her scalp. A few ringlets had been allowed to frame her face, cut short so that they maintained their curl. Gone, too, was the dowdy chemisette, replaced by a tucker of gossamer chiffon in a deep blue that perfectly matched her eyes. All of this contrived to frame her heart-shaped face in a way that was exceptionally pleasing, which did not help Tom's mood. Grinding his teeth, Tom remembered his promise to the Duke to attempt to be a good guest. Is shooting not your sport? he grated out. Another petite, maddening little shrug met that. I'm not sure, really. I've not seen enough of it to know for myself. And yet you are staring out at the fields? Tom prompted, stepping forward so that he was next to her left shoulder. Yes, she agreed. She held a cup of tea in her right hand, carefully balanced on a saucer in her left. Contemplatively, she lifted it and drank, still studying the distant fields. The action caused her throat to move, and the perfect porcelain look of it was enough to drive Tom to rudeness. Well, what is so fascinating about patches of grass? he demanded. I was just thinking that they're really quite beautiful, in their own way. There's a kind of simple romance to the countryside, don't you think? she said softly, her eyes distant. Romance? Tom repeated. Incredulous, he looked from her to the fields and back again several times. To be sure, Patience said, nodding ever so slightly. There's no lies, no intrigues out there. It's just rain and sun and work. There's clear air and open sky and so much openness. Tom couldn't help but snort derisively. Yes, and there's also mud and cow patties. There is, Patience acknowledged. But even they have their purposes. It's chaotic, but ordered, purposeful. No, Tom said, allowing some heat to come into his voice. He wasn't sure why she was infuriating him this morning, but he had quite enough of it. Shall I tell you what is out there? Hardship, sore backs and starvation? Everything else is some fool notion you have taken into your head from reading some pastoral romance or another? Patience turned toward Tom, and he thought for a moment that she might finally snap at him, maybe even swat him on the arm for his cheek. Instead, she simply gave him another one of those deep, searching looks with her royal blue eyes. Or, she said deliberately, as if he were the childish one, you simply can't see the possibilities. You see only what you have been told, not what might be. Tom stared at Patience for a long moment, his eyes narrowed, his mouth opening and closing like a fish. He was fully aware that he must look ridiculous, which did not help matters at all. You, you're just, ah, uh, he cried, throwing his hands up. I will not be drawn into bandying words with such a naive child. Then don't, was all that Patience said, and calmly turned and walked away from him. Though Tom was left in possession of the field, he knew very good and well that he was not the victor this round. Of course he turned and watched her go, finding that she moved with a long-strided grace that was set off by the gathers on the back of her dress. Scowling, he turned back around, intending on finding the warm punch and nursing a cup in a chair in peace for as long as possible. This was not to be, however, for the moment that he turned back around, 
A familiar, low chuckling met his ears. The Duke himself rounded the corner of the food tent, where he had no doubt heard everything from the other side of the canvas. Well, I'd say Lady Patience has your number, he remarked. Tom sniffed and tossed his head. Mmph, was all that he said. I see that it's no longer necessary for me to warn her off you, the Duke continued grinning. Though I must remind you of the terms of your stay, and to tell you that I shan't have a lady, especially my wife's dear sister insulted in my house. We're not in your house, Tom quipped automatically. True, the Duke acknowledged. I'm inclined to let it slide this time in that case, especially since it seems that Lady Patience is able to hold her own with you. The Duke leaned one broad shoulder against the tent pole, watching the shooting for several moments. It occurs to me that you are doing yourself and the young lady a disservice, however. In what way is that, O oh wisest of dukes? Tom retorted sardonically, folding his arms defensively. The Duke favoured him with a baleful look before turning back to the shooters. You might try speaking to her instead of at her, for starters. She might surprise you. Oh, believe me, she already has, Tom muttered darkly. The Duke chuckled again. Fair enough. But have you tried speaking to her without your hole? The Duke paused and gestured vaguely at Tom's person. London rake-biting humour routine? Have you tried just being Tom with her? Or with anyone in the past several years? Tom opened his mouth for a snappy retort, but found that he had none at the ready. I just do not see the point on wasting good conversation with a chit barely out of the schoolroom, he said finally, sniffing and lifting his chin a fraction of an inch. Infuriatingly, this only caused the Duke to chuckle again. Well, I shan't try to disabuse you of your dislike for Lady Patience. I will, however, simply tell you that you are missing out on knowing a fascinating young lady. Fascinating? Tom repeated incredulously. To be sure, the Duke said, nodding in the direction that Lady Patience had strode off in. She's one of the bravest, cleverest women I've ever had the good fortune to know. She's a most loyal friend and sister, and I can easily say that my life is all the richer for knowing her. Tom looked back and forth between the Duke and Lady Patience a few times, unsure if the Duke was having him on. Tom settled on making a scoffing sound and pointedly turned about to find the bowl of hot punch. Really, Tom, what could you possibly have object to her? The Duke continued, following him within the tent. I just do, Tom snapped, searching about on the tables for the small glass cups meant for the punch. Shall I tell you what I think? The Duke asked, watching Tom's irritated searching. No, but I imagine you will anyway, Tom grumped. Finally, he added silently, finding a tray of the small teacup-shaped glasses. They were cut exceedingly well and etched with patterns of flowers, grapes and artichokes. I think you have spent so much time cultivating relationships with people of a, shall we say, certain reputation, that you haven't stopped to consider if it makes you happy or not, the Duke continued, smirking a little as Tom fumbled with the ladle to pour himself some punch. Why shouldn't I be happy? Tom demanded whirling about so quickly that his hard-won punch nearly sloshed out of the small glass. I eat at the best tables, wear the sharpest fashions in London, have a cracking assortment of friends, and never want for the finest company. The Duke's eyebrows rose with each item Tom ticked off. He bobbled his head a little, not exactly a nod. Have you? Where are these friends, then? Tell me, Tom. Since your father unceremoniously clipped your wings, have any of these fabulous friends paid a call, written a letter? There really wasn't a good answer that. Tom could feel a strange pang in his chest, for the Duke's words were stinging. More crucially, they were also true. So Tom settled instead on indignation. I say, if I had known that I should be the target at today's shooting party, I might as well have remained in bed. The Duke held up his hands in placation. You're right. I forgot that you are not accustomed to such direct talk. I must go and tend to my other guests. If it hadn't taken Tom so much time and effort to find the punch, 
and if said punch hadn't been truly excellent, a kind of lamb's wool with plenty of rum, sugar, toasted bread, and slices of apples and lemon floating atop, he might have spluttered in outrage. As it was, he found himself having to swallow a mouthful in a hurry, which made his eyes water and his throat burn. It was for this reason, he later consoled himself, that he was unable to form a snappy reply to the Duke. If he hadn't been hampered as he was by the punch, he surely would have found a collection of words that would have proved him the victor. It also, most definitely, positively, without question, was not because he could not get the image of Lady Patience's blue-violet eyes from his mind. No, not at all. Chapter 10 Though it would be some time before dinner was announced, Patience had found her way downstairs early. Though the shooting party had gone well, surprisingly so, in fact, the dinner the following night loomed large over her. She had tiptoed into the library, nosing about on the shelves for a copy of Burke's Peerage. It was a thick volume, and when she freed it from the familiar grasp of its neighbours, it landed heavily in her arms. She let out a small oof sound at the weight, and holding it awkwardly, managed to haul it to one of the padded reading stands in the library. In a very patience-like realisation, she had come to the conclusion that the most obvious solution for her feeling unprepared for social events was to read as much about it as she could. To that end, she had a copy of the invite list, thanks to a generous tip to the housekeeper, which she pulled from her pocket. Gingerly, she began flipping through the pages that showed colourful illustrations of family crests and coat of arms. Printed across the pages were seemingly endless family trees, some of them stretching across centuries and multiple pages. With furrowed brow, she began comparing the list to the book, murmuring names and places as she did so. Viscount Andrew Beauchamp, Sheffield. Baron Matthew Mactier, Northumberland. She was so absorbed in her errand that she did not hear the library door open a crack. With one finger, she was busy tracing a particularly long and rambling lineage, her pink tongue barely poking out of her mouth in concentration. Given the state of her concentration, it was understandable, therefore, that when a voice spoke quite near her, she was inclined to shriek. A bit of light reading before dinner. With a lateral jump, Patience squealed in genuine surprise. It took some considerable effort for her to clamp her mouth closed again, placing one white-gloved hand over it, the other on her heaving chest. She thought her heart might simply beat right on out of her chest if she removed her hand. Watching this whole display was an impeccably dressed and coiffured Lord Tom, his expression occupying the territory between surprised and amused. This did not help to settle Patience's nerves. Rather, she found her heart pounding now from anger, and her cheeks flushed both from temper and embarrassment. God's teeth, she swore mildly. You mightn't have announced yourself. I made no effort to conceal myself, Tom protested. I cannot be held accountable if you lose all sense of place with your reading. What can possibly have you so absorbed, anyway? he asked, stepping closer and lifting one cover of the book so that he might read the title. Burks, he asked, surprised. Patience, feeling a little insulted by his tone, tossed her head, letting her hand slide down so that she might stand at attention proudly. Do you find some issue with my choice of reading material? she demanded imperiously. No, it was just unexpected, Tom said, letting the cover fall back down with a quite thump. Oh, and what should you expect me to read? Patience asked. I suppose you think a poor little female like me wouldn't have any interests outside novels. I, well, I had thought that you mentioned them on occasion, Tom began, making a turning motion with his hands. And that's all I know, surely. Patience continued, her hauteur in full swing now. I must be a silly girl, ruled by sensibility and, and romantic novels. I never said so, Tom protested. Well, I'll have you know that I have mine that is much improved by reading. And furthermore, I am fond of novels. They might be silly and contrived, but they are also sweet and diverting and an escape from... She stopped suddenly shutting her mouth quickly and pursing her lips. Tom tilted his head slightly, clearly having caught that last slip. 
an escape from... He prompted. Patience merely inclined her head again, declining to elucidate. Look, I did not come here for this, he said, spreading his hands wide, attempting to pacify her. Then why did you come in here? Patience narrowed her eyes, glancing at the large standing clock against one wall. Why are you downstairs this early at all? That isn't like you. If you must know, I was getting rather tired of being chastised for being late to meals, he sniffed. He appeared to check some haughty impulse, for his face softened again. In truth, I wish to apologise to you for earlier. Patience merely blinked her large blue eyes at him. You wish to apologise to me? she repeated. Yes, and to clarify something, he confirmed with a nod. I think you have been given an unfair impression of myself. You seem to think me far ruder than I actually am. Patience arched an eyebrow as if to silently ask. I wonder how that could be. Please understand, I have no wish to intentionally offend you. Patience stared at Tom for a moment. His face was a study in sincerity and contriteness, his neatly manicured hands open before him still. He had all the physical marks of being genuine, but something about it was off. Though Patience had only been to the theatre once, something about Tom's manner reminded her of that night. It was as if she was watching a performance, and while the rest of the audience saw a convincing act, she could see the strings that held his mask on. I don't think you set out to be rude, perhaps a bit blunter than was necessary, Patience said carefully. I think you are also used to London manners. Tom's face lit up a little at that. Yes, that is it precisely. I am simply unused to conversing with someone so unworldly, he said with an enthusiastic nod. Unworldly, Patience repeated. Someone of such simple tastes, he explained, someone so sheltered. Patience had a strange feeling then, like someone had poured ice water down her back. It was strange, especially contrasted with the heat of anger she had been feeling previously. It was accompanied again by no small amount of panic. She did not wish for the world to know of her strange upbringing. The notion of being an object of ridicule or pity was anathema to her. She had hoped, perhaps foolishly, that the knowledge that she had been raised like a nun in a convent was not a point of discussion among the ton. Tom's choice of words, however, had fully reignited this fear. Though she had no wish to return to London, it seemed entirely likely that in her absence the story had flourished. The tarn might gossip about her behind gloved hands and fluttering fans while she was among them, but they would bandy the story about openly when she was not there. This was the realisation that caused her to freeze, as if she were a marble statue. Perhaps you simply haven't been acquainted with enough ladies to know how to speak with them properly, she ground out at last. A disbelieving chuckle escaped Tom. I can assure you, madam, that is not... You mistake me, Patience said. I do not doubt you being in the company of women, but I sincerely doubt that you have ever truly known a lady. Now that's taking it too far, Tom said, his expression quickly twisting to one of anger. Is it? Patience asked, her own brow turning thunderous. There was an odd rushing sound in her ears again and her heart was thumping so chaotically that she thought it must surely be visible beneath the edge of her dinner gown. If she could have seen herself, she would hardly have recognised herself. Her hair was styled quite fashionably, pulled back in twisting curls along her scalp and pinned into a loose knot. She wore a headpiece of thin golden wires, shaped to look like leaves across her head that tucked behind her ears, that set off the bronze hues in her hair perfectly. Her evening gown was an amber-coloured velvet, cut low with a high waist. The skirt was gathered to the centre of the waistband and hung in graceful swags about Patience's hips to more gathers at the back. All of this contrived to enhance and highlight her colouring and her figure. The dress was a creation of Annabella's, from her time as a celebrated dressmaker, and her hair was the product of Annabella's maid and the efforts of Mr Newright. What they could not take credit for, however, was the high colour on her cheeks, 
or the way her blue eyes sparkled when she was suffering from intense feeling. She glared right at Tom with those liquid sapphires, and he stared right back. His gaze shifted for a moment, just the briefest of glances, to her mouth, her neck, and then right back to her. Something changed in the tone of his stare then, and though he still was breathing heavily and his own gaze was fiery, Patience had an irrational fear that he might eat her right up. They were locked in a strange, silent battle of wills, either with each other, themselves, or both. It was into this tense, heavy atmosphere that the Duchess entered the library. She paused, hesitating, when she spotted Patience and Tom glaring at each other, both breathing hard, as if they had been running instead of bickering. There you both are, she said at last, breaking the strange spell on Tom and Patience. We'll be going into dinner soon, she added, as if needing to justify her presence. In unison, Tom and Patience both turned to Annabella with twin expressions of confusion. They blinked at her, owl-like, and pulled apart quickly like children caught misbehaving. Tom, I believe the Duke wished to speak with you, Annabella said gently. He's in the sitting room. Tom nodded, looking a little dazed. He recovered himself enough to send a last withering look to Patience. When he at last walked away, if Patience did not know better, she would have said it was reluctantly done. She did not have time to ruminate on this, however, for Annabella put herself directly in front of Patience so that she might stare directly into her eyes. Well? she asked simply. Well, what? Patience demanded defensively. Annabella merely raised an eyebrow. What was that all about? I was afraid it would be pistols at dawn between you two. Patience huffed a little through her nose. I wouldn't be wholly opposed, she said. That man? Are they all like that? she asked genuinely. My experience of them is quite limited, but if I thought they were all so... so... She trailed off, her face screwing up a little as she tried to think of a word. So? Annabella prompted. Confounding. Contrary. Con... convalescent. Oh, dash it, that's not right at all, Patience said, throwing her hands up. Annabella laughed, taking Patience by the arm and gently steering her to the library door. He certainly seems to be an expert at getting under your skin. And he had the nerve to call me childish. As if he is not a walking punch caricature, Patience groused. When have you read Punch? Annabella asked, pretending to be shocked. Patience coloured slightly again. I've been bribing the footman to find me copies, she said, a little sheepish. Mother doesn't know, she added unnecessarily. Annabella laughed again. Well, I can't imagine that she needs to know. Through the candlelit halls they made their way slowly to the sitting room. The Duke was sitting but stood when the ladies entered. Lord Tom, however, was staring sullenly into the fire, with one arm propped on the mantel, and ignored everyone else. Patience caught Annabella and the Duke sharing a significant look, but didn't know what it could possibly be about. Diplomatically, Annabella steered Patience to a corner where some new magazines had been laid out. With their heads close together, they murmured quietly over the illustrations and descriptions of this ball or that. Patience, without meaning to, found herself casting a look over her shoulder to where Lord Tom was stationed seemingly still transfixed by the fire. The flames threw him into sharp relief, making him all angles and planes. His sharp cheekbones and chiselled chin were highlighted beautifully by the warm light. His hair fell fetchingly across his forehead. The dark jacket, so brown it was almost black, was cut superbly, showing his trim waist to perfect advantage. He stood with perfectly casual elegance, with the kind of ease and grace that would have made Beau Brummel proud. Painfully, Patience realised that there was truth in what Tom had said to her. He was imminently fashionable and a man of the world, moving through society like a ship that cut easily through water. Next to him, what was she? A girl in a pretty enough dress, but with no conversation and no place in society. She was plain and boring, especially compared to the rest of the ladies of the ton, she was sure of it. 
The whole point of her coming here was to prepare her to be one of the ton, not to cower in the library. Gathering up her courage, she came to a resolution. If she wished to master the pianoforte, she would hire a maestro. If she wanted to learn dance steps, she would seek out a dancing master. This was true for French, watercolours, or any of the other myriad skills a young lady of quality was expected to have. There was nothing for it. If she wanted to complete her education, if she wanted to fill in the gaps that her sheltered upbringing had left, she would have to ask a master for help. There's only one problem, she thought grimly. There's only one person I can ask for help, and we detest each other. With another, hopefully subtle glance over her shoulder again, she considered the prospect. At least he's ornamental enough, she reasoned, and that thought put her to blushing all over again to the point where Annabella asked her if she needed a glass of water. Chapter 11 The morning was slow in coming, with the sky only deigning to lighten to a dull, pewter grey. This was exacerbated by a thick mist that blanketed the ground, moving languidly in the chilly breeze. For Patience, who had spent the majority of the night tossing and turning, replaying last night's scene in the library over and over again in her head, this was akin to torture. She alternately kicked at the blankets, then pulled them back up about herself, swaddling them about her body. She tried putting a pillow over her head as if she could muffle her thoughts by that means. She was not entirely sure why it was that Lord Tom could get under skin so, but the plain fact was that he got her proverbial goat. To that point, she had stared at the crack between the thick drapes on the windows, willing it to lighten. If the day would begin, then she would have ways to distract herself so that she wouldn't linger on his words. The very worst part is that he isn't wrong, she grumped inwardly. Feeling very dramatic, she flopped onto her back, one arm thrown over her eyes, the other smacking her pillows. It would have been far easier if he had been incorrect, because then she could simply dismiss his comments. But because he was right, they just rattled about in her head. Fed up, Patience kicked at her blankets once more, this time flicking them all the way off herself. She swung her legs out of the bed not even wincing as her feet touched the cold floor. Quietly she tiptoed to the windows, peeking out at the mist-covered lawns and gardens. Not even the servants were stirring yet. The estate was silent, sleeping in the pre-dawn grey. With the thrill that always accompanies the knowledge that one is moving about completely on their own, at a time all others sleep, Patience turned from the window and made for her dressing room. As quietly as possible, she began opening cupboards and drawers, trying to find something simple she could slip into without the aid of a maid. She also sought out the thickest stockings she owned, not wishing to catch a chill, as well as her practical walking boots. Thinking longing thoughts of a warm fire, Patience quickly shucked her knife rail and hurriedly pulled on her shift and petticoat. Sitting on a convenient stool, she quickly stuffed her feet into the thick woolen stockings, shivering a little as she rolled them up her legs securing them with short lengths of ribbon and rolling them over. Holding up her short stays, she looked at them dubiously. Lifting her arms over her head, she settled on wriggling into them still laced, doing an awkward interpretation of a fish too long out of water. There was no way to tighten the laces correctly, but she did the best she could. Once the short stays were secured, the rest of her outfit was pretty easy to manage. She wore a blouse of fine cambric linen beneath a practical walking dress that was either grey or blue, depending on the lighting. She added a dark green pelisse overtop with a quantity of dark blue soutache braiding. Her hair proved a bit of a challenge, so she settled on twisting it up in a chaotic knot and securing it as best she could by jabbing hairpins in helter-skelter. Deeming it good enough in her dressing room mirror, she simply jammed a bonnet with pleated dark blue satin trim onto her head. Holding her boots under her arm, Patience padded across her chambers on stockinged feet. Cautiously, she opened her door, poking her head out to ensure that no one would witness her departure. Satisfied that she was unobserved, she scurried as quickly as she dared down the dark hallway, feeling her way along with one hand on the wall. 
There was a delicious sort of exhilaration that had her stomach in its grip as she moved about silently and alone. She had never had much chance for independence under her mother's overbearing thumb. The one that patients had seized onto was taking ambling walks about her mother's isolated estate. She was not permitted to go far, at least so far as her mother knew, but her mother had a bad leg and thus could not supervise patients. The outside servants had never divulged the range of patients' rambles to the Duchess either. Patients suspected they pitied her. As such, Patience was very fond of walking, especially on her own. Sometimes she walked and read at the same time, two pleasures at once. Thus, an early morning perambulation was both an exciting and a soothing prospect for Patience. Taking a chance, she decided to exit by way of the servant's entrance, pausing only to slip her boots on. The moment she was out in the cool, crisp air, Patience felt instantly better. She inhaled great gulps of the fresh air, as if it were water, and she were parched. Smiling, she bounced on the balls of her feet for a moment before setting off across the grounds. She had spied a bit of forest to the north, and it was there that she bent her steps. Patients fully expected the physical exertion would help her to burn through the temper that had been plaguing her. Strangely, it seemed to help only a little. Indeed, now that her mind was more fully awake, she was plagued by visions of Lord Tom's condescending manners and sardonic little grins. And why can't the man contrive to keep his hair under control? Does it have to be always falling across his head in that infuriating way? Patience complained to herself. Perhaps I should loan him some hairpins. That thought slowed her steps, which had been some species of stomping, and induced a wry smile. It was short-lived, however, for Patience found that she had a mile-long list of things about Lord Tom that vexed her. He was proud, arrogant, vain, and... The sky had lightened enough that she could see the ground in greater detail, the mist thinning. Bending, she retrieved a stick, sturdy and forked at one end. For every flaw that she found, for every word that he'd said that needled at her, she swung the stick, decapitating any plant tall enough to stand in her way. Within a half an hour she was panting and her arm was sore. Tom was infuriating, yes, but the truth was that Patience was irritated at herself too. She had allowed a vainglorious rake to get under her skin. Patience could not believe that she was actually going to ask him for his help. The thought boggled the mind. But Patience was ultimately a very pragmatic sort of lady, and knew when she required instruction. Her limited tutors had always found her to be tractable and willing to learn, and she was still willing to do so. Still, she did not want him to have the satisfaction of knowing that he had gotten one over on her. Does it have to be him, though? Patience groused. She sighed, most of her fury spent. There was nothing for it. She would have to place her proverbial self in his hands. She only hoped that she would not regret this particular education. Breakfast was a decidedly subdued affair, punctuated with worried glances between Annabella and the Duke. Patience's seat remained empty. The maid had reported that she was not in her room. Annabella had no wish to be an autocratic jailer, akin to their mother, but she still could not help but fret a little. One of the hall boys had seen Patience slipping out of the servants' entrance before dawn. Annabella couldn't believe that she was sneaking out for a secret assignation and assumed that it was merely a tentative taste of independence. All the same, Patience was not that familiar with the grounds, and Annabella harboured some concern that she might become turned around in the mist. Worse still, she could take a fall or twist her ankle or any other number of injuries, and then their mother would truly lock her up and never let her out again. That thought caused Annabella to replace her coffee cup firmly on the saucer with a small clatter. This drew the Duke's gaze, who sent a querying look to his Duchess. I can always have some of the outdoor servants form a search party, he said quietly, or I can ride out myself. Annabella shook her head. No, I don't want her to think that someone will come running after her the moment she does something on her own. The Duke nodded then went back to his newspaper, or at least pretended to. Annabella caught his eyes flicking to the dining room door at regular intervals, 
which was thrown open wide. His concern made Annabella smile in spite of herself. She had married a good and caring man. She was reassured of that fact every day. In complete opposition to this, Lord Tom occupied his customary seat at the far end of the table again. With the greatest show of disinterest, he was languidly sipping his coffee and biting into soft little cakes. He had made a grand ordeal of showing up to breakfast on time and seemed nearly giddy at the idea that Lady Patience was the one that was late for once. He had put on a sober face for Annabella, but his glee was hard to conceal. At least he is properly dressed this time, Annabella reasoned. Small victory, I suppose. Given the lack of conversation and generally sombre air of breakfast, the sound of one of the back doors that led into the gardens jolting open was as loud as a cannon shot. As the dining room door was open, those seated around the table had a clear view as Lady Patience blew through the door like a feminine hurricane. She walked with a purpose and energy that Annabella had only seen once before when she was coming to her own rescue. Patience paused, looking about herself. She spotted the open dining room door and the three pairs of eyes staring at her, Lord Tom having swivelled in his chair so as not to miss any of the show. She hesitated, her hands curling into nervous fists, before walking into the dining room. Her bonnet was barely on her head, the ribbons trailing down her back. The hem of her dress was damp and dotted with burrs and grass seeds. Please forgive my tardiness, she said, her voice a little breathless. I ended up walking farther than I had intended. Ah, a pre-breakfast constitutional, eh? The Duke said with a smile. Well, my doctor tells me that is excellent for the health. I fully endorse taking as much country air as you like. Though perhaps telling us beforehand so we don't worry, Annabella murmured. I, yes, I am sorry, I just wish to clear my head, Patience said, her voice tightening. Oh, come now, cousin, Lord Tom said, his voice all friendly jocularity. Perhaps Lady Patience has merely discovered the art of being fashionably late. Annabella held her breath a little as Patience's eyes flashed. She seemed at the point of saying something in reply, but settled on turning on her heel and stalking off. Lord Tom, clearly believing himself victorious, turned back to the table and began smugly cutting his bacon again, if such a thing could be done. From further within the house, the unmistakable sound of feet stomping up the stairs echoed. Annabella sighed, placed her napkin on the table, and withdrew to follow Patience up the stairs. Chapter 12 no, that one won't do at all either, Patience cried. The poor, hapless maid stood with her in the dressing room, Patience stripped down to a clean chemise and stays. All about them were the contents of the wardrobes and drawers, as if somehow the dressing room had exploded. Timidly, the maid held up another dress, this one in a washed-out cornflower silk. This one looks nice and tidy with the chemisette that I don't want to look nice, Patience interrupted, throwing her hands up. Petulantly, she sat and pouted on the stool before the dressing table. Perhaps if I knew what your ladyship was searching for, the maid asked timidly. I want to look like a lady, Patience said, twisting slightly to look at herself in the mirror. She leaned one elbow on the dressing table, cupping her chin with her hand. Oh, but you do, my lady the maid insisted. Why, that muslin on the ruffles is so fine. No, Patience said slowly. I want to look like a lady, not a, a girl from the schoolroom, or a dowager. In the reflection of the mirror, Patience could see the maid panicking a little. She was looking down on the ground, then turned for the wardrobe, desperate to find what her mistress was searching for. It was in the midst of this frantic searching that Annabella appeared in the doorway of the dressing room. Without comment, she took in the scene and then focused on patience. Let me take over, Amelia, Annabella said gently but firmly. Oh, Your Grace, no, I couldn't, the maid protested, wringing her hands in her apron. Clearly she was afraid that she had displeased her betters and would be chastised for it. Trust me, Annabella said, leaning in a little closer. I have practice pleasing difficult customers. She paused for a moment, thinking. 
Perhaps you might send Pemble up, she asked the maid, requesting her own lady's maid. Amelia, looking both relieved and terrified at once, made a hurried bow and scampered off to do as her duchess had asked. Patience just watched all of this glumly, not even bothering to sit up properly, preferring instead to remain leaned on her elbow as she was. Annabella caught her eye in the mirror and gave Patience a significant look, to which Patience only sighed. Well, now that you've frightened off the maid, would you care to tell me what it is that you are looking for? Annabella asked, coming to stand behind Patience. With deft, gentle hands, she began pulling the haphazard pins out of Patience's hair. I don't know, Patience muttered, sitting back a bit so that Annabella could reach her hair more easily and dropping her hands into her lap. Yes, you do, Annabella insisted gently. When you close your eyes, you can see how you wish to look to the world. What do you want everyone to see when they look at you? Me, Patience answered immediately. Not my mother's taste, nor my unusual situation. And if you could use one word to describe yourself, Annabella asked, leaning forward to place a few liberated pins into a porcelain dish, what would you like it to be? Ravishing, Patience whispered. I want people to look at me and see a woman. Ravishing, eh? Annabella repeated, smiling a little to herself. Well, that's easily done. You're a natural beauty, after all. As if on cue, Patience's hair tumbled down her back, a riot of bronze-coloured curls. You've much to recommend you this morning, though, perhaps, Annabella said, pulling a stray leaf from Patience's hair. Not loose foliage. Patience shrugged a little sheepishly, but also could not help laughing. Just imagine the horror if I came down to breakfast with natural things in my hair. However could Lord Tom's delicate sensibilities stand it? Annabella snorted through her nose a little. We couldn't allow that. I don't know if we've any smelling salts in the house. Thus the mood was lifted considerably by the time that Pembley, Annabella's lady's maid, arrived. She immediately got to work brushing Patience's hair, gently and expertly sorting out the tangles in short order. She applied a pomatum of her own recipe, smelling like orange blossoms and vanilla, and began twisting Patience's hair up deftly. In the meantime, Annabella had been running her expert eye over Patience's wardrobe and selected a day dress. She held it up for Patience to see in the reflection of the mirror. It was of a fine but weighted linen in the richest burgundy, like the colour of a deep and red wine. It was cut simply, with the neckline meant to be filled by a fichu or tucker. The sleeves, though long, were made in a series of puffs and gathers and delicate smocking, evoking feelings of a medieval princess. Are you sure? Patience asked, doubtful. She had never worn that one before, her mother having vetoed it as too daring. Oh yes, Annabella confirmed, stepping closer. The cut will be exceptionally flattering. If I might say, my lady, Pemble interjected, it will suit your colouring very well too. Her grace has a good eye. Swayed, Patience nodded her assent. Obediently, she held her arms out and allowed them to slip the dress over her head. With quick fingers, Pemble buttoned up the few buttons at the back. When she was done, Annabel encouraged Patience to walk. She relented again, holding her head high and striding out into her room, feeling a little silly. This feeling dissipated, however, when both Pemble and Annabella made small appreciative noises. Patience turned back and found that they both stood with their hands clasped at their bosom, enchanted. Patience looked down at herself, trying to take it all in. The skirt of the dress was cut flat along the front, but gathered at the back with dozens of tiny cartridge pleats. They had added a coppery satin ribbon worked in purples and reds in a flower motif to the waist, emphasising her figure. There was a small train at the back, so that when Patience walked, the skirt trailed a little. The effect was to make Patience look like a queen waiting to rule over her court. Feeling a little silly but also resplendent in her new ensemble, Patience looked to Annabella and Pemble for approval. Will it do? she asked, still feeling a little shy. Wordlessly, both women nodded. This was all the encouragement that Patience needed.
Tom was quite aware that the Duke was trying to catch his eye. He, however, was doggedly ignoring him, focusing on his breakfast with a concentration that bordered on fanatical. Finally, the Duke was reduced to resorting to a pointed clearing of his throat. Automatically, Tom looked up and instantly regretted it. At the other end of the table, down, down, down the ridiculous length of it, he could see the Duke's baleful expression. With a resigned sigh, Tom replaced his silverware upon the plate. Well, he demanded, what is it now? To his surprise, the Duke sighed and shrugged a little. You know that I have always had a low opinion of London society and manners, he began conversationally. Yes, I'm aware, Tom said warily, unsure of where the Duke was headed. I had always been under the impression that you were considered something of a charmer, known for you flattery and fine manners, the Duke said, leaning back in his chair and signalling for more coffee. Tom's eyes narrowed. I can't speak for how the ton choose to represent me, but I have not heard any complaints thus far. The Duke gave Tom an arched look over the rim of his coffee cup. Well, I must say then that London manners must have fallen very low indeed if you are what passes for a flatterer of the first order. Now Tom was truly incensed. And what might you mean by that, sir? We all saw the state lady patients returned in. I have to imagine that you bear some responsibility for her aggravation. The Duke paused to sip his coffee again, humming appreciatively. Stolton. Would you be sure to inform Mrs. Fletcher that the coffee is excellent today? Certainly, Your Grace, the butler answered, his chest puffing a little as if he had personally brewed the coffee. May we return to the subject at hand? Tom demanded, staring down the table at the Duke. It is not my fault if she is in a poor humour. She is simply impossible to talk to. The Duke laughed heartily at that, even going so far as to slap the table. Oh, my dear boy, he said, still chuckling. I suppose you never were one for your lessons, were you? Meaning? Meaning simply that you never learned the appreciation of a challenge, nor the richness of the reward that follows. Tom did not know what to say to that. For him, the path of least resistance had always been the correct one. He was not lazy. He merely liked to think himself efficient, expedient even. The only real work he was fond of was driving at quite a clip and other such sports. He was even handy with his fives, boxing at this club or another on occasion. He was gathering himself for a reply that would most assuredly have been scathing, sure to put the Duke in his place, when the Duke's expression changed and he rose from his chair again. Ah, welcome back, the Duke said, smiling and bowing slightly. Jolly good thing the ladies returned when they did, Tom consoled himself. I might have said something rude, if I could think of it. Gritting his teeth a little, he rose as well, and was content to make a vague bow in the direction of the doorway. A flash of unexpected colour caught his eye, however, and his head was whipping back around. Lady Patience, wearing a dress the colour of a deep and potent red wine, stood in the doorway as if she owned it. Her cheeks were still flushed, and her eyes still sparkled with the barely banked fires of temper. Her hair, too, seemed as if it were barely contained, threatening to spring free and fall down her back like a pagan of yore. To Tom's chagrin, she quirked an eyebrow at him, and then swept right on past. When she did so, she left a lingering cloud of the scent of spiced flowers. Tom, his intention of ignoring her quite forgotten, could not take his eyes from her. She took her seat elegantly, looking every inch the dignified lady. Tom, however, was so transfixed that he found himself feeling about awkwardly to locate his own chair. He sat with considerably less grace, a curious feeling like electricity running through him. He couldn't explain why, but part of him hoped that she would look his way. He really hoped that she would speak to him in that confounding way again, so that he might have the pleasure of arguing with her again. Chapter 13 There was an informal luncheon and salon arranged for the afternoon, with many of the ladies from the county invited. 
the Duke and Duchess had engaged the services of a few musicians, as well as a reading of some philosophical works. These gatherings, which had been the height of fashion in Paris, were meant to encourage both enjoyment and thought. It was also an excuse for people to see and be seen in the daylight, to note who sat next to whom, who was spoken to, and who was snubbed. Though September was nearly spent, the shades and shutters of the estate had been thrown open wide so that the rays of golden autumn sun might be admitted. It was warm within, and if one did not look out to see the changing colours of the leaves, it could almost have been spring. As it was an informal gathering, people would come and go as they pleased, helping themselves to a buffet that was constantly replenished. They could also choose to listen to a Scottish thinker declare, or the musicians perform. Some chose to take the cool, clear air, walking slowly in the perfectly manicured gardens. It was a thoroughly enjoyable afternoon, if a bit dull by some standards. Lord Tom was one of those who held this opinion. He may, in fact, have been the only one to hold this opinion on that day. He wore an indolent expression for much of the day, which drove most people away from him. This suited him just fine, as it allowed him to lean against a doorway, playing the part of the brooding gentleman perfectly. He had dressed the part, wearing a flyaway jacket of black, with a maroon waistcoat that had been embroidered in complementing colours. He found himself listening to the music at first, telling himself at first it was simply because it was more likely to be his to his taste. It certainly absolutely in no way possible was due to the fact that Lady Patience had chosen to sit within and listen. She listened with a curious tilt of her head, her white neck shining like a swan's. Though Tom could not put his finger on it, but there was something decidedly different about her. She held herself with impeccable posture required of all young ladies, but it was like instead of perching about like a bird that was ready to be startled, she inhabited the space comfortably. She was moving in the world, rather than having it move around her. Whatever it was, Tom watched her with rapt attention, his arms folded over his chest. If anyone had been willing to speak to him, they would surely have been discouraged by the way that he only had eyes for patience. She was a confounding creature, a mystery that he could not quite unravel. He'd had quite enough of that in his life of late, what with still not understanding what precisely had precipitated his expulsion from his father's house. She had to be studied and understood, so that she might not vex him any further. It did not help that after the musicians, a quintet of strings and a harpist had finished a delicate air, Patience stood and began to make her way to the door. Tom almost panicked for a moment, for he was not prepared to be discovered, nor for Patience to spot him. Quickly, he looked away from her, as if he were paying the utmost attention to the musicians. Still, he could not help but watch from the corner of his eye as Patience glided toward him. He noted with approval the way that she walked, no longer the stilted, nervous, quick steps that she had exhibited up to this point. No, instead she moved purposefully, almost sensuously, as if she could find no greater pleasure than the act of walking. It was like she was savouring it, savouring walking and simply existing. Tom was utterly beguiled. She paused next to him at the doorway, halfway out, but hesitating as if she thought better of it. Boldly, she looked right at him, and when Tom turned his own eyes toward hers, he found that she was staring at him openly with those blue-violet eyes of hers. He arched one of his dark eyebrows at her and decided to play the part of the charming rake. Good afternoon, Lady Patience, he said evenly, with a hint of warmth in his voice. I hope you are enjoying the entertainment. I am, thank you, Lord Tom, she replied, her voice low in deference to the performers. I must admit that I have not had much exposure to the modern composers, so I savour any chance I get to learn more about them. This was a measured but surprisingly honest answer that had Lord Tom unfolding his arms and standing up straight. And yet you are departing? More pity them, then, he said with a nod to the musicians, for losing such a lovely member of the audience. Patience seemed to absorb this readily, not pulling back or coming over all prickly as Tom had expected. 
she simply continued to favour him with her unflinching gaze. Be that as it may, I thought it might be nice to hear Mr Mackenzie speak. Oh, have you a keen interest in modern philosophy too? Tom inquired, a smile pulling at one side of his mouth. I do, in fact, she replied easily. Books have been my most steadfast companions, and it would be nice to learn from an expert for once. For some reason, this caused her to pull up and stop speaking. Avoiding his gaze, she curtsied as if to depart, then hesitated again, turning back to Tom. I wonder if you would care to accompany me. Mr. McKinsey spends much of his time in Edinburgh and London, and I would not want to offend him with my provincial manners. She paused, looking Tom over boldly again. I know I can count on you to set me right when I err in this way. Tom, taken completely off guard both by her request and the openness with which it was made, was surprised into smiling at her. I can't imagine you would ever offend anyone with your presence, he purred at her, but I would take great delight in escorting you. Patience blinked a few times at this, and Tom smirked a little to himself. She was clearly not expecting such a polite response either. Ready to act the part of the chivalrous gallant, Tom bowed to her and offered her his elbow. She hesitated in taking it, looking about as if someone were going to jump out and tut at her in disapproval. When no one did, however, she placed her hand in the crook of his arm and allowed him to guide her to the room in which Mr. McKinsey spoke. There was a crowd of gentlemen all seated within, listening as a man with just the hint of a brogue stood at the front and lectured. He was dressed well but simply, in a slightly old-fashioned brown suit, but his eyes and manners were lively. This kept his audience to rapt attention. Tom, remembering his role as escort, solicitously guided Patience to one of the few empty chairs and stood behind her after she was settled. Interestingly, Tom noted that Patience was not the only woman there. Indeed, there was at least one other young lady, and two who wore the black caps of widows. Though the man was a talented speaker, Tom found that at first his mind wandered. He wondered if all of this was worth it, being stuck in a small room with a collection of old stodges. But then, something Mr. McKinsey said penetrated the bored haze of Tom's mind. It is all a question of freedom and happiness in the end. Can a man be happy without security in his property? Can any of us hope for a better world in which so many voices are unheard simply for want of a few acres? Despite himself, Tom could feel something like a blush creeping up his neck. He had been made acutely aware of his own precarious standing of late. Though he was the son and heir of a rich man, he actually had very little. These words struck home, and Tom found his arms unfurling, his posture straightening. Mr. McKinsey, as if sensing this, made eye contact for a moment. Though the older man's eyes were hidden behind delicate round spectacles, they were sharp and direct as arrows. Tom almost gave in to the impulse to blush, certain that the man could see directly into his mind. Wishing to avoid this, Tom looked down, as if seeing to Lady Patience. To his surprise, her head was tilted thoughtfully again, but her demure expression was gone. Her brow was creased and the corners of her mouth turned down a little. Absently, she played with a string of polished amber beads about her neck. She had the aspect of one deep in thought. Tom had seen these little expressions play out before, in women of London, when they attended such salons. Of course, Tom suspected that with them, it was all in an effort to appear enlightened and clever, when in reality, they were far more concerned about being seen than listening. Patience was clearly not putting on a performance, however. Her wide eyes were fixed on the speaker, and her mouth moved occasionally, silently repeating words occasionally. Such was her attention that Tom could not help but feel shamed by his inattentiveness earlier. She was completely genuine, whereas Tom had been so focused on projecting an image of himself that he had missed out on some of Mr. McKinsey's wisdom. For the rest of the talk, Tom listened genuinely. Absently, he placed one hand on the back of Patience's chair, leaning forward on it slightly so that he might hear better. Consequently, this put his hand very near her back, so near, in fact, 
that if she had taken a deep breath, they would have been touching. At last the Duke rose, and with a gracious, sweeping gesture of his arm said, We must allow Mr. McKinsey to rest his voice, but I have no doubt we should all be pleased to hear him speak for the rest of the evening. I applaud you most heartily, and thank you for sharing some of your thoughts with us. The Duke applauded loudly, and the rest of the room followed suit with enthusiasm. This only seemed to embarrass Mr. McKinsey, who bowed first to the Duke and then to the rest of the audience. When the others in the room began filing out, Patience remained seated, that same thoughtful look on her face. Tom, too, found that he had no wish to leave just yet. If he did, he might become that old self again. And he was not sure how he felt about that prospect. Mr. McKinsey, who had been busy polishing his spectacles on a lace-edged handkerchief, noticed the pair still lingering when he replaced his glasses on his nose. Have I bored you to sleep, my dears? he asked, coming forward with an open smile. Patience smiled graciously at him and answered softly but energetically, Oh, not at all, my good sir. I was rather moved with what you said, especially about the importance of education. Were you indeed? And did I speak well? Mr. McKinsey asked, taking the seat next to Patience. You did, she confirmed. Her eyebrows knitted together a little. Though I must confess that I was a little troubled by one passage. Oh, well, we can't have that. Tell me which it was, and I'll see if I can't unburden you. You spoke most eloquently about the importance of property, and how a man might better himself by the security thereof. But... Patience hesitated and Mr. McKinsey waited patiently. Tom automatically reached out as if to touch Patience's shoulder to reassure her, but checked himself at the last moment. Mr. McKinsey's eyes flicked to the aborted gesture, up to Tom and back to Patience. Well, what hope is there for the women of the kingdom then, Mr. McKinsey? We cannot own property, therefore how might we become better citizens? Patience finished at last, her voice echoing with genuine concern. Ah, now that is a good question, my young friend, Mr. McKinsey said with an approving nod. My good friend Mary Wollstonecraft believed the solution was the education of women so that they may demand more for themselves. You knew Mrs. Wollstonecraft? Patience asked, leaning forward eagerly. Tom couldn't help but smile at her enthusiasm. Her writings on education have been such an inspiration. Have they? Well, I am sure that would have pleased the lady greatly. Mr. McKinsey looked a little sad for a moment, his eyes misty and distant. I miss her company most keenly, and often find myself wondering what she would say about this thing or that when I am writing. Impulsively, Patience reached out and touched Mr. McKinsey's arm, her face full of sympathy. Rousing himself, Mr. McKinsey patted her arm gently and smiled at her. Well. You just continue your education always, and you shall make her proud. With a brief knowing glance up at Tom, Mr. McKinsey continued, I have always found educated women to be the best of company after all. Pretty faces, even ones as lovely as yours, fade, and all that is left is good humour, good conversation, and good hearts. Such a look came over patience then that Tom wished that he were a painter so that he might capture it forever. A smile spread across her face, slow but pure and so full of light that it was like watching the sun rise. Her eyes, too, crinkled at the corners and fairly gleamed with happiness. Mr. McKinsey, placing one hand on his heart as if he were greatly affected, said, Nay, madam, I spoke in haste. How could a sweet face such as yours ever fade? All of this beauty, and brains too. You shall be a boon to your husband, and a lucky man he shall be indeed. With this last comment, Mr. McKinsey gave Tom another significant look, then stood and bowed to the both of them. Tom shook himself all over, like a dog that has been out in the rain. He leaned down over to Lady Patience, wanting to ensure that she had not taken offence to Mr. McKinsey's words. Indeed, she clearly had not. Her face was flushed again, not with embarrassment this time, but with pleasure. Her eyes were shining with some undefined emotion, and her face still glowed. Her good humour was infectious, 
and despite his best efforts not to, Tom found himself fighting a grin of his own. Chapter 14 Patience was a changed woman. She moved throughout the estate with a new kind of confidence that no one had seen before. Annabella was pleased beyond measure, for this was exactly what she had hoped for from the first. Like a butterfly finding her wings, Annabella mused. But that wasn't quite right, she realised. No, more like a flower blooming in the sun. She is still patience, but a more open, complete version of her. Annabella didn't know precisely what had occurred on the day of the luncheon. All she knew was that Patience had worn a vaguely cat-like, self-satisfied little smile ever since. She also did not hide in the library, instead joining in conversation more easily and even speaking to guests when they arrived. She read openly and seemed almost eager to share what she knew. Annabella could hardly believe that this was the same little sister who had floundered and stammered so badly in company just a few months earlier. As it happened, one morning after breakfast, Patience announced that she really would like to see more of the fall foliage. This was perfectly understandable, as the Duke's estate sported a good amount of carefully maintained timber trees. It was now October, and the leaves were beginning to change. No one could possibly walk the entire estate in a day the Duke said with a smile, not even you. This did not dampen Patience's enthusiasm. Well, we could. We could ride, she said. That surprised Annabella. She could not imagine that her mother had ever allowed Patience to ride before, but she was not about to say that aloud. Truthfully, Annabella had never had occasion to ride before she had become a duchess on a country estate either. In fact, she was taking lessons on the sly with Mr Fitzgerald. I cannot accompany you, I'm afraid, she said. I have masses to do to prepare for the harvest supper next week. Oh, Patience said, her face falling a little. Should I stay and help you instead? Certainly not, Annabella said, waving her off. You should enjoy yourself. Enjoy the clear weather while we have it. Patience nodded, her gaze sliding to one of the large paned windows. The sun was shining now stubbornly peeking out from behind the occasional cloud. It had poured again the night before, leaving the grass damp and impromptu muddy bogs all over the grounds. Hopefully, Patience turned to look at the Duke. Alan raised his hands and said, No, I'm afraid I must attend to business as well. The harvest is always a chaotic time for us. Annabella couldn't help but feel a pang of guilt when Patience's face fell. The Duke, too, appeared to notice, for he quickly suggested, How about you, Tom? I see that your morning is free. Indeed, Tom did appear to have nothing at hand. He was sitting on a sofa, but leaned over so that his elbow was planted on the armrest. His chin was in his hand, and he stared out the window nearest to him intently, clearly lost in thought. With his dark, tousled hair and fabulous clothing, Annabella thought he did a credible impression of the dark and brooding Lord Byron. When the Duke said his name, Tom started deep in some reverie. What? What's on? Lady Patience wishes to see the grounds, Annabella said, deliberately taking the lead in the conversation. She had decided on a course of kindness and gentle prodding with him, which seemed to be working well. The gift of several bolts of silk had softened Tom considerably toward Annabella as well. Would you be willing to escort her on a ride around the estate? You're probably more familiar with it than I am anyway. Annabella could sense a lingering hesitance in Tom, both in the way that he unfurled and straightened up slowly, and the way that he looked warily around the room. He did not answer immediately, but his eyes landed on Annabella. With a deep breath, he finally spoke. I would be delighted to, he said quietly. Thank you for taking the time from your busy schedule, Lady Patience said wryly. With a sigh, Annabella took Patience by the hand and pulled her up from the settee they shared. Come, let's see if we can't find something suitable for you to wear. It was a fortunate thing that Annabella and Patience were so alike in size and stature, for it meant the former could lend the latter a redding goat with little trouble. It was a deep mulberry purple with a dark blue collar at the back 
and black braiding along the shoulders. Patience was a little shorter than Annabella, but this would not matter much when she was up in the saddle, as the skirt would be draped over her legs. Once Patience was appropriately dressed in the requisite blouse and cravat beneath the full pleated skirt and red ingot, Annabella saw her to the mews. The grooms had been notified in advance, and a pair of horses had been saddled in preparation. Tom, already mounted on a stocky bay, leaned casually over the saddle, resting his arms at the base of the horse's neck. He had added a brushed black beaverskin top hat to his ensemble of a cranberry red jacket and buff-coloured breeches tucked into shining, tasselled hessian boots. The horse selected for patience was a good-natured black mare with a pretty little muzzle. Annabella could tell that patience, though clearly a little intimidated, was instantly smitten with the creature. She cooed happily at the horse, stroking her nose. Her name is Velvet, the groom supplied helpfully. Hello, Velvet, Patience said, reaching up to pull the mare's forelock from the bridle. I hope we shall be very good friends. Annabella was not a superstitious person, but she believed in feelings. This was not to be confused with the fad for sensibility, whatever that meant. No, this was perhaps nothing more than the traditional feminine intuition or maybe just practice from her many years of having to read customers. After all, she had to be able to discern not only the tastes and whims of the women of the ton, but also who was likely to pay their bill, and who wasn't. Whatever it was, there was a strange feeling in the pit of Annabella's stomach as she watched Patience mount. She had to resist the urge to dart forward and assist, knowing that Patience surely wanted to do this as independently as possible. To her credit, she did mount the mare with little trouble, settling gingerly into the saddle and adjusting her skirt and ridding goat over her legs with relative ease. Well, off with you both then, Annabella said with false brightness. In a lower voice, she stepped closer to Tom and added, Please take good care of her. He blinked at Annabella once, then dipped his head and touched his hat in agreement. The pair turned and nudged their horses out of the mews, leaving Annabella behind. All around her, the work of the stables continued. Stable hands and grooms sweeping, cleaning out the stables, cleaning harnesses, polishing the carriages. But Annabella felt fixed to the spot. It was as if she were a rock in the middle of a flowing stream. It was only when Tom and Patience were far away, growing smaller with every step, that she at last shook herself to wakefulness again. Come now, there's no time for being a pillar of salt she chided herself. It was true. There was a veritable mountain to be done in preparation for the harvest supper. It was the first she would preside over as Duchess, and it was imperative it go well. And yet, despite this, there was still this feeling in the pit of her stomach that something lingered on the horizon, that there was change waiting to pounce. There was a silence between the riders for quite some time. This suited Patience just fine, as it was taking a great deal more concentration to focus on riding than she had anticipated. She'd done it only a handful of times before, and it was all a lot to manage. One foot was in a stirrup, the other hooked over small shelf that jutted out of the side saddle on the same side. Consequently, she couldn't help but feel that she was perched precariously atop the horse rather than securely astride. Additionally, she had a long skirt to contend with and a thick riding stick in her right hand so that she could give commands to the side of the horse opposite where her legs were. So she was quite grateful not to be expected to chatter on at the same time. It was also always a balm for her to be out of doors, and she inhaled the autumn air gratefully. The sun shone, but the grass was still damp from the previous night's rain. The whole outdoors smelled clean and fresh, as if it had been thoroughly washed. The sight of bright yellow and even an occasional dash of orange beginning to fall over the tops of the trees was an added bonus. In spite of her wariness at the company, Patience felt herself inclined to smile. She felt light, much lighter and freer than she had when she had arrived. When she looked back at her life before meeting Annabella, it was dark and furtive. Now she was out in the sun, going for a ride with a, well, a gentleman companion. 
She had friends. She had socialised many times successfully. A great thinker had complimented her even. I am, I am happy, she realised with a start. This too made her smile even more. It wasn't that she had been unhappy per se, but merely that it highlighted the absence of happiness. She'd simply had no notion that life could be enjoyed in such a manner. And then Lord Tom opened his mouth and recalled patience back to herself. Enjoying yourself, are you? As always, a tint of mockery coloured his words. Patience glanced over at him and saw that he looked strangely conflicted, as if he had regretted speaking. She, however, straightened her back further and refused to be baited into arguing with him. I am, rather. And why shouldn't I be? The weather is lovely. The scenery is beautiful. And my mount is agreeable. Tom looked conflicted, as if he wanted to make a pithy remark, but was holding himself in check. Patience watched his internal struggle for a moment, trying not to laugh. I'm sure such a provincial pastime is beneath your dignity, however, she added. He shot her a look. His dark eyes narrowed a little. You've me and my tastes pegged, have you? Patience shrugged. Well, it has become your most popular refrain. Tom said nothing to that, but Patience could see his jaw working a bit. Feeling a little sorry for having needled him, she softened a bit. Look, have you even stopped to ask yourself if you are enjoying what you are doing? I wouldn't do something I don't enjoy, he retorted immediately. Wouldn't you? Patience asked simply. Why don't you just check in with yourself? Is there nothing about this moment that is enjoyable to you? To his credit, Tom fell silent then. His forehead creased beneath the brim of his black top hat as he thought. There was a new sort of silence between them, a comfortable one. Patience, for many years of being on her own, had an innate understanding of when someone needed silence to understand themselves better. You're right, Tom said slowly at last. I had never. There is much to be enjoyed in this moment. I did not realise how noisy my life was before coming here. Everything was always in a rush, racing from one place to the next. A brief pause, and then Patience could scarcely believe her ears. Thank you. You're welcome, she said sincerely, and with as little smugness as could be expected. This isn't to say that I don't think my life previously had merit, he added quickly. There is much fun to be had in the hectic risk and tumble of London. Patience shrugged at that. Now it was Tom's turn to be smug. You don't believe me? I've seen nothing to recommend it, Patience replied. Well, that's hardly surprising. You wouldn't know what it's like then, Tom said confidently. Patience could feel the familiar sense of irritation building within her, but it was different somehow this time. You think I'm just a sad little shut-in, don't you? You can't imagine that I might be capable of keeping up with you. I simply choose not to. This wrung a cheeky grin from Tom. Very well, then, he said, turning in the saddle a little to issue a challenging look to Patience. Would you care to put that to the test? Chapter 15 There was something important to understand about Lady Patience Carnegie. Though she was a genteel and well-bred young lady, she was the daughter of a duke. Though she had never met her father, she had his blue eyes and his courage and pride, though she was late in discovering those last two. More importantly, she had been raised by an iron bulwark of a mother who had taught her the ways of haughtiness. Tom was therefore not entirely prepared for the way that Patience's face steeled. He was also not prepared for her to accept his challenge with a firm nod. Very well, he said, feeling a little reckless. His heart was beating faster, and he could feel something like electricity running through his body. He scanned the horizon, and with one hand pointed to a landmark. Do you see that folly, just past that hill? Again, Patience nodded. Let's race to it. Race, Patience repeated, looking a little dubious. The first one there wins, he confirmed. What's life without a little risk? 
Of course, if you feel that you aren't up to it, he trailed off pointedly, shrugging with one shoulder. As if I'd give you the satisfaction, she scoffed. All right then, Velvet. Shall we show these silly boys what for? Tom chuckled a little and waited a moment while Patience gathered the reins shorter in her hands and adjusted her seat. When she was ready, he said, Right, on the count of three. One, two, and go. Poor Brutus, unaware that much would be expected of him by his rider, seemed utterly taken by surprise and a little incensed when Tom suddenly dug his heels into the grumpy bay. The horse deemed it necessary to snort and roll his eyes for a moment before shifting his weight onto his rear legs and then springing forward with a mighty bound that belied his stocky build. Tom, pleasantly surprised, leaned forward expertly, lifting up from the saddle to give Brutus more room to stretch out his back. His hands high on Brutus's neck, he was perfectly balanced. His reputation as a Corinthian had been justly earned. He was more than pleased to discover that when given the opportunity and freedom to do so, his horse seemed as thrilled as Tom at the brisk pace. Poor thing, Tom thought as he peered between his horse's ears. Not been given much chance to stretch your legs, have you? Tom wasn't entirely sure who he meant, but he was fairly certain he was referring to the horse. It was a further surprise to realise that there was the pounding of hooves directly behind him. He had expected to carry off an easy victory, but Lady Patience appeared to be giving it her all as well. Like an expert racer, Tom looked back by means of ducking his head to glance beneath his arm. A scant stride behind him, Lady Patience had mimicked his posture as much as she might in a side saddle. Her face was a study in concentration and determination. The sight of Patience taking their race so seriously made Tom grin like a fool. He was feeling a little reckless and daring, with the wind whipping past his ears and his heart pounding. His horse, too, seemed greatly pleased at the chance to have his head, snorting and skipping about occasionally. There was a hill before them, and Tom pressed his hands forward, helping Brutus to balance. When he crested the hill, however, his enthusiasm drained away in a trice. Unseen from their perspective, there was a great muddy patch below, hidden in tall grass. Tom only spotted it because the reflection of water between the stalks of grass caught his eye. The moment his horse began descending, he leaned back, letting Brutus balance the weight of his head by putting weight on the bit. With a small shout of triumph, Patience on her small mare shot past him. Wait! No! Tom yelled, unable to warn her in time. The little black mare was in the thick of the boggy mess before it knew what was happening. The unexpected change of footing confused the poor animal, who began slipping and trying to pull her hooves free of the soppy mess all at once. Patience, inexperienced as she was, held on gamely for much longer than Tom would have credited her with. She may have kept her seat entirely if her foot hadn't slipped from the stirrup. She cried out then, a sound of such pure distress that Tom felt galvanised in a way he had never experienced hitherto. Hold on, he shouted. Brutus, having hesitated at the base of the hill with all the commotion, tried to twist his head about in protest when Tom dug his heels into his sides. With a solid yank on the reins, Tom had him set right again, wading into the mud that sucked at the horse's hooves. Patience was still precariously on her horse's back, but had lost the reins as well as her stirrup. The horse was fully panicking now, its eyes rolling, neck lathered, and foam at its mouth. The only reason it hadn't bolted yet was simply from indecision and the slowing nature of the mud. Tom, using Brutus' larger size to his advantage, attempted to bodily get the mare out of the mire. This did not work even a little bit, and only seemed to irritate her further. Switching tactics, he shifted his reins to his left hand, and with his right, swiped for the reins that hung slack about Velvet's neck. He missed, reached farther, tried again and missed. This flailing, however well intended, was the final straw for Velvet. With a squeal, she stood on her back legs. Tom saw the terror in Patience's eyes for a split second before he suddenly found her arms tightly about his neck. Obligingly, he instinctively wrapped his right arm about her waist, hoisting with wiry strength so that she was free of the saddle. 
He was overbalanced in that direction from trying valiantly to grab the reins, however, and found himself tipping out of the saddle. He managed to kick his feet free of the stirrups, so he wouldn't become entangled as well, and then both he and Patience were tumbling bodily to the ground. This was simply too much for the horses, who snorted and stamped about. Without conscious thought, Tom tucked Patience beneath him, one hand to the back of her neck, pressing her head against his shoulder. All around them, hooves struck the ground as the horses struggled and panicked in the mud. Brutus, clearly fed up with Velvet's shenanigans, pinned his ears back and delivered a mighty nip of his teeth to her rump. This was all the encouragement she needed to find drier ground, with Brutus following along behind, head low and face grumpy. Tom's breathing was harsh and jagged, drowning out all other sounds for a moment. He continued to press patience against him, trying to shield her as best he could until the sound of hooves faded away. When at last he lifted his head to look about, he found Lady Patience staring up at him with eyes wide and wet. Her face was pale beneath the veil that hung from her riding hat. His own hat had come off at some point in the fracas, so his hair fell across his forehead, into his eyes. He did not speak, merely continued to breathe his deep, ragged breaths. Gingerly he reached up and lifted the veil, framing Patience's exposed face with his hands. With the greatest possible tenderness, he moved her head ever so slightly, peering into her eyes. To his great relief, they were clear, the pupils sharp and small. Relieved, he exhaled in a whoosh. Once this imminent worry was dispelled, he became aware of everything else. He found that Lady Patience was still pinned beneath him, her body soft and yielding. She, too, was breathing heavily, her delicate rose-petal mouth parted slightly. Tom found the sight entrancing the lips practically begging to be kissed. She stared up at him with an expression he had never seen on her face before, one of such soft surrender that it made Tom's heart ache a little. Cautiously, experimentally, he moved one of his hands down to her chin, ostensibly checking for damage, but really just wanting an excuse to touch her perfect porcelain face. Her cravat had come loose a little in the chaos, exposing the very top of her throat. Boldly, he slid his thumb down, touching the side of her neck near her ear. She swallowed hard, and he could feel the movement of her throat. With the long grass all about them, it was as if they had fallen into a world entirely their own. There were no other sounds except for the two of them breathing, accompanied by the breeze through the grass and an occasional lark song. Tom didn't want to move. He wished the moment would never end. Patience shifted slightly and freed her arm. Her hand hovered for a moment near his head, and Tom thought that she might actually reach up and brush his hair backward. Her eyes flicked over his face one last time, and then suddenly her mouth was closed and thinning into a line of annoyance. With her free hand, she pushed backward on him. Leave off, she huffed, a little winded still from the fall. I can scarcely breathe. As you wish, my lady. Tom ground out, and obligingly set about getting up. This was easier said than done, as they had both sunk considerably into the mud. With some effort and a small amount of swearing under his breath, Tom at last managed to right himself. He climbed to his feet, and legs spread wide and knees bent, he stooped to offer Patience a hand up. She had meanwhile been struggling to rise, propping herself up on her hands with great reluctance. The mud was slippery, and she also had a long skirt and red ingote to contend with. When Tom's hands came into view, offering to help, she eyed him for a moment before acquiescing. She placed her mud-covered gloved hands in his, and he set about heaving her upward. With a profound squelching sound, Patience came free of the bog. She made a face at the sound and pushed her riding hat, which had fallen forward back into place as best she could. Well. That was only moderately revolting, she said with a curled lip. Tom wasn't sure if she meant the mud, the sound of her pulling free of said mud, or his being atop her. He didn't have the heart to ask either. Patience, meanwhile, was twisting about trying to gather up the train of her skirt. Oh, this is just terrible, she said, throwing the train over her arm. 
Tom could see that she was indeed covered from mud top to toe where she had landed. Poor Mary, she murmured. Poor Mary, he repeated, not understanding. My maid, Patience said distractedly, trying to right her clothing without falling over again. What? How does... Why poor Mary? Tom demanded, stepping closer in case Patience tumbled over again. He almost caught an elbow to the stomach for his trouble as her arms windmilled about, trying to stay balanced. Just look at me, Patience cried, indicating herself with her free arm. It will take her hours, maybe even days, to brush out all of this mud. You just took a fall from a horse, some distance from home, and your concern is for the maid who will have to clean your riding habit, Tom said slowly, incredulous. Patience looked up sharply at his tone. Why shouldn't it be? She may not warrant much of your regard, but she is still a person. She still has feelings and, and disappointments. She took a hesitating step toward more solid ground, her boots slipping and slopping in the mud. We aren't grand men. Our clothing is all that we are allowed. You choose to make it your whole world when the whole world is open to you. Let me help you, Tom began, not having any other reply. No, you have helped quite enough. Thank you for... for your brave actions. Patience's face softened a little as she said that last bit. Her eyes flicked to his for a moment and he could see her swallow again. With tremendous effort, she managed to get free of the mud. She stood with one hand on her hip, the other shielding her eyes. Now where did the horses get to? Tom, himself sliding about as he cleared the mud in great leaping strides, came to stand beside her. You should get somewhere warm and dry before you take a chill, Tom said. You start back to the house if you think are able. I'll see if I can't locate the horses. Patience, refusing to look at him again, nodded. With a somewhat laboured but determined step, she made her way back in the direction of the big house. Tom watched her go for several minutes, hoping that she would turn back to look at him. When she did not, he sighed a little and began the business of locating the silly creatures that had dumped them in the mud to begin with. Oh, well, that is just delightful, that is, he grumbled as his left foot squished horribly in his boot with every step. No doubt some mud had seeped in. It was then that he took stock of his own person. Though he was not as sodden as Lady Patience at first glance, he still had mud up to his elbows, and the state of his breeches did not bear repeating. His shirt felt soaked with sweat, both from the stress and the exertion. He had spoken truthfully when he had warned Patience about the dangers of catching a chill. The sun may have been shining brightly, but there was a cool breeze that persisted. Wanted to see the grounds, she did, Tom muttered, peeling his gloves off with a grunt. Thought the outdoors so charming and pastoral. Ha! What I wouldn't give for a cobblestone street right now. But even as he said the words, he knew they were a lie. The fact of the matter was that he had been enjoying himself, and immensely so. He dared not to linger too long on the deep-rooted fear he had felt upon realising that patience was in danger nor did he feel it prudent to contemplate the simple pleasure that holding her close had been. Chapter 16 Patience was hoping in vain that her return to the house would go unnoticed. As such, she had entered by way of the servant's entrance, summoning Mary to come along with her. The maid, poor girl, had looked like her eyes were going to pop out of her head when she saw the state of Patience. Patience, feeling terrible for the mess she was tracking everywhere, surrendered her red ingote and boots while just inside the door without protest. The household were all rather fond of Patience, having a soft spot for this gentle lady. None of them grumbled then about the work of preparing a bath for her, even though it meant hauling buckets of boiling water up several flights of stairs. Patience was grateful, and promised herself to use some of her pin money to tip them generously. Of course, Annabella noticed this commotion, as even though the servants were using the back stairs and their own corridors to deliver the hot water, it was still causing something of a stir. Patience had just begun trudging wearily up the stairs when Annabella spotted her. Instantly, her sister flew to her side, petting and fussing. 
Patience, darling. What has happened? Are you all right? Annabella cried, taking her arm and trying to inspect her for damage. I'm fine, Patience replied tiredly. Please don't fuss. Nothing broken, only a sore backside and ears full of mud. Where is Lord Tom? Annabella demanded, looking behind Patience as if he were hiding somewhere out of sight. Seeing to the horses, Patience answered, resuming her trudging march up to her private quarters. I am having a bath. Your poor red ingote is a little worse for wear, I'm afraid. Never mind that, Annabella said, waving away her concern. Let's just get you warm and dry. She looked about and spotted a footman walking through the foyer. William, tell one of the scullery maids to build up the fire before the bath for Lady Patience. Very good, Your Grace, William replied, bowing and hurrying off to do as he was told. Patience took a deep breath and continued walking. I'm going up, she announced unnecessarily. Let me help you. With a stamp of one foot, Patience stopped, nearly at the top of the stairs. I don't need your help, she announced, her tone a bit more acidic than she had intended. I don't need everyone fretting and passing me about like I am a porcelain doll. I am a person and fully capable on my own. Patience, Annabella cried, but Patience ignored her. She regretted her words the moment she said them. She was not mad at Annabella, not really. She was mad that she was so woefully ill-prepared for the world, that she did not understand these strange new feelings within her. She had read plenty of romances, but they were abstract and foreign to her. It was the same as reading about the history of Greece, or the breeding habits of giraffes or about how horseshoes are made. All well and good to know, but distant and without any bearing on her life. Her whole life she had known, expected even that her mother would tell her who to marry, and that would be the end of things. Feeling, one way or the other, had never entered into the equation. This was new and alien. Why did she feel like crying? Why did she feel as if she could dash about the room despite how bone-tired she was? Angrily, she began unwrapping the long linen cravat from about her neck, feeling as if it was strangling her. She told herself it was because her fingers were so cold that she struggled with the buttons of the long vest. Surely it was the shock of it all that caused her hands to tremble. As if fighting off an unwanted embrace, she flailed her way out of the vest, flinging it down on the floor without a second thought. Still incensed, she moved through the small hall that connected her dressing room to the bathing room. She paused, then retraced her steps, stopping before the large mirror in the dressing room. She stared at herself, as if daring her reflection to look differently than it did. What she saw was unfamiliar. A woman with wide blue eyes, a petite mouth and a long neck, these things were all the same. But there was something new and warm behind the eyes embers that refused to be put out. In the light linen shirt, her heaving breaths were easily manifest. She chalked that, and her pinkened cheeks, up to the hike back to the house and trudge up the stairs. Perhaps strangest of all, however, was a new hardness to the set of her jaw. Her expression was hard, but soft somehow at the same time, as if she had given in to something that she did not know what it was. Tentatively, she reached up with one hand and touched her lips. She couldn't help but wonder what it would have been like to be kissed in that moment. She had thought that Tom really was going to lean down and kiss her as they lay together in the mud. She was supposed to be outraged by such a prospect, but she was equally outraged by the fact that he hadn't. Infuriating man, she thought. But there was a kind of affection to these words. Automatically, her eyes to slip closed, she allowed herself to replay the moment in her head. In reality, the whole episode couldn't have taken more than a few minutes. In her mind, however, the scene stretched, slowing into a dreamlike quality. She was completely and totally lost in her reverie, all sense of time and place gone. She had never been so close to a man before, and certainly never expected to find herself in such a... such a delicate situation. She would surely be ruined if anyone knew, and yet. Your bath is ready, my lady. 
Mary's voice cut into Patience's imaginings like a scythe through ripe wheat. Startled, Patience jumped a little and worked to compose herself in more ways than one by the time Mary poked her head into the dressing room. Steadfastly pretending that nothing was the matter, Patience allowed Mary to help her finish undressing, occasionally murmuring an apology for the state of her stockings or the heavy riding skirt. By the time Patience sank into the steaming bath, she felt reasonably composed. She inhaled deeply, the smell of orange blossoms and jasmine rising from the water. Allowing herself to sink farther in, her chin nearly in the water, she simply drifted, letting her mind wander as Mary puttered about, preparing a basin to wash Patience's hair. I'm not sure that we'll be able to get it dry in time to dress it well for dinner, Mary warned. Seems such a shame to lose such a pretty curl. Nothing for it, Patience sighed. I imagine it's rather thick with mud, and I don't imagine I could pass that off as a new trend late of London. Of course, this instantly made her think of Lord Tom. What must he have thought of the state of me? She wondered. Perhaps I am kidding myself, and he was only staring because I had a great glob of mud on my cheek. Don't worry, my lady, Mary said. We'll have you tidied and looking lovely as ever in no time. Patience sighed and tilted her head back, shivering a little when Mary poured a pitcher of water onto her scalp. She used a wooden pestle to bash about some soapwort, making it suds lightly and releasing its light floral scent. This she worked into Patience's hair, fingers working into her scalp. Patience closed her eyes, her body slowly relaxing in the warm water. I expect it was all a little terrifying for you, Mary said conversationally. Patience's eyes opened. It all happened so fast I didn't really have time to be scared, she admitted. I expect I will fall apart tonight before bed. That's always the way of it, Mary clucked. My brother's a sailor, and he says that he's never scared during battle, but at night he gets to trembling and the fear takes him. Poor fellow, Patience murmured her eyes closing again. Still, lucky thing his lordship was with you, Mary said, setting aside the bowl of soapwort and refilling the pitcher from a bucket of warm water. I suppose so, Patience agreed, only a little reluctantly. Her eyes flew open as an idea struck her. Mary, do the servants. Does anyone speak of Lord Tom? Downstairs, I mean. Patience could feel and hear Mary slowing, the sudden tension almost palpable. There's always talk when a handsome stranger is in the house, my lady, she answered carefully. Naturally, Patience agreed, hoping to put the maid at ease. I was just wondering, he is so much about London, and then suddenly he was here. Perhaps he wished for a change in scenery, Mary offered neutrally. Does that seem likely for a dandy like Lord Tom? Patience asked. I am not looking for gossip, I just, I just want to be sure that he's not in any trouble. This seemed to relax Mary. Well, we've not heard anything concrete on that score. All we know is, as his grace said, Lord Tom's in his father's bad books. That's hardly surprising, Patience murmured. There were a few minutes of silence as Mary continued to rinse Patience's hair, pouring pitcher after pitcher of water through it. At last, she took up a drying cloth and began to wring the water from Patience's hanging hair. Her hands slowed, and she shifted about so that she was kneeling next to the bathtub, looking directly at Patience. If someone were interested in finding out more regarding Lord Tom, a servant could make much more discreet inquiries than, say, a young lady could, Mary said pointedly. Patience merely stared at Mary for a moment, unsure of how to respond. There was only the sound of her hair dripping onto the tiled floor. I imagine you're right, Patience agreed slowly. Still, it seems it would be difficult for a servant in a country estate to find news from London. Maybe so, my lady, Mary agreed. But news always has a way of getting about, doesn't it? With forced casualness, Patience nodded her agreement. If a trusted maid were to hear of something of interest, I'm sure it would be prudent for her to tell a lady of the house. Just so, Mary agreed, then scrambled up to ready the drying cloths and lay out a thick, quilted dressing gown. 
Patients listened distractedly as Mary moved about, calling for a scullery to come and build up the fire more in Patience's room. Patience was well aware that everyone of the ton relied on their servants for gossip, tipping butlers hither and thither for tittle-tattle. Her own mother, the Duchess of Carnegie, relied on a veritable army of maids and footmen to keep information flowing to her. It was a strange feeling for Patience, however, a kind of Machiavellian plotting that she was unused to. It gave her a shivery kind of thrill, thinking of how worldly she was becoming. Besides, it's not as if I want to know for any untoward reasons. She told herself as she rose up from the bath. Mary lent her a hand to balance herself with and began wrapping her in drying cloths. I simply want to ensure that my sister is not in any danger from slanderous gossip or the antics of a rake. After all, she has looked after me so much. It is time I returned the favour. This is what Patience told herself as she was bundled into the thick dressing gown and seated directly before the fire. It most certainly, very definitely, unquestionably, was not because when Lord Tom had looked directly into her eyes in that muddy field that Patience had felt something so strong and electric that it couldn't be named. Chapter 17 Tom knew that as a gentleman he really should not begrudge a lady's comfort. It was only proper, after all, that Patience should be seen to first, especially given the nature of her afternoon. This was not much of a comfort, however, when confronted with the reality that a much longed-for bath would have to wait, likely until tomorrow. He would have to make do with basins of lukewarm water and a cloth. This was not ideal for a number of reasons, least of which that there was a grand ducal dinner of some stripe tonight, and everyone was expected to be in the full fig. There was a knotted muscle forming just below his shoulder blade, too, and he had hoped a hot soak might ease it. He was in something of a surly mood consequently, staring with naked envy as a kitchen maid carried up the last bucket of steaming water to the bathing room. With a resigned sigh, he retired to his own chambers, where the footman that had been looking after him awaited, clearly having been warned by the other servants. The fellow deemed silence to be prudent, which Tom appreciated. They moved in a kind of dance, the footman unwinding Tom's cravat, helping him to shrug out of the impeccably tailored jacket. It took some work for them to get Tom's boot off, for the mud within kept it glued to his foot. He was reduced to sitting on a stool, gripping it with both hands, while the footman yanked. When at last his foot popped free, Tom was further dismayed to see that his stockings, fine silk and wool woven together and clocked, were thoroughly stained and caked with mud. Tom just sighed again. My lord, if I may, the footman began, looking thoughtful. There's a washerwoman in the village, known for her genius at whitening lace. She might be able to do something with these. Tom stared dully for a moment. Ordinarily, he would simply have tossed the blighted things out, but he could ill afford to do that just now. The footman seemed aware of this. Of course he is, they know everything, don't they? Tom thought bitterly and was trying to delicately suggest a more cost-effective solution. Tom just nodded his assent, peeling them off and laying the offending stockings aside. It was simply too depressing for one of such impeccable taste as Tom, reduced to wearing my stockings right through like some poor country squire, he thought, which only deepened his dismay at the whole affair. With a grim set to his jaw and a furrow in his forehead, Tom stood and with sharp, angry motions began trying to scrub the mud from his skin. There was a particularly stubborn clump on the side of his jaw that refused to budge easily, and Tom swiped at it with a grunt. The footman, wisely, chose to stay in the background of things, deftly collecting Tom's soiled clothing and laying out clean things. Occasionally he appeared to provide another pitcher of moderately warm water to the basin. Tom was tired having chased the horses over half of Christendom, it felt like. It was only thanks to the timely arrival of Mr Fitzgerald that Tom was able to catch the mare at all, the dumb beast in still in a lather. Tom half suspected that Mr Fitzgerald had seen more than Tom, or Patience for that matter, would have liked, given the knowing look that he gave Tom when inquiring if he needed any assistance. 
His farm did abut the estate, after all, and he arrived on the scene in short order. Just had to see the estate, didn't she? Tom muttered to himself. The absolute last thing he needed getting back to his father was that he was in another fix with a young lady. Lowering his arm, Tom attacked some mud that was speckled about his wrist with more vigour than may have been strictly necessary. It wasn't just that Patience had wanted to go for a ride. That wasn't really any of his concern. It was the fact that he had said yes, that he had simply gone with her. What's more, she had the pure audacity to make it an enjoyable outing. She was observant, that much he knew, but he did not expect her to be so, so insightful. Her ready acceptance of his challenge had both thrilled and amused him. Tom had thought her a shrinking violet of some kind, with no real spark or spine. After all, she was the cloistered daughter of a dowager notorious for her intransigence. There was something fiery with impatience, Tom suspected, something that had been tamped down and smothered over the years. It wouldn't take much for her to flare to life. Indeed, over the past weeks, she had slowly begun to unfurl, emerging like a spring bloom from the soil. That was the crux of the problem. Despite the turn the morning had taken, Tom found that he had enjoyed himself. What's more, he had felt more, physically, and in his deepest heart, laying in a mud puddle than he had in all his years gallivanting about London. She had felt exactly right, and looking down at her doll-like face, Tom thought that he was in very great danger of intense feeling. It was an enticing notion particularly as he had never allowed himself to succumb to something like that before. When he had heard her cry of distress and seen that she was in very real great danger, he had acted without thought. It had been the most natural thing in the world for him to throw himself into harm's way to keep her safe. It was pure instinct and feeling that had galvanised him, hooves striking the ground all about them, either of them likely to be trampled. His only care had been her safety to keep her shielded beneath himself. It was only after that he allowed himself to consider her indigo-coloured eyes, her little rose-petal mouth. Bah, he muttered, realising that he had been standing stock still before the wash basin and mirror for several minutes now. He checked his reflection once more for any stray bits of mud and tossed the cleaning cloth down on the edge of the basin. The familiar motions of getting dressed again were soothing. The feeling of a clean, crisp shirt never failed to improve Tom's mood. He couldn't help but sigh again a little as he stared at the cravat. He missed his valet and the elegant knots and waterfalls of folds he created with the neckcloth. Still, Tom made do. He was capable of making a clean, neat knot and was willing to concede that perhaps country drawing rooms allowed for simpler tastes. His mood was, therefore, not entirely as black as it had been a few minutes before. There was some time before tea would be served, and then he would need to dress for dinner. He was at loose ends until a notion struck him, and he decided to head to the library. He had never been much of a reader, but there was scant else to do so deep in the country. It was absolutely, most definitely, positively not because it increased his odds of running into patients. He was certainly not hedging his bets in terms of getting to spend more time with her. As it turned out, however, he did not even have to wait so long as it took to reach the library. The moment he opened his door and stepped into the hall, he instantly beheld Patience standing several feet from his door. She had clearly been pacing, and her hands were in nervous knots. Lady Patience, he asked, a little perplexed, what brings you to this neighbourhood? He gestured to the hall they were standing in, which was reserved for single male guests. She hesitated and stepped a little closer. Her hair was still visibly damp, plaited about the crown and twisted into a bun at the top of her head. There were no fashionable curls about her face, leaving her looking fresh and bare. Her dress was a sensible day dress of white cotton, patterned with blue and green flowers. She looked fresh, as if she were a bud still covered with dew. I just, she began, then bit her lip, white teeth flashing out against her pink lower lip. Tom raised an eyebrow, fully expecting to receive an admonition about keeping the events of the afternoon private, or a rebuke for his familiar position during said ordeal. 
To his great surprise, Patience stepped a little closer and lowered her voice, speaking in low but sincere tones. I wish to thank you, she said, her expression heartfelt. You acted with great selflessness and bravery and... Well, you saved me, she concluded simply. Tom rocked back on his heels slightly, taken completely aback both by her words and her unassuming air. She flashed him a quick, timid smile, curtsied, and turned to leave before Tom realised that he should say something in return. Happy to be of service, he called after her. Inwardly, he slapped his palm to his forehead. It was such a non-committal, expected phrase that did absolutely no justice to the honesty with which Patience had spoken. Quickly, he took a step after her, reaching out to touch her elbow. It really was nothing, he said, his own voice low and gentle. I'm just glad that you are all right. Patience, half turned back to him, smiled again, this time more fully, the expression reaching her eyes. Tom returned the smile and stepped back, allowing her to be on her way. He watched her go, realising that he didn't really begrudge her that bath after all, particularly when it meant that she trailed a pleasingly floral scent wherever she went. Chapter 18 With all of the excitement of the day, Patience had completely forgotten that there was to be a grand dinner that very evening. This was not going to be a familiar, friendly evening, as the previous dinners thus far during her stay had been. This was one of the Duke's official dinners, given for other high-ranking members of the court and cabinet, the unofficial corridors of government power. Even worse, Patience had not been able to find a moment to speak to Annabella ever since she had snapped at her upon coming in. She felt terrible about that, as Annabella was simply being a concerned big sister. It had simply all been too much to deal with at once, and she knew that she would not have been able to conceal her feelings or the events of the afternoon from Annabella. This dinner was weighing heavily on Annabella as well, judging by the tense look on her face whenever Patience spotted her. She was busy directing the servants and ensuring that the house was up to the standards expected of a duchess. Patience felt another pang of guilt. Annabella had been thrust into the world of the aristocracy with no training. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button this way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. She was the daughter of a duke, true enough, but she had not spent the years before her marriage preparing her for this role. She had been on a steep learning curve from the moment she had accepted the Duke's suit. Patience, on the other hand, had been given nothing but education on how to be a proper wife to a nobleman. If she had not been so preoccupied with her own intrigues and struggles, she might have been of some help. She therefore resolved to simply stay out of the way as much as possible and resolved to make it up to Annabella later. To this end, she hid in her rooms perched on the padded window seat that overlooked the gardens. The outdoor staff were rushing to and fro, bringing in blooms and produce from the hothouse by the armful. Patients watched them, their movements quick and choreographed, almost like a dance of their own. She envied them in a way, knowing their place and their work, never questioning what they were supposed to be doing. When at last the hour struck that she was to begin dressing for the dinner, Patience sighed and stood reluctantly. She would be put into the white worn by all ladies on formal occasions. It made her smile, a little sadly, to see that it was a gown that Annabella had made for her debut season, an ivory duchesse satin with little puffed sleeves and a gathered neckline that folded elegantly over the bust. The waist was accented by a ribbon in deep blue, worked in silk and tiny pearls in a motif of little spring flowers. Patience ducked her head so that the maid could fasten a choker of pearl strands about her neck and slid her arms into the silk gloves that went all the way up her arms. Am I ready? Patience asked, looking at herself in the mirror. I suppose you know that better than anyone, milady, Mary said. But you do look a picture. Patience smiled once at her, quickly, trying to mask the anxiety and nerves that were creeping up. Things had been going well for patients thus far, but this was different. These were the toniest of the ton coming to dine, 
some of them to stay the night, and it would not do for Patience to embarrass herself. Worse, she could be embarrassing her sister if she fell on her face or slurped her soup or said the wrong thing. When she arrived downstairs, the house was lit with what seemed like a thousand candles. The chandeliers and sconces were all polished to a high shine, reflecting light everywhere. It was quite a scene, with fresh flowers and ferns on every empty surface. It had the appearance of a carefully ordered doll's house, and Patience was terrified of touching anything lest it all come crumbling down. Quietly, as unobtrusively as possible, she found a corner in the salon. It was away from the pianoforte, and not near enough any of the chairs that she might be asked to play or invited to join a conversation. The first of the guests began to filter in, men in black jackets, some of them with sashes and badges of office marking their positions. The women were grandly arrayed, enough pearls and jewels and silks to satisfy a sultan. Patience swallowed and pointedly turned from the crowd, regarding a painting with pretend seriousness. She was quite pleased with herself for developing this strategy, as it meant that by dint of the room's layout, everyone simply passed on by her. It was rather alarming then, when a decidedly masculine person sidled up to her, also looking up at the painting. Glancing sideways, Patience let out a held breath. Oh, it's only you, she murmured, visibly relaxing when she saw that it was in fact Lord Tom. He turned to her with raised eyebrows and a mock-outraged expression. Only you, she says. Well, that's a fine how-do-you-do of an evening, he drawled. Seeing the mischievous twinkle in his eye, Patience fought hard not to smile, which made Tom grin all the more. Well, you are a lot less terrifying than some of the other guests. Tom turned slightly, scanning the room. I'm inclined to agree with you. Whatever you do, do not get stuck talking to the Viscount Rothsbury, breath like rotten anchovies. Tom, Patience hissed, playfully prodding him with her elbow. That's a terrible thing to say. Yes, but even more terrible for me not to warn you, no. Despite her high nerves, Patience couldn't help but snorting out a small laugh. Very well, you are excused. What are you doing over here anyway? Tom asked glancing up at the painting again. Taken a sudden interest in art, have you? Yes, I mean, well, no, not exactly. I've always liked art, but not seen much of it. I've never been to any galleries, you see, Patience said, ducking her head slightly in embarrassment. Well, thank goodness for that, Tom replied, casting a dubious eye over the paintings on the walls. What do you mean? only that it means you haven't had your natural taste spoiled by a lot of stuffy old drawing masters, Tom said, tilting his head in the direction of another portrait. That one over there's by an old master, but it may just be the ugliest thing I have ever seen. Yet everyone gushes over it, I can't countenance it. Patience subtly turned and looked at the picture Tom was speaking of. It was done in the strange flat style of the early Renaissance, and it was indeed a questionable portrait of a rather severe-looking lady. Patience raised one gloved hand to her mouth, doing her best to stifle another laugh. This one, however, Tom said, gesturing to the painting just before them. This one's new. It's a Gainsborough. How did you know it was good? Patience turned to look at the painting again. I suppose it's just... It has a dreamy nature to it, yes? It's a very real landscape. It could be just right outside, really. But it's so soft and dreamlike. Anything could happen there. Monsters could jump out of the bushes. An enchanted castle could be over the rise. Or maybe just some farmers will go to work. It has possibility, she said decidedly. She realised then that was very likely the longest she had ever spoken to Tom before. And she winced a little. Instinctively, she shrank away, looking down at the rug, fully prepared for him to laugh at her. He kept her in suspense, not speaking for several beats. Her embarrassment threatened to completely overtake her when he at last turned his face fully toward her. He looked at her with such an expression of genuine and abiding delight that Patience at first thought she must be seeing things. I've hit my head, she thought. I fell on a rock when the horse threw me.
and now I am hallucinating. But no, Tom was actually looking down at her, not with his usual mocking smirk, but with a look of real enjoyment. How remarkable, he said. You picked the one you could put your own story into. I am fond of stories, Patience reminded him softly. Lady Patience, have you missed your calling as an authoress? Would you like to thrill and tantalise the ton with your stories of dashing knights and haunted manners? Tom was clearly teasing again, but this time there was no vinegar in his manner. It was an invitation to play, not a swipe with sharp claws. Honestly, I think the only person that would be suitably frightened by anything I wrote would be my mother, and that would be down to me being a writer at all, Patience replied easily. Tom chuckled again, low and hearty. Well, so much for a future career for you then. By the by, what are you doing hiding in the corner for? Patience winced again, and Tom shifted almost unperceptively closer. It's all of them, Patience said in a small voice, gesturing faintly with one hand. They're all too much all at once. Tom tilted his head, putting one hand on his hip and cocking his leg, tapping his chin with one finger on his other hand. It was a perfect caricature of a swell in a fashionable drawing room. When he spoke, his voice was low enough to not be overheard, but in the same plummy tones one might expect from just such a person. Now see, that is something I can agree on. As a meal, this lot would give anyone indigestion, far too rich and soaked in some questionable sauce, he said, lifting his nose. I would not recommend trying to take it all in at once. Patience bit her lip again, trying not to laugh aloud. What would you recommend, then? Cutting it into small portions and only trying a small nibble of each, Tom said decidedly. But what if I find a flavour, I fancy? Might I spend the whole evening simply in that person's company? Patience asked. The moment the words were out of her mouth, she wished that she could snatch them out of the air and stuff them back in. At such a rich and varied gathering such as this, Tom demanded, breezing right over any possible insinuation in her question. Perish the thought. With that, he whipped out an absurdly fine handkerchief from his jacket sleeve, bordered on all sides by lace. Effecting distress, he held it to his nose delicately, as if recovering from a great shock or lesser company. Patients half suspected that he kept the handkerchief up his sleeves specifically for these reasons. The sight of him putting on such a performance was enough to set Patience to laughing. This caused Annabella, who was still receiving guests, to turn a questioning look to Patience. Still laughing, Patience quickly turned back to the wall, hoping to avoid any uncomfortable questions. All right, she said sotto voice to Tom. As you are the expert here, what dish would everyone be then? Hmm, Tom hummed, thoughtfully tapping his chin again. His dark eyes roved over the crowd. Sir Barton just there, most definitely some sort of roasted mutton. Tough but hearty. Age has added to the flavour. Patience turned only enough to get a glimpse of a stout fellow who still sported a salt and pepper wig in defiance of the current fashion for natural hair. And what about her? Patience asked, lifting her chin in the direction of a lady swathed in yards and yards of yellow satin. Oh, good heavens, he murmured, some sort of custard, piled high and in danger of collapsing. And that one over there by the piano, the fellow with the sideburns, Patience asked, gesturing again. Red coat. Ah, an officer, I do believe. Yes, that is the esteemed Colonel Evans. He's less a dish and more of a knife and more of a decoration. See how he fusses over the braiding on his jacket. He's a highly polished piece of silver, that one, Tom said decidedly. Hmm, I suppose you would be the expert on being a decorative piece, Patience said, before she could stop herself. Tom turned to her, his eyes wide, a shocked smile on his face. How very dare you say something so cutting, he said. A pause and then, and also so accurate. That last phrase had Patience collapsing into a fit of giggles again, and Tom could not resist joining this time. Before Patience knew it, dinner was being announced, 
and Tom was being summoned by Annabella to escort a lady into dinner. Duty calls, he sighed. Oh, good. It seems I'm being paired with the custard. Wait, Patience said, reaching out and touching Tom's sleeve to pause him. She bit her lip again and gathered her courage up. What would I be? Late for dinner, if you don't get a move on, Tom said flippantly. Patience did not say anything but stepped back, looking down. Suddenly she could feel Tom's presence looming over her. She was not a short woman, but he was tall, she only coming up to his shoulder. She was caught completely between him and the wall, her back pressing up against it automatically. No part of him touched her, but Patience's breath caught as if he had swept her into an embrace. She stared up at him, a scant couple of inches between them. Something light and floral, Tom said, staring directly into her wide eyes. Delicate and full of spring. Violet creme tars, perhaps, with a savoury butter shell. He paused and smiled down at her with one side of his mouth. Something surprising in there, though. Perhaps a twist of lemon that you never see coming. And with that, he pulled away, leaving Patience alone by the wall. Automatically, she pressed one hand to her stomach, her face flushed. She reached into her pocket automatically for a fan but could not find one. She was so distracted that she did not notice a gentleman with blonde hair pulled into a queue waiting to escort her into dinner. She did not even have time to consider her anxiety at taking his arm, so distracted was she. The only real thing she considered as she entered the dining room was that she could feel Lord Tom's eyes on her as she walked past. She was determined to maintain her poise, eyes ahead as was expected of her. Tom continued to stare at her. She was sure of it, heedless that the lady beside him in yellow was chattering away. As she and her companion slowly made their way to their seats, their names printed on gilded place cards, Patience flicked a glance to Tom as she passed. His dark eyes glinted between two tall candles in a silver candelabra and the expression in them set Patience's cheeks on fire again. She had never seen such a look in a man's eyes before, and it confounded and intrigued her all at once. It was a very good thing that a footman had come forward to pull her chair out for her, because she was suddenly feeling a little weak at the knees. She immediately reached for the crystal goblet of water set between the wine glasses, swallowing a hasty mouthful. It was only when she had taken a drink and sat for some moments that she was finally able to name the look in Lord Tom's eye. It was hunger, and Patience suspected that it was not for dinner. Chapter 19 When dinner was concluded, the guests were allowed to disperse for open socialising again. From the salon, Patience could hear a few intrepid souls plonking away on the piano and belting out soldiers' songs and duets in turn. Patience made the wise decision to steer clear of that particular fracas, choosing instead a quiet sitting room. It was mostly ladies gathered in here and conversation was quiet. There were after-dinner cookies and coffee on offer, and most seemed content to simply talk nibble. Dinner had been, well, interesting to say the least. Patience's dining companions had been kind enough with the fellow with long blonde hair to one side and the wife of an officer on the other. The officer's wife had been kind enough asking after Patience's mother as they had come out together in their debut season. The food had, of course, been most excellent, with Patience's favourite being a slow roasted duck with orange slices under the skin. It was a pity that she couldn't remember most of the dinner, however. She had felt Lord Tom's eyes on her from the start, and this feeling did not abate. The floral arrangements on the table were low so that the guests could see each other across the dishes piled with comestibles. Every time that Patience dared to look up, she saw Lord Tom gazing directly at her. It was not just that he was being bold or paying her undue notice, he seemed to be determined to help her make light of the situation. Patience had to be sat reasonably far from her sister and the Duke in deference to the guests and rank. She was surrounded by strangers, some of whom had no reservations about being catty or unkind. Tom seemed to be aware of this, for at times when she met his eye, his gaze flicked to a guest and back again, 
and Patience was reminded of their earlier conversation. It was a simple, kind way to put her mind at ease through humour. Unfortunately, due to nerves and a flare-up of self-consciousness, Patience did not eat much, only nibbling here and there. It was a real pity that Patience could not do the excellent fare justice, but she lived in mortal terror of accidentally selecting the wrong fork or the grape scissors slipping in her hands. Consequently, when she left the table, she was not technically full. While she would have appreciated more to eat, she also did not want to make a spectacle of herself by eating a plateful of the dainties offered with the coffee. So she sat, perched on the edge of a settee, trying very hard not to be noticed lest she be drawn into conversation. She did not even know what she would talk about, as she had nothing to say about the London season, or this person, or that. The prospect of sneaking off to the library was becoming an irresistible notion when Lord Tom appeared in the doorway. Patience immediately felt her stomach do a flip, and she did her level best to pretend not to notice him. This was in vain, however, for her eyes, as if by their own will, slid over to him. Tom saw this. Of course he did and sauntered over to Patience as if he owned the entire room. "'Enjoying yourself, my lady?' he asked, tucking his hands behind his back. "'Yes, thank you,' Patience replied quietly. Tom, leaning over slightly, pitched his voice lower and said, "'Are you quite sure about that? You look like a fox cornered by hounds.' Patience shot him a dour look, but seeing the soft, teasing smile could not resist grinning back a little sheepishly. I am feeling a little trapped, she admitted. What, do you imagine if you hold still that they shan't see you? Tom asked, bending closer. They're not predators. He glanced over to a heavily rouged and powdered matron in the corner, looking like a relic from the last century. Well, that one might be. Lady Grant has had four husbands and outlived them all. An unexpected laugh bubbled out of patience which drew the gaze of the others in the room. Blushing furiously, Patience covered the sound by pretending to cough, holding her gloved hand to her mouth. Tom, all solicitous concern, produced that absurdly lacy handkerchief again and offered it to Patience. This only set her off laughing again, which she affected to be more coughing. Oh dear, Tom said in a voice just loud enough to be overheard. Let's get you some fresh air, my lady. He gently took Patience by the elbow, helping her to stand gallantly. Yes, thank you, Tom, she murmured. The air is rather close in here. Once in the hallway, Patience exhaled through her mouth. Tom, for his part, was grinning down at her like a naughty schoolboy that skipped his lessons. Thank you for that, Patience said. It's like being in the lion's den. Facing the ton is rigorous enough on its own, and not something to be done on an empty stomach, Tom tutted. You couldn't have eaten more than a few bites at dinner. Were you counting? Patience shot back, attempting to arch an eyebrow in the same manner as he would. It was more entertaining than the conversation, Tom said with one of his affable shrugs. Patience laughed again. Fair enough. The truth is that I am rather hungry still, but but it wouldn't do to let the ton see you gorging yourself after dinner, yes, Tom said, nodding thoughtfully. Well, it seems to me that this party has spread out all over the house. If you and I were to wander from room to room, you might have a bite in each without anyone being any the wiser. That's brilliant, Patience said, her face lighting up. It is, isn't it? Tom replied smugly. It will have the added benefit of making people believe you are being more social than you actually are. So they took a turn about the house, with Tom deftly interceding on any attempts for strangers to request introductions to Patience. With Tom's aid, Patience was able to snack her way quite happily through the rooms, breezing in and out of them with no comment. At last they settled in some chairs near the rear of the drawing room, Tom having snagged a small plate for himself with some little vanilla cookies. Patience could scarcely believe that she was going to say it, but she was finding Tom's company completely enjoyable. In truth, she didn't know how she would have managed the party without him. He was far kinder, far more attentive than she had ever seen him. He possessed real feeling too, 
which she would never have credited him with. He made her laugh, he shielded her from the discomfort of strangers, and he saw to her comfort with solicitous attention. Even now, he did his best to entertain her. She would point out a guest, and he would do tell her two things about them, and she had to guess which was true. As they spoke in hushed tones, this required them to sit quite close together, heads nearly touching at some points. This surely caused a few raised eyebrows, but neither Patience nor Tom noticed, or if they did, they did not care. What about him? Patience asked, pointing discreetly to a pale, brooding figure of a man that lurked near the doorway, shoulders hunched. When Tom looked, she took the opportunity to snaffle one of his cookies. Ah, that would be Baron Peregrine Russell. He owns the largest collection of paintings in London, and he also has been known to sleep hanging upside down from the rafters. Tom looked down at his plate, noticed the missing cookie, and whipped his head up to look at Patience. She attempted a beatific smile, which was somewhat hampered by the fact that she had just taken a bite of said cookie. Is something amiss, my lord? she asked when she had swallowed all innocence. You mercenary thing, you, he admonished. That sheltered, wide-eyed ingenue bit was simply an act all along, wasn't it? Patience shrugged. A wave of murmuring went through the crowd, and Patience looked about to see what the disturbance was. Her first instinct was that she had committed a faux pas of some sort, however it seemed that everyone's gaze was drawn to the doorway instead. Standing there, poised just at the threshold of entering, was the most stunningly beautiful woman that Patience had ever seen. Though the current fashion was for ladies of delicate colouring and fair hair, there was no denying the arresting looks of the woman who had just entered. Her hair was thick and dark, piled artfully atop her head. Her eyes too were dark and vaguely almond-shaped. It was impossible not to look at her. She wore the white that all young ladies did, but her gown shaded toward grey, which set off the warm tones in her skin. She was positively glowing under the candlelight. Who is that? Patience breathed. Who is who? Tom asked without looking up, nudging little morsels around his plate. Patience tapped him lightly on the arm, getting his attention. He looked first at Patience, then to the doorway. Patience was not looking directly at him, so she felt rather than saw him tense up. It was a bristly kind of motion, like a cat that is preparing to bat something with its paw. Alarmed, Patience turned to look at Tom's face and she instantly wished she hadn't. He was staring at the new arrival intently, a muscle in his jaw working. The colour was gone from his face. The strange woman's dark eyes flicked to Tom and recognition sparked in her expression. Patience looked back and forth between them, trying to understand what was happening. The new arrival lifted her chin a little, a coy, knowing look on her face that did nothing to settle neither Patience nor Tom. Tom? Patience asked tentatively, instinctually reaching out to, well, she wasn't sure what, but she knew that he was in distress. Whatever is the matter? Nothing, he said brusquely. Have I said... Not everything is about you, he snapped. Abruptly he stood. I don't have all evening to play nursery games. And then he left Patience, sitting there all alone, as he retreated out the other door, moving quickly like there was something nipping at his heels. Patience was left very, very alone, and very, very aware that all eyes had shifted to her. It was her very worst fear come to life, and she shrank under the attention. She kept her eyes trained down at her lap, looking up only once. The very beautiful woman watched her with a curious look even after conversation had resumed flowing around the room. Patience wished the ground would just swallow her up right then and there, and all the while the stranger watched her humiliation. Chapter 20 It was becoming really quite tiresome to be so, well, tired. Patience found herself once again unable to sleep. The night had ended terribly with herself slinking off to her rooms at the first opportunity. Her maid had wisely said nothing but silently helped her to undress. Patience allowed herself to be seated before the low fire, 
the maid gently removing the pins from her hair and brushing it with long, smooth strokes of the brush. The action is soothing, putting patients into a calmer, more meditative state. Downstairs, she could hear the sounds of the party still ongoing. The guests were slow to depart, and patients suspected that there would be a few more staying the night than was originally intended. She attempted reading in her bed, sat up against a bulwark of pillows, but her mind strayed. She gave up entirely when she realised that she had read the same sentence at least three times. Rising from her bed, she instead went to curl herself up on the padded window seat that overlooked the garden. Light poured from the windows beneath her, warm and contrasting with the cool moonlight that shone overhead. Occasionally there was movement on the lawn, couples walking arm in arm. Patience sighed, leaning her head against the cool window. She didn't know what she had expected of the evening, but there was part of her that wished she could have been one of those people on a moonlit stroll. She was loath to admit it, but she had hoped, even at smallest amount, that perhaps she and Tom, that they... It doesn't matter, she thought. You are only making yourself miserable, and I've no patience for that, Patience Carnegie. Sometimes she struggled to remember that she was the daughter of a duke, that she was a woman of standing and deserved a place in the world as much as any other. Naively, perhaps even foolishly, she had thought that Tom's true self, the one hidden under layers of waterfall-knotted cravats and biting humour, was opening up to her. She had even dared to think that perhaps it was her own influence that was rehabilitating his manner. Chuckling to herself without mirth, she shook her head. Silly girl, she admonished herself, as if he would pay you that sort of regard. You are the relation of a relation, one to be tolerated while waiting for more interesting company to appear and that more interesting company had most definitely appeared. Tom had jumped up and away from Patience almost as if she had stuck him with a pin. His cutting remarks were obviously an effort to distance himself from her. He wished it to be clear that there was no attachment between them, clearly. Not that Patience could really blame him. She was not bitter toward this new woman, whoever she was. Patience was far too pragmatic for that and she had also always been very honest about her situation. Patience was pretty enough, but she would never be the kind of arresting beauty that halted conversation when she entered a room. She didn't know how long she had sat there, her head leaned against the window. She may have dozed even, for she was suddenly aware that she was awake. Her candles had burned quite low, nearly snuffed out. The sounds from downstairs had quieted, and there were now the sounds of doors shutting firmly all over the house. Patience stretched her legs out, wincing a little at the tight feeling from keeping her knees pulled up for as long as she had. Well, I don't imagine I'll be getting to sleep any time soon, she said to her empty room. Rising, she took up a silver candlestick, and using one of the nearly spent candles, lit the taper within. She hesitated on the way to her door, realising that she was in her night rail, and the house was full of guests. It would not do for one of them to catch her skulking about the house in such a state of undress. Instead, she went to her dressing room and after some rifling through cabinets, found a morning dress. She donned it quickly, belting it quickly over her cotton nightgown. Pausing before her dressing table, she twisted her long, loose braid up into a coil at the back of her head and slid a few pins into it. Satisfied that she would not bring further scandal to herself, she quietly left her room, shutting door lightly behind herself. The house was quiet, but Patience still paused, listening hard. Somewhere, in a distant wing of the house, there was giggling and hurried feet, followed by a slamming door, and then all was quiet again. On her toes, Patience made her way silently down the hall. She hesitated again when she reached the top of the stairs, but the only sound she heard were the creaking of the house itself. Cautiously, she made her way down, her toes finding each stair tentatively. Her candle cast only a small sphere of light, and she really did not want to end her night by tumbling down the stairs. Once on the ground floor, she was on surer footing. She had spent a lot of time sneaking about her own home at night, and she was a dab hand at it now. 
With the lightest of steps, she tripped lightly across the floor to the stairs to the kitchens. She paused briefly at the top, allowing her eyes to adjust to the dark stairway, then plunged ahead. It was without any real forethought or planning that Patience had started out, and now this was becoming a liability. Now she was reduced to standing in the midst of the darkened servants' area, unsure of how to proceed. The floors down here were cold stone slabs, which chilled her feet through her stockings and made her shudder a little. She poked her head into various doorways until, at last, she saw the kitchen. And this is when her entire plan fell apart. She'd had the notion of some warm milk to settle her nerves and help her sleep, but she hadn't wished to ring for it, waking a poor servant just for her sake. They would scarcely be getting an hour of sleep as it was, what with the guests retiring so late and them needing to rise so early to prepare breakfast. So there was patience, standing in the doorway to the kitchen, completely perplexed as to the origin of warm milk and with no idea how to obtain some. It was a small thing, really, but it was the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. Completely hidden from everyone in the house, in a very, very absurd situation, Patience began to cry. She hated crying, her face got red and puffy, and her nose did the most unladylike things imaginable. This was a problem for her, particularly as she was a sensitive soul, prone to outbreaks of sentiment on occasion. She felt relatively secure in shedding tears down here, however, as there was absolutely no one to see her. When she was all cried out, she swiped at her eyes with the heels of her hand, her grip on her candle tenuous at best. Her eyes felt gritty and worn, her whole body exhausted and wrung out from the evening's emotional whirlwind. You really are a silly, naive country girl, she thought to herself as she turned around and began the climb back up to the main floor of the house. She had thought that she was becoming so worldly and prepared for society. What was worse, she thought that she, Patience Carnegie, would be the one to tame the rakish Lord Tom. Silly, silly girl, she laughed bitterly to herself. Best to stick with your books, they'll not make you feel a fool. The amber-coloured liquid swirled about the fine crystal glass as Tom poured himself another brandy. It was an exceptionally good bottle, sweet and with a hint of oaky spice. He had a notion that it was the Duke's private stash, as it was kept in a cabinet quite near the desk in the library. Tom had liberated it and had taken up residence in one of the high-backed chairs near the fireplace. The fire had spent itself and was reduced to a few burning embers that did not give off much in the way of heat or light. Tom didn't care. The brandy had warmed him quite pleasantly from head to foot. It also had the added benefit of dulling the panicked sting he had felt earlier in the evening. He had resolved to simply give himself over to enjoying what was before him, forgetting London society and all of its rules and vagaries. The surprising thing was that he was enjoying himself immensely so. He couldn't give a fig about the other guests, but the time he had spent with patience was a revelation. She was clever, far more so than he had ever credited her with being. And funny. He had never expected to find her so amusing, nor to find such delight in her amusement. She had an infectious little laugh, wrinkling her nose up when something was truly funny to her. He found that he wanted to make her laugh again and again. Time spent with her was so effortless, so easy. He did not have to be on his guard, always wondering what he should say or do or how to improve his social standing. He could just be. And then his life in London had come crashing back in on him. He had never expected to see Lady Stanton's daughter, not at a party at a country estate. Ava was not one for country pursuits. He could just see her lovely mouth curling up at the very thought. She represented everything that was his London life and her arrival had brought his past colliding with the present. Though still hazy on the details, Tom was very aware that whatever his transgression had been, it centred on Eva Stanton. It was not that he suddenly found Patience distasteful. It was that he felt cheap and nickel-plated compared to her. He doubted that Patience had ever lied, or cheated, or done anything to be ashamed of. She was good, anyone could see that. 
He had thought, perhaps foolishly, that if he could be good too, then... That lot of good that's done me now, he muttered darkly, and took another generous swig. He had been happy, and that was why he was miserable now. Tom thought he understood happiness, had thought that he was happy gadding about town on his father's purse. What he hadn't known, but clearly did now, was that it was all shallow and not real. His chums, so eager to lark around with him when he was footing the bill, had evaporated when his allowance had dried up. Moreover, they seemed cold and mean-spirited when compared to the people he was with now. This was not even to begin addressing the thing that had driven him from London, whatever that was. Tom grimaced and swallowed that worry along with another mouthful of brandy. If it involved Lady Stanton, or Eva for that matter, it couldn't be anything good. If Patience found out. Why should that matter? Tom demanded to the dark library. It's not as if she... as if I... Why do I care what she thinks? Why do I care so much? That really was too much to contemplate. So he settled on pressing his comparably cool glass to his forehead. He was bent on drinking himself into a pleasant stupor, working his way through the bottle of brandy at a rate the Duke would surely disapprove of. Tom would have hell to pay in the morning, he was sure, but anything was better than dealing with the turmoil within. With this goal in mind, he was preparing to pour himself another drink when the door to the library began to open. Tom could only watch in a moderately drunken fog as it creaked open, first a crack, then more. He was filled with both dread and anticipation, waiting to see who it was that would find him in such a state. Chapter 21 Patience was certain that she'd heard a voice within the library, but all was silent now. She hesitated at the threshold, not able to see much through the sliver of the doorway that she'd opened. She really, really did not want to walk in on any untoward scenes, or for anyone to see her in such a state of casual attire. She had half a mind to abandon her quest to find a book to take to bed. I've already been soundly embarrassed tonight, she reasoned. What further humiliation can there really be in a library? She set her jaw and pushed inward, determined to face whatever awaited. Holding her candle aloft, Patience's eyes swept quickly around the library. It appeared to be empty at first glance, the fire low and sullen. Quickly she darted in, making for a shelf of poetry that she had steadily been working through. She was almost there, her fingers reaching for a book, when she suddenly beheld a pair of highly shined, buckled shoes. Attached to these shoes was a pair of long legs, one crossed over the other, sticking out from one of the chairs before the fire. She froze and realised that Lord Tom was sitting there, in the dark, watching her with warm, liquid eyes. Starting, she squeaked and nearly dropped her candle in shock. Tom, she hissed. Whatever are you doing in here? I might ask you the same, he said slowly, but I think that's pretty obvious. You shouldn't lurk like that, she chided him, taking the book off the shelf and pressing it against herself as if it were a shield. You might make yourself known in the future. He chuckled then, a low and sad sound. Oh yes, I most definitely should make myself known, he murmured. Despite her irritation with him, Patience found herself stepping a little closer, raising her candle to see his face more clearly. He did not look up at her, but kept a glass pressed to his head. Have... Have you been drinking? she asked, her eyes darting automatically to the door, now doubly afraid of being caught. Yes, Tom answered blankly. Well, at least you're honest, she muttered, placing the candlestick on a low table near the chairs. That'll be enough of that. Thank you kindly. The Duke will not thank you for drinking all of his... She paused, pulling the glass from his fingers, which he yielded readily, and sniffed at it. His good brandy, she finished, her nose wrinkling a little. That's the problem, Tom said, looking up at Patience with an expression of such regret that she was taken completely aback. I'm not honest, not at all. Patience sighed, turning to put the glass on the desk. Hopefully the servants would find it in the morning and assume a rowdy guest had left it behind. 
I had not pegged you for being a maudlin drunk, she said, turning back to him. I should very much like to tell you off for your behaviour this evening, but I doubt you'd remember it. I'd remember it, he said so softly that patients almost didn't hear him. I acted very poorly toward you, didn't I? You did, patients confirmed. Good. It's better that you see... See what exactly? Patience demanded. When Tom didn't answer immediately, she sighed, exasperated, and made as if to leave again. Suddenly her wrist was caught in Tom's hand, gently but firmly. I tried to be good, he said, his expression plaintive. I'm not a good person. I am not like the men in your books. Carefully, Patience extracted her wrist from his grip. You don't know what sort of books I read, she said archly, lifting her chin. That provoked another low chuckle. That is fair, Tom agreed. Patience hesitated, trying to decide if it was morally wrong to question a man while he was not entirely sober in the hopes of more honest answers. This also meant that she had to first ask herself if she really wanted to know the answers to whatever she was about to ask him. Gathering her spirit, she said, That lady this evening, the one that arrived late, after dinner, she upset you somehow. Tom didn't answer, his mouth pulling down into a disgruntled expression. At least she wasn't her mother, he grumbled. Then we'd all have been upset. Patience wasn't sure what to say to that, so she changed her tact. Tom, she said, kneeling so that she was more at his eye level, do you really believe yourself to be bad? He barked out a laugh, loud and harsh. Look at me, dear Patience. Do I look like a man who is good? Do I look like the sort of man you should be acquainted with? Biting her lip, Patience rose, not sure if he spoke rhetorically. His words had the feel of a warning about them, as if he meant to save her from some danger that she could not see. She turned, as if she meant to leave, but halted abruptly. Whirling about, she almost extinguished her candle by accident from the suddenness of the motion. I'm not as foolish as you think me, she announced, and you are not as much of a rake as you pretend to be. You did not have to spend the evening with me, and yet you did. I will not pretend to understand you or your life in London, but I do understand that you have been happier and freer these last days. You do not have to be miserable, Tom. Tom watched her with blank eyes as she gave this little homily. Patience was not even sure if he heard her. And if he did, if he would remember what she said in the morning. She swallowed hard, not sure what was left to be said. Her weight shifted to her back foot, ready to turn once again and leave. Another low, almost sinister chuckle stopped her again. You suppose, dear Patience, that we will always have the choice to be happy, Tom said in a low, thick voice. It is a choice. She responded quietly, but with a firmness that belied the core of iron in her heart. You just have to be brave enough to make it. Her words made Tom sink back further into the chair. He said nothing further, and Patience really did make good her escape this time. Once outside of the library, she leaned back against the other side of the door. She didn't realise how tightly she was clutching her book to chest until the ache in her arm registered. Blowing out a sigh, she pushed away from the door and began tiptoeing her way back to her room. Once in bed again, she tried to concentrate on what she had picked from the library. It was impossible, however, as all she could see was Tom's tormented, miserable face and the way that his eyes had warmed when they looked at her. His behaviour was most contradictory, and patients suspected there was something amiss. It was very easy for her mind to begin spinning all sorts of fantastical yarns, and she had to stamp them out like weeds. Whatever the trouble was, one thing was certain. That woman with the beautiful face was clearly at the centre of it. Patience was already wide awake by the time the sky began to lighten, and the scullery maid appeared to build up her fire. She sent for Mary immediately, who appeared looking a little frazzled and dazed at being summoned at such an hour. Patience felt a slight stab of guilt, realising that the poor girl had likely only been abed for a scant hour or so. Mary, 
I have a task for you, something that requires the greatest discretion and cunning, she said, beckoning the maid closer. These words seemed to work their way into the sleepy fog that surrounded the maid. Like all good ladies' maids, she was fond of a good bit of intrigue. What is it, my lady? she asked, drawing closer. Patience hesitated, biting her lip for just an instant. Has there been any talk in the servants' hall? That is, there was a guest that arrived late yesterday, a young lady. Mary tilted her head a little. There were a few guests that arrived after dinner, she said noncommittally. Yes, but this young woman was remarkable. She was dark of hair and finely featured, Patience said, a little impatiently. She wore a pile of blue sapphires about her neck. Oh, yes, Mary said, her eyes lighting up. The footmen were all besotted with her. They said she had a face like a plaster saint. She did, Patience admitted, sighing. Does anyone have her name? Did she stay last night? No, my lady, she stayed only a few moments last night. All the male staff were quite downcast to see her go. I imagine they would be, Patience said dryly. Might you know her name? Mary shook her head. No, my lady, but I can make some inquiries downstairs if you like. Please do, Patience said, greatly encouraged. If it's not too much trouble, she added. I'll just nip down for your morning tea and see what I can find out, Mary said, bobbing a quick curtsy and hurrying out. Patience settled back on her pillows, feeling a little smug about her scheming. She understood now why her mother always paid the servants well and relied so much on her Abigail to keep her informed. No matter how circumspect one must believe themselves, servants always knew everything that went on in a house and a great deal more besides. She was certain that this mysterious lady was the key to Tom's misery. After all, he'd been in fine spirits before she appeared. Of course, it could be so simple as he fancied her and did not want to be seen in the company of another woman, Patience thought, which only made her frown again. It was entirely possible, but Patience suspected that Tom would not have reacted as viscerally as he did if this was the case. He didn't seem the type to be a stranger to romantic intrigue either. This was not the only thing weighing on Patience, however. It was a convenient distraction from something else that nagged at her. She regretted snapping at Annabella last night. She had regretted it the moment the words had left her lips. And she longed to put things at ease between them again. Annabella was a good sister, doing her best to protect and care for Patience. More importantly, the moment that Patience had demanded space and independence, Annabella had complied. This was of extreme value and importance to Patience, as she had never been given such an option before. The trouble was, she had never fought with someone before, which was not to say that this was a fight either. But the point was, she had no idea how to make it up with someone. It wasn't hard to understand why Tom considered her such a sheltered convent woman. She had so few social skills. Her mother had never considered that she might need to know these things as Patience was to marry well, and it was not typically in the repertoire of duchesses to apologise. Patience frowned. I do not want to be that sort of woman, she realised. She was not entirely certain just what sort of woman she wished to be just yet. It was as if she were an artist, carving herself out of a block of marble. The rough shape was there, the hints of what was to come but the masterpiece would only be fully realised after much work and consideration. Chapter 22 The morning was a chaotic whirlwind of seeing guests off and ensuring that no guest felt slighted in the attention of the Duchess. Annabella was not afraid to admit that she had always assumed that being a grand lady entailed a life of leisure. It had never occurred to her that there was such a degree of work that went into being a noblewoman, especially a duchess. Granted, there were many things that she would never have to worry about again, such as being hungry or paying the rent. Still, there was much to do, and her diary was constantly full. Her husband, though preferring the countryside, was still an important man. This dinner had been one of the myriad ways that power was managed within the kingdom. 
Annabella hoped that it had been a success. A few stragglers had shown up late, missing the dinner entirely, but Tom had assured Annabella beforehand that she would know her party was a success if there were a few crashes. He had proven quite useful in helping her to manage the guest list, telling her which guests might be seated near each other and which had to be kept separated at all costs. She suspected that he wished to be in her good graces at first, possibly for an increase in his meagre allowance, but this suspicion quickly melted away. He had been a great help, and it was partially thanks to him that the evening had proceeded so well. Though she had been busy with her duties as hostess, there had been a nagging worry at the back of her mind as well. Patience. It was uncharacteristic of her mild-mannered sister to lash out as she did. Annabella had respected her wishes and let her be, however, not wishing to smother her as their mother had for much of her young life. It had been a great relief to find that Tom had seemingly taken up the duty of keeping patients happy and attended to. In fact, whenever Annabella had stolen glances at patients, she had looked, well, spectacular. She was laughing, full of life, her eyes sparkling. She was waiting for the perfect moment to tell her that she had received a few discreet and some not-so-discreet inquiries into patients' circumstances and availability. Annabella was resolved to speak to her husband about patients' dowry and dress allowance after marriage when there was a free moment. This did not solve the immediate problem of the friction between the sisters, however. Once the house had quieted, the last guests seen off, Annabella made it a point to seek out patients. She found her ensconced in her room, seated in the padded window seat, her legs curled up under her. She was reading a large volume intently, balanced precariously on the windowsill. She was so absorbed in her reading that she clearly did not hear Annabella entering. It wasn't until Annabella said her name that she looked up, startled and blinking. What? Oh, Annabella, do come in, she said, hurriedly slamming the huge book closed. Am I intruding? I can come back later if you are busy, Annabella said, hesitating near the door. Patience shook her head, unfurling her legs and turning to sit properly on the window seat. No, no, please come in. Annabella approached, noting the way that Patience's hands were clasped together tightly in her lap. She had her head ducked, stealing glances at Annabella as she approached. Clearly she believed herself in trouble, expecting a reprimand. This softened Annabella's heart even further, and she had to rest the urge to rush right over and gather her up in a sisterly embrace. May I sit? Annabella asked, waiting for Patience's nod. I wish to apologise to you, she began, speaking softly and angling herself so that she was facing Patience. You wish to apologise to me, Patience blurted, her eyebrows shooting up her forehead. Annabella, no. I spoke so monstrously to you. Annabella smiled quietly at Patience's earnestness, taking her hands in her own. You had every right to. I would never wish to stifle you. You've had quite enough of that, I think. You are your own woman and must be allowed some measure of independence. Annabella watched as Patience's cheeks coloured and her eyes filled with emotion. Abruptly, Patience threw her arms around Annabella's neck, almost throwing her off balance. Oh, Annabella, she cried, you really are the greatest of sisters. Well, I think that's just the trouble, Annabella said, gently extricating herself from Patience's grasp. We've not had nearly enough time together to figure out what it is to be sisters. That's true, Patience said, swiping at her eyes with the heel of one hand. We are very good friends, but we've not had much practice at being family. That is what I mean precisely, Annabella agreed. Not only this, but you are also a woman, growing into your own. I must learn right alongside you as you grow and blossom, so that I can see you as the young woman you are. Not the shy girl I met a year ago. She paused, squeezing Patience's hands. I feel that I must help you on this journey too, giving you whatever is necessary to help you grow. Meaning? Patience asked, her brow wrinkling slightly in confusion. I believe a change in scenery is in order, Annabella announced confidently, 
I find it necessary to run up to London for a few days' time. The Duke's birthday is only a week after the harvest supper, and I'd still like to prepare a special surprise for him. London? Patience asked, her interest piqued. I thought if you wished you might accompany me there. I don't think we'll have time for much frivolity, but perhaps we might engage in some shopping or a night at the theatre, Annabella suggested. Mother can scarcely object, as I will be there to chaperone you. Everything shall be extremely correct and proper. Patience bit her lip again, her eyes flicking to the large book she had been reading. Annabella, following the movement, chuckled a little to herself. And of course, we shall stop at a bookseller as well, she added. Patience's face broke into a wide grin, and she once again threw herself at Annabella. Oh, yes, please, thank you so very much. Annabella hugged Patience tight for a moment, then pulled back, standing. Well, you had best begin packing then. I should like to set off first thing tomorrow morning. The smile did not leave Patience's face until long after Annabella had departed her room. An impromptu trip to London was more than she could have hoped for. She longed to try her new skills at navigating the tonne. She wanted all the unkind gossips to see her as she was now, not the sheltered, sequestered girl she had been last year. A thrill of nerves crackled along her spine and down her arms, for it was a bit frightening, but also thrilling. Moreover, she thought to herself, turning sideways and leaning back in the window seat again, I shall hopefully be able to make more inquiries. Her maid had been as good as her word, and had delivered a name to her, Lady Eva Stanton, daughter of the widowed Lady Stanton. Pulling her knees up and wrapping her arms about them, Patience's gaze drifted out the window, watching the clouds roll by in the blue sky. Patience had wasted no time, immediately secreting the massive copy of Burke's up to her room. Her eyes fell on the large book in the window sill, thanking her lucky stars that Annabella had not looked closer at it. A trip to London would make finding information about this Lady Eva easier than being trapped in the countryside. She could not help but feel a little craven that she was using her sister's gesture in such a manner, but she didn't even begin to know how to explain this all to Annabella. I barely understand it myself, she admitted to herself. It was a bit baffling, this compulsion to find out what she could about this new woman. She tried to tell herself that it was a mystery, and she was fond of mysteries. She was loath to own to it, but she also wished to understand the power that Lady Eva had wielded. Patience wished to know what it was like to walk into a room and have every eye turn to look at her in admiration, not pity or derision. She wished to know this lady, to understand the power that she wielded over Tom too. Patience had never seen Tom put on such precarious footing, stumbling and snapping as he did. He saved me, Patience thought, suddenly determined. Perhaps I can help him too in some way. That was quite a comfort to Patience. This was an errand of repaying a debt if she could. It was no longer about the strange, gnawing envy that had curled up in her stomach since last night. Tom had become a dear friend, and as Patience had precious few of them, she had resolved to be loyal and true to all of her friends. She did not wish him to be unhappy, even if, even if... Patience shook herself, realising that she had been staring out blankly for some moments. It had never entered her realm of thoughts that she would have cause to be envious in her life. After all, she had simply been told that she would marry the Duke of Brandon. Neither had expected him to fall in love with her long-last sister, but Patience was ever so glad that he had, as they were poorly suited. It simply did not do to linger on the reason why her heart felt so strange and heavy, nor the way that it seemed as if Tom were haunting her every thought. Every which way her mind turned, there he was, staring at her, watching her, not with the sad, distant eyes of last night, but the warm, hungry gaze of earlier. Chapter 23 After a flurry of packing and a hurried breakfast, Patience and Annabella found themselves being escorted out to a waiting carriage. Patience ducked her head, pointedly ignoring the fond way that the Duke held Annabella's waist with one arm, her hand in the other. It was the first time they were to be apart since their wedding, 
and Patience could hear the warm words that the Duke farewelled Annabella with. Despite her embarrassment, it gladdened her heart considerably to know that her sister had married so well and so happily. Patience focused on getting into the carriage as the Duke lifted Annabella's hand to his lips again, pressing a quick kiss to it. Be careful, love, he said as he handed her up. Patience busied herself arranging her skirt and police. You too, Patience, the Duke added, catching her attention. You are my favourite sister-in-law, and I should hate for anything to happen to you. Despite herself, Patience couldn't help but grin, especially as she was the Duke's only sister-in-law. The Duke stepped back, and that is when Patience caught sight of Tom standing some paces back from the Duke. There was a strange expression on his face, equal parts seriousness and apprehension, and something else Patience couldn't name. Tom, will you convey your fondest farewells to the ladies too? the Duke asked, sweeping a hand forward to encourage him. Tom did indeed step forward, but he did not speak for a moment. His eyes were on Patience's face, unreadable and dark. I must trust both of you to not burn the house down or neglect mealtimes while we are away, Annabella said, smiling openly at him. Tom's gaze slid to Annabella, looking at her as if just noticing that she was present. We shall do our best to not become wild men while you are gone, he said solemnly. It was clearly a jest, but it lacked something of his usual spark. He turned to look back at Patience again who realised that she was sitting quite on the edge of her seat. Patience thought for a very agonising second that Tom meant to make some sort of declaration to her as well, but decided against it. Instead, he latched the carriage door firmly, making Patience start backward a little. This action brought him closer to the carriage for a moment, his handsome face perfectly framed within the window. He stared inwardly, never breaking eye contact with Patience then abruptly turned on his heel without looking back. Patience watched him go, even craning her neck a little as the horses were whipped up and the carriage pulled away. She felt as if she had missed some sort of important message that he was trying to tell her, but she did not know what. Not for the first time she found herself thinking, infuriating man. If he had wanted to tell her something, why did he not do so? I shall never understand these little games. Perhaps that is why I did not succeed in my first season. As the carriage rocked gently down the gravel drive to the main road, Patience caught Annabella looking at her curiously. What is it? she asked. Annabella did not answer immediately, but tilted her head a little as if seeing something she did not expect. I think, she said slowly, that you are far cleverer than most people would care to know. Patience could feel a wrinkle forming between her eyebrows. Am I? What brought this on? Annabella gave a little shrug, her expression still a little mystifying. Just an observation. Patience turned back to the window and sighed, fogging the glass a little. I fear it's contagious, she griped. Everyone is speaking in riddles lately. Her ill humour was quickly dispelled, however, by the excitement of travelling. She had spent a precious few months in London and had seen very little of the city. It would take two days to get there, which meant an overnight at the home of an acquaintance on the way. Still, the promise of new sights and sounds beckoned, and Patience found herself enjoying herself immensely. What shall we do first? Oh, there's so much to see, Patience gushed, throwing open the drapes of one of the large windows in the Duke's townhouse. Shall we do some shopping? I've read that the arcade is quite something to see. Or perhaps a drive through Regent's Park. Maybe Carlton House or St Paul's. Patience trailed off, the list growing by the moment. Annabella, still removing her gloves and passing her hat to her maid, chuckled indulgently. We've only a couple days, Patience. We must plan our time carefully. Besides, we are two ladies on our own, so we must consider that as well. Oh, I know, but surely you want to see some of the sights too. Besides, who could object to our seeing a cathedral? Patience demanded, turning from the window. Surprisingly, Annabella had stilled, one glove off, 
the other partially on, and a wistful, misty look came over her. I've actually been to St. Paul's once long ago, though it was night and I confess that I did not pay much attention to the architecture. Patience, intrigued, could not help but step closer, even as a second maid tried to help her out of her police and bonnet. At night, Annabella, are you hiding a story of intrigue from me? Annabella laughed once breathily. I suppose it was a good deal of intrigue. I shall tell it to you sometime, I promise. In the meantime, shall we see what's on in London? Perhaps we might pay a call on Mrs Talbot, see if she would like to accompany us. This made Patience smile, for she was very fond of Annabella's friend. Oh yes, I should like that very much. She is such a cheerful soul. That she is. Let me send out some cards, and we'll see if we can't find some entertainment for a young lady tomorrow, Annabella promised. Patience, having wriggled free of her police, turned back to the window. Though the street was far away, behind a low wall that dulled the sounds and smells of the city, she could still see the thronging masses that moved about. Somewhere, out in this great city, was someone who knew something about Lady Eva and the key to the mystery surrounding Lord Tom. Though the hour was late, Annabella was still awake, seated at a writing desk in the study. She had promised to write to the Duke that they had arrived safely, and she'd spent the afternoon sending off visiting cards and notes to inform the ton that she was available for calls. There was something that kept her awake, however, long after the servants had retired. Something nagged at her, a notion that she could not quite shake. Husband, I wonder if I might know the nature of the quarrel between Tom and his Lord Father. I imagine that he has extracted a promise of discretion from you, which I do not ask you to break. If, however, you are able to tell me something about it, I should be very grateful. Be assured I do not intend to pass judgment on the young man, as we are all entitled to make mistakes in our youth. I have heard you insinuate, however, that he has something of a reputation in London. If this is not the case, please dissuade me of these notions. Annabella hesitated, her pen hovering above the paper. She did not know how to explain the strange suspicion that ate at her, but she knew people. It was one of her greatest assets during her days as a dressmaker. She had to know who could be relied upon to pay a bill on time, to help customers realise their vision without insulting them. Dipping her pen in the ink bottle, she began writing again, the pen scratching as she wrote. You will think I have taken leave of my senses, but I suspect that an attachment may be forming between Patience and Tom. I know what you're going to say. I can see your laughing expression even now. That they fight like cats and dogs. That there is no trace of fondness between them. I would remind you, dear husband, that sometimes a whole other sort of passion is revealed when tempers cool. I do not think Tom has any unsavoury intentions with our patients. Whatever you may think of him, I am confident that he has more feeling and sense than you credit him with. However, it may simply be that they have spent so long in proximity, and they are the only young people about, that something may be forming there. It may warrant more consideration is all that I will say on the matter. Patience does not have any experience with these sort of things, and I worry that a bruised heart awaits her. Now I am off to bed, and enclose a dozen kisses for you. All of my love, your Annabella. She could not help but smile as she signed the letter, gently blowing on it to dry the ink afterward. She knew that she should sign it more formally, but she wished to simply be Alan's Annabella. Chapter 24 The gallery was positively packed with people, all intent on being seen as much as seeing the paintings. The figures in the portraits hung on the walls all looked down with an airy kind of approval, as if accepting the crowd's admiration as their due. It was an exhibition for Thomas Lawrence, the celebrated portraitist. His new portrait of the Prince Regent was meant to be the centrepiece and the crowd all filed along slowly toward the hall where it was hung in pride of place. Patience found the crowd a bit unsettling at first, 
There were simply so many sets of eyes, and they would turn to stare at her, assessing and weighing her merits. She was immensely grateful that she had worn her favourite day dress of eggplant purple polished cotton, and that her hair was arranged so well beneath her bonnet. But then, she noticed the strangest thing. There were simply so many people that it was easy enough to lose oneself in the crowd. She found herself walking a few steps ahead of Annabella, who was locked in conversation with Mrs Penny Talbot, her particular friend. Patience did not begrudge this distraction, however, for Mrs Talbot was such an infectiously delightful friend. Patience had only met her briefly in London before Annabella was married, but was instantly fond of her. She had a warm personality and a correspondingly warm smile that no one could help but return. Patience walked slowly, taking her time to stare up into all of the faces. They seemed to each have some kind of secret, something that made their eyes sparkle from the canvases. One in particular caught her eye, of two girls seated next to each other, their heads close together as if they had just shared a delightful secret. Patience could not help but admire the graceful tilt of their necks, the playful curve of their lips. She was lost in admiration when she became aware of another person standing quite near her, a young lady. Patience glanced over, and the young lady gave her a brief smile. Her heart nearly gave out for a moment, as at first glance she thought that it was Lady Eva. This fear was quickly allayed, however, for though the young lady in question sported black hair as well, her profile was decidedly less refined, with a little upturned nose and rounder cheeks. Forgive me, I did not mean to startle you, the young lady said, in a voice as light and breathy as a spring wind. No, it is fine, you just... you look like someone I know, Patience stammered, ducking her head a little. The young lady turned to face Patience more fully then, her mouth curling up into a delighted smile. Her lips were very red on her skin, as if she had just bitten into a ripe strawberry. Do I really? Please tell me who this person is that I might know my unknown twin. Lady Eva Stanton, Patience blurted, feeling as if she had to say something, and too nervous to make up a convincing lie. She regretted this instantly for this new lady's face instantly lit up with recognition and delight. Lady Ava, really? she asked, her smile widening to reveal perfect little teeth, like pearls. You know her? Patience said, her voice nearly breaking from sheer panic. Any lady would be flattered to be mistaken for Eva. She is a most stunning creature, the new lady said, turning her gaze back up to the painting. But yes, I do know her. She is my very dearest friend. That is why I am so fond of this painting, she continued, gesturing to the portrait before them with the handle of an upturned umbrella. Something in their manner, their closeness reminds me of myself and Eva. How lucky you are to have such a good companion then, Patience managed. She wished for nothing more than to simply disappear into the wooden floor, sinking down all the way to the centre of the earth. She had hoped to find out more about Lady Ava while in London, but this really was outside of too much. What were the chances that she would stumble upon Lady Ava's best friend at a gallery showing of all things? I suppose I am at that, the young lady said, a reflective cast to her rosy smile and cheeks. Whatever else may go wrong in my life, I do have the comfort of friendship. As if suddenly remembering herself, she turned back to patience, her eyes wide and round. Oh, do forgive me. Here I am prattling on, and we've not been introduced. She looked around with hazel green eyes, searching for someone that might provide the requisite introductions. Finding no one, she leaned in a little conspiratorially. Would you find it terribly common if we simply introduced ourselves? There seems not to be a master of ceremonies that we might rely on. Patience, too, glanced about, but Annabella and Mrs Talbot had drifted away. As if sensing that Patience was looking at her, Annabella's eyes searched the crowd until she saw Patience. She sent an inquiring look to her, but Patience shook her head a little. No, she wanted to manage this on her own. It would not be so difficult. Surely she could manage an introduction on her own. Lady Patience Carnegie, she said at last 
dropping a shallow curtsy. Miss Catherine Johnson, the young lady replied, her cheeks dimpling slightly. Everybody calls me Kitty, though. I think I should look around for a cross governess if anyone were to call me Catherine these days. Patience smiled cautiously, finding this young woman to be disarming. There was a slight commotion in the next gallery, and they both turned to look. Miss Johnson rolled her eyes a little, but smiled good-naturedly. I suppose someone else has tried to throw something at the prince's portrait again. What, really? How shocking, Patience said, her eyes winning. Miss Johnson turned and began slowly ambling toward the commotion, pausing to sweep her eyes over the portraits along the way. Oh, very, Miss Johnson agreed. People keep sneaking in and trying to vandalise it. There's a lot of bad feeling about him, he's rather notorious. But then, I suppose there's a lot of that in London these days. She stopped here, and her eyes swept over Patience's face again. You are the new Duchess of Brandon's sister, aren't you? I thought I recognised her over there. I am, Patience said cautiously, stiffening again. Miss Johnson turned to look at Annabella and sighed a little. She's always dressed so well, not at all vulgarly as some of these highfalutin ladies of the ton do. That sable with the green dress is fantastic. She turned a quick eye to Patience, running over her. Of course, I see that you both have an eye for colour. That one suits you exceedingly well. Patience did not know how to respond to this frontal assault of flattery. I cannot take credit for it, she said haltingly. It is down to my sister's taste. Well, lucky for you to have such a gifted sister then, Miss Johnson said, turning back to resume her journey to view the prince's oversized portrait. I wonder what they threw this time. Oh, blech, it must have been mud. Mind your shoes, there's still some on the floor. Patience, glancing down, did as advised, dodging clumps of dirt that had not been swept away yet. Have there been very many attempts to vandalise the painting? Miss Johnson wobbled her head in a so-so gesture. Yes and no. Quite a shocking amount, considering that it is a painting of our Prince of Wales, not so very many, considering how wicked he behaves. Patience had nothing to say to that, for she was not well versed in politics. She'd heard some rumours here and there, but it was not anything that she had ever really had a reason to pay attention to. The women of London seemed much better informed than she, in this respect at least. They had arrived at the far room of the gallery, standing in the back of the crowd. With some effort, they were able to slide in among the spectators, and Patience gazed up at the larger-than-life portrait. In it, the Prince of Wales stood regally dressed in elegant court robes, styled in the manner of Tudor princes. His stock and collar were impossibly high, giving him a long, elegant neck. This was mirrored by his long, elegant legs, on full display in breeches and hose, a jewelled garter below one knee. His hair was elegantly tousled, and it seemed as if a divine light shone on his face, highlighting his cheekbones and temple. Patience frowned, not fully understanding what she was seeing. This man, this richly dressed king-like figure, did not match with the rumours and descriptions she had heard of the Prince Regent. Beside her, Patience could glimpse Miss Johnson staring at it also, her expression bemused. She turned to Patience and caught her eye. Yes, that face you are making seems to be the most common reaction to it, Miss Johnson said. Master Lawrence was in here yesterday, declaiming to a sceptical audience that it was a true likeness. A likeness to whom exactly? Patience muttered. This image did not match with the cartoons that were printed and distributed to an eager public. To her great surprise, Miss Johnson burst into a fit of breathy, light laughter that turned more than a few heads. Oh, Lady Patience, you really are a wit, she said, still tinkling with laughter. Patience merely blinked at her as Miss Johnson collected herself and expertly navigated them out of the viewing room. Well, now everyone who was present knows that a delightful and funny person you are, she said with a significant quirk of one eyebrow. Patience watched her carefully, aware that some sort of transaction had just taken place. Immediately she felt a kind of prickling caution on the back of her neck, and she looked about for Annabella again. I'm... 
I'm not sure that I... She stammered. Miss Johnson pressed a little closer, her voice lowered to a conspiratorial whisper. Her face was still full of friendliness and laughter, but Patience couldn't help but feel a little cornered. Speaking of our misbehaving prince, she murmured, I have heard that your sister and the Duke have been entertaining their own misbehaving rake. Patience froze entirely, not sure how to respond. She had not faced this sort of direct questioning before and had no idea how to answer. Gathering her courage, she decided to go on the offence. And just how would you know that? Patience demanded. Miss Johnson gave another of her airy laughs. Oh, that was not anything difficult to find out. Everyone knows that Lord Tom's father is in a rage at his son right now, and that he had to leave London under a cloud of suspicion. Suspicion? Patience repeated, feeling slow. What I have to wonder is if you have any information that the rest of us do not, Miss Johnson pressed, leaning in even closer. Is this why you spoke to me? You wish to know what I might divulge about Lord Tom? Patience asked in disbelief. Miss Johnson shrugged. Partially, she said unconcerned. I actually wanted to meet you regardless. That was my aim in coming here today, truthfully. How did you know we would be here? Again, that light laugh. Oh, Lady Patience, you really are so adroit. Everyone knows when a duchess is coming to town. The moment she arrived, the gossip mill began its work, to say nothing of the cards she sent out. But why me? How could you possibly have known who I am? Patience asked, backing up a step and then another. Lady Ava gave a glowing report of you, Miss Johnson said, pursuing Patience as she backed up. And I simply had to meet the younger sister of such a... She paused, searching for the correct word. An interesting new addition to society. How it was Patience's turn to stop retreating. She bristled at the implied jab at Annabella. Better an interesting new addition than more of the same churlish, small-minded gossips, she snapped, surprising both herself and Miss Johnson. Please don't mistake me, Miss Johnson said, reaching out and touching Patience's sleeve, halting her before she could leave. I have no objection to her grace. I find her to be a breath of fresh air. Then what is the nature of your complaint exactly? Clearly. There is something you wanted to discuss with me specifically, Patience said. She may not have been as socially adept as the other ladies of London, but Patience was not a fool, and she could read people quite well given enough time. Lady Ava said that you were looking quite friendly with Lord Tom, Miss Johnson said pointedly. And what of it? He is a friend, Patience said with a proud toss of her head. There, she thought smugly. Let that get around London, that the dowdy Lady Patience Carnegie is friends with such a man of fashion. Miss Johnson glanced behind Patience, then turned her eyes back to Patience. You are very loyal to your sister, I recognise this same fierceness, for Lady Ava is like my own sister, and like you, I should defend her for all I am worth. She stepped closer again, right into Patience's face, her grip tightening on the sleeve of her dress. What I wish to know once and for all is this. Just what has that rake been saying about Eva? Has he been filling all of his relations' ears with poison about her? He's never said a word about her. Why should he? What is she to him, and he to her? With a surprising show of strength, Patience wrenched her arm free and backed up another step. To her consternation, she found herself backing directly into someone. A hand came up to her shoulder, steadying her, and Patience whipped her neck about to see who it was. She sighed with relief, seeing that it was Annabella. Beside her, Mrs Talbot, in a questionably yellow dress, watched Miss Johnson with narrowed eyes. There you are, Patience, dear. Have you made a new acquaintance? Annabella asked evenly. Patience could feel her give a small, hidden squeeze to her shoulder, reassuring her. This is Miss Kitty Johnson, Patience managed. She is acquainted with Tom. Is she indeed? Annabella said, her tone a plummy imitation of the kind of snobbery Tom wore like a fashionable jacket. It almost made Patience laugh in spite of herself. Shifting so that she could look at Annabella, 
patients could see a look of carefully study tinged with disdain. It was the sort of look their mother wore regularly when it was time to put someone back in their proper box. The look, combined with Annabella's powerful title and standing, was enough to cause Miss Johnson to shrink back. A pleasure, Your Grace, she said, curtsying deeply. Lord Tom and I have known each other for years, she added with a glance to Patience. Hmm, Annabella said, clearly considering. Beside her, Mrs Talbot's brightly coloured dress and predilection for ruffles caused her to look like a disgruntled bird of some species, puffed up and ready to peck. I'm sure Lord Tom would be delighted to see you again. Please, why don't you join us for the Duke's birthday? It shall be in two weeks' time, Thursday. Miss Johnson looked back and forth between the trio, as if trying to discern something. Her coy smile was back on her face then, and she curtsied again. I should be delighted, she accepted. They made their farewells with Annabella taking one of Patience's arms and Mrs Talbot the other. Why on earth did you invite her? Patience hissed to Annabella when there was some distance between them and Miss Johnson. Because she needed reminding of who you are and who you are related to, Annabella said, and because I suspect we shall all be enlightened by her presence. Patience did not care for this cryptic answer one bit, but she held her tongue. For her part, she felt as if a mink had just been invited into the hen house. Chapter 25 the journey back to the Brandon estate was a bit more subdued than the departure. Patience had endeavoured to enjoy herself as much as she could for the remaining days they were in London, but the city felt tainted to her now. Around every corner, there seemed to be eyes watching her, waiting to see what she would do next. No longer was she an invisible social pariah. Now she was an object of curiosity. This was different than during her season, when she had not fitted in at all. Now it seemed as if the entire ton knew something about her that she did not yet know about herself. It all clearly boiled down to Lord Tom and whatever this mysterious business was with him in London. His father was evidently still furious at him. That much was clear. Whatever it was had been bad enough to cause him, the eldest son and heir to the earldom, to be cast out. Somehow, in all of this, the beautiful Lady Eva Stanton was the linchpin that the scandal turned on. The carriage bumped along, the roads becoming rutted as they travelled further outside of London. They would be back at the estate in a few hours now. Patience had bought a few books to keep herself entertained, but they remained in their packing, stacked on the seat beside her. She merely watched the landscape pass out the window, occasionally blurred by mist or light rain. The fields were half bare, the harvest well underway. Let us hope this rain clears up for the rest of the harvest, Annabella commented, looking out at the sheaves, damp wheat that was stacked against one another, propped upright. Patience hummed, not really paying attention. The carriage hit a particularly hard rut, and Patience was jostled, her books in their brown paper wrapping thunking onto the floor. With a heavy sigh, Patience leaned down and replaced them, leaving one hand atop this time to steady them. I hope that you weren't upset by anything in London, Annabella said carefully. Patience could see her trying to catch her eye, but Patience only sighed again. No, I wasn't upset. I just... I'm not sure I shall ever fit into that world. Maybe you won't, Annabella agreed gently. What, do you think me incapable of fitting in too? Patience asked, refusing to look at her. She could hear her voice warbling as she spoke and hated it. Patience, of course not, Annabella admonished lightly. It just seems to me that there is more than one way to be a lady. There is nothing that says you have to be a great beacon of snobbery in London. Patience hummed again, refusing to be cheered. Yes, but isn't that what gentlemen want? A lady that knows how to navigate every social situation with ease, never faltering or missing a step? Annabella barked out a laugh, startling Patience. Well, that certainly isn't what the Duke wanted, she reminded Patience. Yes, but how many men are like him? How many have such generosity of spirit and such an open loving heart? How many would accept 
less than what they are told to expect? Patience asked, feeling herself very near tears. Her eyes burned and she fixed them wide, refusing to cry again. Patience, Annabella said softly, taking her hands across the open space between them. If a gentleman makes you feel less than who you are, then he is not the man for you, she said quietly, but emphatically. There was a long silence between them again, filled only by the sounds of the carriage creaking along and the occasional calls of the driver to the horses. Annabella, Patience said at last, do you know what Tom has done? I mean, what has driven him out of London? Annabella did not answer immediately. When Patience looked to her, she saw a careful, guarded expression on Annabella's face. I do not know the particulars, she said deliberately. But you know something? Patience pressed. Only pieces of gossip, Patience, nothing for certain. I really do wish everyone would stop treating me like a child, Patience huffed. I am either prepared for the world and all its ills, or I am not. I should like to stop living in this strange in-between where I am neither. It was Annabella's turn to sigh. You're right, of course. I'm sorry, I just... You have endured much, and I do not like to add to your troubles. How am I ever to grow if no one will allow me to experience anything? Patience huffed, bitterness colouring her words. At every turn I hear, Patience, you are so naive, Patience, you are such a child, and yet I am not given the chance to move past that. I truly do not know the nature of the complaint at this time, Annabella said. Alan has assured me that Tom has never done anything too terrible before, just the usual boyish mischief. Another silence, and then, Patience, did that young lady at the gallery, Miss Johnson, did she make insinuations about Tom? I'm not entirely sure, Patience admitted. I think she wanted to ensure that Tom were not spreading gossip, which, that's the other way around, isn't it? Gossip is being spread about Tom, not by him, she said, her forehead creasing in confusion. Annabella, too, seemed confused by this. How odd. It's not as if Tom even has anyone to gossip with, stuck out there in the country with us. Patience sighed and slumped back against the padded squab of the carriage. She was fond of a good mystery, but was quickly developing the opinion that they ought to be confined to the pages of a book, not complicating people's lives. She must have dozed off, for she awoke suddenly, the carriage stopped and the door being opened. Blearily, she blinked several times, confused and disoriented. A footman was outside, readying the carriage steps. Annabella was gathering up her skirt, preparing to disembark. The Duke was waiting, just behind the footman, and she floated easily into his arms. Patience sighed wistfully and shook her head, trying to clear the last of the sleep fog. The Duke had eyes only for Annabella, calling out a greeting to Patience but seeing his wife in. Patience did not begrudge them this, for they had clearly missed each other. What really caught her eye and washed away the last of the drowsiness was the sight of Lord Tom. He stood near the front door, not approaching the carriage, one hand behind his back formally. His expression was carefully guarded, as distant as the rest of him. Patience tried not to stare, the memories of what had occurred in London colouring her cheeks a little. She nearly stumbled as a footman helped her out of the carriage. Recovering herself, and silently praying that Tom had not seen her misstep, she held her head high and attempted to glide into the house with what dignity she had remaining. As she passed him, Lord Tom leaned closer, as if he were leaning in to smell a bouquet of flowers. Welcome back, Lady Patience, he murmured, so quiet that she almost did not hear him. Patience did not pause, merely continued her ingress to the grand house. Thank you, Lord Tom she returned crisply. She could feel him following behind her, waiting patiently as a maid helped her remove her pelisse and bonnet. His presence unnerved her, and she felt a little like a mouse with a cat staring at her. She refused to indulge him, ignoring him, and not letting him see how nervous she was. One finger at a time, she removed her gloves, 
as if she had all of the time in the world. Lord Tom watched her performance, folding his arms and arching one eyebrow. When at last she was done, Patience finally looked at him. She attempted to mimic his expression, raising her own eyebrows at him in silent question. Did you enjoy London? Tom asked at last, one side of his mouth lifting in a smile. Not as much as you would have, I expect, she replied tartly. Oh, what's this, London not to your tastes after all? He asked playfully. Patience turned to face him more fully, trying to understand him. He was back to teasing her, acting as if he had not public cut her in front of a significant portion of the ton. Perhaps it is his way of making amends, Patient wondered silently. Perhaps, perhaps not, she answered at last. One meets such varied company there that it is difficult to get the measure of someone, she added impulsively. Tom immediately fixed onto these words. Am I to take this that you have made some new acquaintance? I have, Patience confirmed. She was very good friends with Lady Eva Stanton. She spoke directly, staring directly at Tom, trying to take his measure as he heard the name. His eyes narrowed and two spots of colour appeared on his finely chiselled cheekbones. When he did not answer, Patience took this as some sort of silent confirmation that he did, in fact, have a history with the lady in question. Without preamble, she continued on her way through the foyer, crossing the marble floor quickly. What does that mean? Tom demanded, following after her. What does what mean? Patience asked, not turning around. That coy look in your eyes just now, he said, walking quick step to keep up with her. I would hate to think that you have been spoiled by the uncouth manners of the city, he continued his words teasing but his tone serious. No, I wouldn't say that at all, Patience said. I have just grown tired of dishonesty. Dishonesty, Tom repeated, disbelieving. Have I been dishonest with you? No, but you also clearly have not been honest, Patience said. She paused, having reached the stairs and put her hand on the railing, intending to go upstairs and rest before dinner. The journey had been more tiring than she had expected and she felt worn out. With a sharp inhale of irritation, Tom bounded up two stairs spryly, his long legs taking them easily. Ah, let me see, he said. Some painted and rouged lady of the capital told you some rowdy tale of my youth, and now I have lost your good opinion. He stood, staring down at Patience, who stared right back at him. I did not take you for a gossip. A gossip? Patience gasped, outrage overriding her fatigue. I am not a gossip. It is not my fault if your tawdry past comes up and confronts me in the middle of an art gallery. And with that, she brushed past him, stomping up the stairs to her rooms. She was upset, upset that her first words to Tom had been cross ones, upset that her trip to London hadn't been what she had expected. Mostly, however, she was upset that she and Tom had quarrelled again. She would never admit it out loud, but she had been secretly hoping that he would be overjoyed to see her, that he would greet her with one of his dazzling smiles, maybe even offer his arm to escort her into the house. In an uncharacteristic fit of pique, she slammed the door to her room, both hands pressed against it. She was breathing hard, and she worked to calm herself. Tom had a gift for making her feel overwrought. Her head was beginning to ache, and she pressed her forehead to the relative cool of the door, taking deep breaths through her nose. Outside of her door in the hall, the floor creaked just a little. Patience knew that sound. It was the third board just outside of her door, right in the middle of the hall. It squeaked ever so slightly when someone stepped on it. Her ears pricked up, straining to hear. She held her breath, swearing that she could hear someone just outside her door, likewise taking a deep breath, as if they meant to speak. It must be my imagination, she thought after standing in this way for some time. She dared not move, lest she give her position directly behind the door away. The floor in the hall did not squeak again, and after what felt like an eternity, Patience exhaled again. Cautiously, 
she opened her door again and poked her head out. She looked up and down the hall, but there was no one there. Her hand still rested on the latch, and she was at the point of closing the door again when something caught her eye. There, just outside her door, was a spot of colour. They were light purple blooms, two of them, with bright yellow middles, asters. They grew in abundance in some of the fields of the estate. Patients stared down at them, wondering what it meant. They had not been carefully trimmed, for their stems were ragged and looked as if they had been clutched far too tightly. With the greatest of care, she knelt down and picked them up, cradling them as if they were made of glass. They sagged pitifully, clearly having been kept out of water. Patience felt a rush of sentiment and gently ferried them into her room, placing them on the wide windowsill by the padded window seat. Sitting heavily, Patience folded her arms and put them on the windowsill, pillowing her head atop them. Outside, past the gardens, Lord Tom was walking. He faced away from her, so she could not see his face, but she did not need to. Even from here she could see the hunched, angry set of his shoulders. Patience sighed, her heart heavy and confused. With one finger, she gently reached out and touched the petals of one of the flowers. I just wanted to be seen by him, she reflected to herself. It never occurred to me that perhaps he too simply wants to be seen. Chapter 26 In the week leading up to the harvest supper, Tom was careful to avoid being alone with patience. He did not know what it was that she had learned in London, but it didn't bode well for him. He had caught Annabella looking askance at him as well, and Tom felt a very real fear that he may disappoint her in some way. This was an entirely alien sensation for him, as he could not remember the last time he was concerned about disappointing someone. Despite his outward suspicion of rural amusements, it was hard not to get swept up in preparations for the harvest supper. The manor grounds would be thrown open to all the farmers and tenants of the estate, and a great feast with frivolities would take place. Tom had hazy memories from his boyhood of them, including a particularly memorable one that had been his first taste of cider. The Duke's estate was known for its quality scrumpy, and Tom was looking forward with some nostalgia to sampling some. The advantage of throwing himself into the preparations meant that he might avoid socialising with patients without appearing rude. He did not know what had possessed him to leave the flowers outside her room, but he hoped that it would be something of a peace offering. For her part, Patience seemed content to treat him with a kind indifference, conversing with him politely but no more. She did not argue or jest with him any more, and he found that he missed both greatly. He was very careful to not be alone with her, partly out of respect for her clear disapproval of him, but partly because he was afraid that he might somehow taint her by association. The weight of his mistake was weighing on him, and he still did not even know what it fully was. If I could just speak to Eva alone, I might be able to at least figure that out, he groused to himself. He had an inkling that it was something not altogether proper, however, given the way that Lady Patience had reacted to whatever gossip there had been in London. He had tried everything he knew on how to charm a young lady, and none of it had worked on Patience. She was not like any other person he had spent time with. Bearing this in mind, Tom was resolved to try something entirely new. He would attempt to be honest with her. She was right in that regard, and it seemed the least he could do to try and make amends. As it happened, the day before the harvest supper was to take place, Annabella had delegated finalising some floral arrangements to patients. She was in front of the manor, inspecting a blooms and greenery arranged on canvas tarps, selecting those which pleased her eye. Tom paused mid-stride as he approached her, struck by the simple pastoral beauty of what he was looking at. Patience wore a day dress of cream cotton with purple flowers, her hair swept up in carefully constructed carelessness with a purple ribbon threaded through. She held an armful of flowers, lavender by the look and fragrance of them and she pointed with an elegant hand to some other blooms laid out. A young undergardener in a canvas apron seemed quite pleased to be at her beck and call, 
and darted forward to gather up the greenery she had indicated. The afternoon sun was warm and golden, though the air was cool, illuminating her bronze hair and shining through the delicate pink tips of her ears. Tom knew good and well that he was staring, but how could he not? It was a scene that anyone would be enchanted by, and he wished that he had some way of capturing the moment. As it was, he probably would have been content to simply observe patience for the rest of the evening. That too marked out the afternoon. Tom was content to simply watch her, with no ulterior motive, no scheme. This was not to say that he hadn't enjoyed looking at ladies before. He was quite fond of that, in fact. But he could not remember being happy to watch one for long. He felt no boredom, no tedium when he looked at patience. There was only a strange curling sensation around his heart, a kind of heavy settling. As if she had felt his eyes upon her, patience glanced about, her eye landing on Tom and passing him over before snapping back again. She raised her eyebrows at him, not quite smiling but something akin to it. Cheeks warm from being caught, Tom cleared his throat and approached her. Good afternoon, Lady Patience he said, immediately regretting the formality of his greeting. Lord Tom, she responded blithely, turning her attention back to the flowers. No, not those. Yes, take that batch there, the one still in bud. I was wondering if I might, he began, but was quickly cut off. Gently, don't bruise them, they are quite delicate, Patience admonished her assistant. And would you see if Mr. Crick has made that delivery I asked for? The boy doffed his hat quickly and scampered off to do as he was bid. Patience turned to Tom with an apologetic expression. I am sorry. There's just much to be done before tomorrow. Yes, Tom said, looking about at the manor as if he had just noticed the work going on. All about gardeners, maids, hall boys and people hired from the village swarmed about like ants, working in tandem. There was a flurry of scrubbing, polishing, pruning and trimming, as if the estate were expecting a state visit from the royal family instead of a harvest supper. Did you need something? Patience inquired, tilting her head to try and see his face. Yes, that is, yes I did, Tom said, clamping his hands behind his back nervously. That is, I wish to. I liked it better before, he said in a rush. Patience tilted her head in the other direction, her eyes narrowing slightly in confusion. Us, he clarified hurriedly. That is, not to presume that there was an us, I just... I find that your company is... It's not... Are you quite all right? And here I thought I was the one who was a shambles at socialising, Patience teased. Tom, relieved beyond measure that she was back to gently poking at him, sighed, deflating a little. You see what endless weeks in the country has done to me, he said, smiling his lopsided smile at her. Yes, in fact I do, Patience said, her face coming over quite serious and thoughtful. Well, that is just the point, Tom said, daring to step just a little closer again. I think my time in London has not been in my own best interests. Lord Tom, you astonish me, Patience said, turning and walking slowly to the northern lawn where tables were being set up. He could see the apples of her cheeks lifting in a small smile. I thought London was all that you were pining for. No, Tom protested, then reconsidered. Well, perhaps at first, but I find that I pine for something else entirely these days. And pray tell, what is that? Patience said, laying the bundle of lavender down on a trestle table. A new frock coat? A dozen freshly starched cravats? No, yes, but that's not... Why do I struggle to speak to you? Tom said, frustration beginning to stiffen his shoulders and sharpen his voice. I am not well versed in being... He faltered. Patience half turned to him, looking at him askance. Unassuming? Honest? Genuine? Yes, Tom said bluntly. I am trying very hard. I think that is true, Patience agreed. Why don't you take a deep breath and try again? Obediently, Tom took a lungful of autumn air and tried to focus on what it was that he was actually feeling. 
I feel that I should tell you something, he said finally. Patience turned to face him more fully, clearly intending to tease him further. Tom could see the jest die on her lips, though, and her expression instead turned to one of some concern. What is it? I'm listening. Tom stared into her dark blue eyes, looking up at him with such clarity that he nearly faltered. There was no deception or preamble with patience. She simply was. He knew that he had to attempt to follow her example. It was the least that he could do for her. You are not like any other woman I have ever met, he began. You've made that abundantly clear from the moment we met, Patience remonstrated softly, tempering her words with a rueful smile. Tom winced. Ah, yes, that is true, he said contrite. I must tell you that I deeply regret what I said then. Patience accepted this apology gracefully, nodding her head and letting her eyes close for a brief moment. She made as if to go back to work, and impulsively Tom reached out and seized her wrists. She blinked up at him, owl-like, startled and unsure. He could practically feel her instinctual pulling back of her hands and her fighting against it. Please, that is not what I wish to say to you, he began again. You have inspired me, and I would like to pay you the compliment of honesty. He took a deep breath, steadying himself. I should like to preface all of this with the knowledge that I have grown rather fond of you. You are infuriating and challenging, but I find that I am never bored when I am with you. You are the most unimpeachably genuine person I have ever met. A series of expressions flitted across Patience's face, ranging from confusion to demure embarrassment. Tom was secretly delighted with the delicate blush that spread across her cheeks. She made as if to speak, and Tom gently pressed her wrists to halt her. But you were right when you returned from London, he said, lowering his gaze. I have lived a life there that I am not altogether proud of. I know that Kitty Johnson made insinuations regarding myself, and, well, the most terrible thing of it is that I do not know if they are true. Patience's brows drew together in confusion. You don't know if they are true? How can that be? Tom winced a little and released Patience's hands. I will make no bones about it. I was rather dissolute and spent more than one evening, ah, uh, shall we say, imbibing a little too liberally. Patience gave him an arch look. You mean in a drunken stupor? she asked blankly. Not to put too fine of a point on it, but yes, it was what fashionable young men did, so I thought that it doesn't matter. He hung his head a little, hating to dredge up this part of his past. Still, he was determined to fight through it and keep his promise to himself that he would be honest with Patience. Well, that's not altogether shocking, Patience said with a dismissive little shrug. I've heard the stories of London, after all. She folded her arms across her chest, her eyes distant for a moment before refocusing on Tom. But wait, what has this to do with Lady Eva? Tom winced again, shifting uncomfortably. Ah, yes. Well, you must understand some things first about Lady Eva. Her father died when she was quite young, and he was a great friend of my father's. My father always took a great interest in her well-being, and she has been my friend for, well, always, really. Patience nodded slowly. Tom wasn't surprised to see her looking a little sympathetic as she too had lost her father at a young age. She knew what it was like to be so vulnerable in society. Go on, she encouraged, watching his face carefully. Her mother is, forgive me, but I do not know how to put this in gentler terms, on the make, if you catch my meaning. She is quite aware that she has a beautiful daughter, and that is really their only asset at this point, Tom said bluntly. Patience nodded slowly. And there is an expectation of marriage between you two? That's the trouble. Her mother has made it no secret that she is desirous of the match, but, and I must speak bluntly here, there has never been the least amount of feeling between Eva and myself, Tom said emphatically. He ducked his head, making sure to catch Patience's eye. We were both at a ball at the season's end, he explained. The punch was quite good, and I, well, 
that's not hard to figure out. It was the end of the social season, one last hurrah before society retreated to the countryside or bath. Tom, Patience said softly but firmly, what exactly happened? Chapter 27 It was a curious feeling. Patience both longed for and dreaded hearing the answer to her question. Time seemed to stretch and the pit-like feeling in her stomach responded in kind. Meanwhile, her heart was busy fighting against years of isolation and loneliness, ready to burst into bloom like a field after a spring rain. He's fond of me, he said it. He has taken a fancy to me, a dim portion of her mind repeated again and again. It was a confusing flurry of feeling, such opposites as to make her giddy and grim all at once. That's the trouble, Tom admitted at last. I don't know exactly what happened. The particulars of the evening are lost on me. He glanced over at Patience again, and clearly saw confusion in her face, for he began to explain hurriedly. That is, I remember arriving at the ball and spending some time in Eva's company. You were frequently together then? Patience asked, trying to keep the sudden tinge of jealousy out of her voice. Naturally, Tom said unbothered. Then things get a little... hazy. I do not know how it came to be, but I remember that we were in the conservatory and we were alone. It was here that Tom squeezed his eyes closed, his forehead wrinkling as he concentrated. I can remember her, and the moonlight, and then... nothing. Nothing, Patience echoed. Nothing, Tom confirmed, opening his eyes again. Well, that is, nothing until her mother began having histrionics in my general direction, but that isn't anything new. After that, I can scarcely say. I'm not even sure I made it home on my own carriage. All I can say for certain is that by the next morning, my father was less than pleased with me. So he knew somehow of what transpired, Patience surmised. That's about the size of it, Tom agreed, and I was sent packing. Patience looked away, her mind a whirl. The sun was just beginning its descent and the air was cooling rapidly. She rubbed her arms briskly for a moment. Your father did not give you the details? No, Tom confirmed. You do not even know fully what transpired then, Patience asked, her eyes still looking down the gravel drive to the manor. Not entirely, no, though given the way in which my father reacted, I fear the worst. Patience could feel his eyes on her, and she glanced to him. He was watching her anxiously, somehow leaning toward her but also drawing back. You are telling me that you may have conducted yourself rather poorly, and that is what has angered your father, she said slowly, trying to put the pieces together in her head. Tom nodded but you do not know the severity of the offence, or indeed if one was given, Patience continued. And Lady Stanton, Eva's mother, has been on the hunt for a wealthy husband for her beautiful daughter. Tom nodded again, and Patience felt her insides wobble a little in tandem. Blindly, she reached behind her for one of the simple wooden chairs that were placed at the trestle tables for the harvest supper. Seeing what her intention was, Tom darted forward and pulled the chair out for her, hovering with a concerned look on his face. Well, I don't imagine it's a great mystery what Lady Stanton has to say about all of this, nor what she wishes for the outcome, Patience sighed. A thought occurred to her then, and she turned to study Tom, looking up at him. What does Lady Eva say about all of this? Tom opened his mouth to respond, his brow furrowed, and he closed his mouth again with a click of his teeth. I do not know, he admitted honestly. I have not had the chance to speak with her since. Patience nodded a little absently. As you began this confession in the spirit of honesty, I hope that you may permit me to ask a question which you may feel is a little indelicate. However, I would entreat you to answer with the same honesty. Tom his eyes shifting back and forth a little warily nodded. Patience, still watching him closely, gathered her wits and her nerves. It was not that the question was so very improper, 
perhaps a little forward, but nothing that would invite scandal. But she was unsure if she really wanted to know the answer to it. This was a test of Tom's newfound devotion to honesty, and Patience was very aware of all that rested on his response. Have you ever had any feelings of affection for her? Patience asked. Are you asking if I have ever had a tendre for Eva? Tom responded softly. If that is what you are asking, then the answer is no, not once. She has long been my playmate and dear friend, but since it was always being pushed upon us by her mother, I resisted all the harder, and in truth, I believe Eva did too. I have an abiding affection for her as a friend, nothing more. Now it was Tom's turn to search Patience's face, kneeling on one knee beside her chair. Please believe me when I tell you that I have never felt the way that I do about you. If I had then... But feeling isn't all there is, is there? Patience asked softly with a rueful smile. There is much else to take into account. I do not wish to do your friend a disservice. But have you considered the notion that she may have grown tired of waiting for a rich husband? The corners of Tom's mouth pulled down, and he did patience the service of actually contemplating what she said. I do not think Eva would be party to something so underhanded, he said, shaking his head. She always detested her mother's schemes. Patience did not have an answer for that, for she truly did not wish to besmirch the young lady's name without cause. Tom had shown no sign of lying and she was inclined to believe him. Of course, she had no way of knowing if that was simply her affection for him clouding her judgment. Still, Patience had little experience to go on, so she simply had to rely on her intuition, and it had yet to lead her astray. She was aware that Tom still looked at her expectantly, apprehensively. I'm not sure what to say at this juncture, she admitted. Thank you for your candour, and I shall keep your confidence. Though, she added with a sharp laugh, it's not as if I have ever many people I could tell. Then, then you are not angry with me, Tom asked, a little hopeful. Angry? No. Why ever would I be? You have lived your life, and though I may not agree with the manner in which you lived it, it is hardly my place to pass judgment. If anything, I feel pity for you. Again she laughed, not entirely humorously. Imagine me feeling sorry for you. Tom was inclined to agree with her, and exhaled loudly through his nose, not quite laughing as well. Where does this leave us? Tom asked, shifting a little closer. Patience could only sigh, at last turning to look at him with regret writ large across her face. I'm not sure, she admitted. Rather altered, I should think. Tom nodded, looking down to study one of his shiny hessian boots. Then what now? he asked simply. Patience sighed, turning to stare down the white gravel drive. The sun was beginning its descent in earnest, sinking slowly toward the oak trees that lined the drive. The shadows were growing longer, indigo against the warm light cast by the sun. The grass had not yet begun to turn, appearing as a deep emerald colour in the waning daylight. It was a beautiful scene, which juxtaposed poignantly with her troubled sensibilities. Would you sit with me? she asked, not daring to look at Tom. Hesitantly, he rose from his kneeling posture and removed one of the chairs from the table. He turned the chair about so that he could face outward as well, staring down the drive. The air was beginning to cool, and Patience told herself that she was glad Tom was sitting so near, as he provided a nice wind block. Patience folded her hands in her lap, holding them tightly lest she do something very foolish like reach over and take one of Tom's hands. She had spoken completely truthfully. She did pity him. He was clearly in a misery, and while she could not deny that it was largely of his own making, she couldn't help but feel something for him. Patience remembered the Duke's own grousing about feeling like a rare and exotic species that all the ladies of the town were gunning for. The wars on the continent had rather depleted the reserve of eligible young men and to find one with both a title and a fortune was something akin to spotting a unicorn these days. It was not outside the realm of possibility or even likelihood that this Lady Stanton hoped to press the advantage. 
Patience was also not so big of a fool to presume him completely innocent. She may not have had much experience with the world, but she had read enough novels to recognise a rake when she saw one. Even so, it seemed that Tom was doing his level best to turn over a new leaf. Patience smiled at the metaphor, for the tops of the trees were beginning to turn yellow in earnest, as if an artist had dumped a pot of paint over them. Daring a glance over at Tom, Patience saw that his profile was thrown into striking relief by the setting sun. His sharp cheekbones and straight nose were illuminated golden, while his jaw and the hollows around his eyes were cool shadows. Patience inhaled sharply, for he was a truly beautiful man, the kind that debutantes had vapours for. Unbidden, Patience's gaze swept over his whole frame, appreciating the elegant way that he crossed his legs, his buff-coloured breeches fitted into his boots. One knee was a bit rumpled, showing a bit of green grass stain. Playfully, Patience bumped her shoulder against Tom's. I can't believe you got down on one knee in the grass, your poor breeches, she teased, grinning. She saw his cheek lift in an answering smile. It was worth it, he replied easily, nudging her shoulder in return. He did not withdraw, and Patience found that she rather liked the contact. His shoulder was warm compared to the autumn air, and she pressed against him a little. It was perhaps not the most elegant of declarations, nor the most ardent of expressions, but it was no less meaningful to the pair as they sat and watched the sun dip lower and lower. Chapter 28 The morning of the harvest supper, Patience's eyes flew open. She was instantly awake, her excitement for the day's activities chasing away any lingering drowsiness. They would rise and dress quickly, waving of the field hands as they set out to harvest the last remaining grain. The work was largely done, and this was simply a ceremonial bit of harvest. The fields were all bare except for one corner, which would be quickly scythed today. This last bit would have stones thrown at it by the women and children beforehand to drive out any bad luck or mischievous spirits that might harm the harvest next year. It was a silly bit of superstition, but Patience found it charming. Moving quickly, she rang for Mary, who helped her quickly pull on a morning dress with a pelisse over it. She did not bother dressing her hair, merely had Mary wrap the long braid she slept with in a coil and pin it to the back of her head. Elsewhere, the rest of the house was stirring, servants moving quickly but quietly. The moment her shoes had been put on, Patience was up and dashing on light feet down the stairs, one hand on the banister. Outside, an open lando waited, pulled by two gleaming chestnut horses. The Duke waited next to it on an elegant grey, chatting amiably with the driver. Annabella was in the foyer, pulling on her gloves and smiled when she saw Patience. I'm so glad you chose to join us, she said, taking Patience by the arm as they walked out the door. It's my first harvest, and I confess that I am a bit nervous. Don't be love, the Duke said, having overheard. He smiled down at her benevolently as she was handed up into the carriage. The village shall love you just as I do. Annabella blushed prettily at this praise, and Patience grinned as she joined her in the carriage. Heaps of blankets had been piled in, which Annabella's lady's maid tucked about their legs. A waiting footman provided them with steaming mugs of hot chocolate, and a basket was at their feet with biscuits and buns to nibble while they waited. Gratefully, Patience sipped the thick, dark chocolate, wrapping her hands about the warm cup. Though she wore knitted mitts, her fingers were still cold in the early grey dawn. Are we ready, then? Annabella asked her husband. Not quite, the Duke replied, nodding in the direction of the stables. Confused, the ladies turned to see Lord Tom trotting toward them on a large-boned bay, who seemed perturbed at being pressed into service at such an early hour. Whatever lingering sleepiness that Plagwood Patience was quickly driven away when she saw Tom. Much like the rest of them, he had clearly dressed in a hurry. Unless Patience was very much mistaken, he had simply tucked his nightshirt into his trousers, pulled on boots, and topped it all with a fine blue jacket. He clearly wore no cravat, as the neck of his shirt was open, the collar falling onto the lapels of his jacket. Patience couldn't help but stare as he approached. 
She was grateful that the sun was not truly up yet, hoping that her blushes were hidden in the grey of the morning. Tom smiled at all of them as he trotted up, touching the brim of his hat with his riding crop by way of salute. Despite the hour, his eyes were clear without a trace of sleep. He turned a warm, familiar gaze on Patience, which only deepened her blush. Shyly she looked down, then regarded him demurely through her lashes. Good morning, he said, riding up next to the carriage. My, aren't the ladies the picture of comfort this morning? He teased gently. And here I was, worried how you would survive the hardship of such an early morning. We all have our trials we must bear, Annabella said with false gravity. Tom laughed. I'm convinced that hot chocolate will get one through just about any trial. Too true, Annabella agreed, lifting her cup to him. Shall we be off then, husband? We can't be late, she asked the duke, who nodded. The driver called to the horses, and the Lando started off with a lurch. Annabella nudged Patience with her elbow, who started blinking and turning to look at her sister. Are you quite all right? Annabella asked her. Patience knew that she had been staring, but the warm regard with which Tom had looked at her had left her tongue-tied. I'm fine, she croaked. She cleared her throat and tried again. I'm fine, thank you. The hour is a bit early is all, she fibbed, crossing her fingers beneath her blanket. Mmm, Annabella agreed. The Duke and Tom rode ahead of the carriage, and she wisely chose to focus her attention on them. Patience, following her lead, regarded the pair as well. Though they were cousins, they looked as different as night and day. The Duke was stocky and fair, while Tom was lithe and dark. Still, there was something similar in the set of their shoulders and the way they tilted their heads as they listened. Lord Tom seems more at ease this morning, Annabella commented blithely, looking at Patience askance. Does he? she replied, all innocence. I hadn't noticed. Much like you didn't notice that he was without a neckcloth, hmm? Annabella teased. Annabella, Patience hissed, worried that they would somehow be overheard. This was an absurd notion as they rode ahead of the carriage, the distance, compounded with the sound of the horse's hooves crunching over the white gravel, meant that there was no way they could be heard. This was apparently all the response that Annabella needed, for she regarded Patience with a bemused look. I will not say anything to embarrass you. After all, he is a handsome specimen, and any woman with her sight would notice. Her expression came over serious, and she laid her hand over Patience's, pressing them through the blanket. But as your older sister, I do feel a duty to caution you. Oh? Patience asked faintly. She was mortified to think that she had been transparent with her feelings when she had been so smug about being so circumspect. Lord Tom is, well, he clearly comes from a good family, but he has a rather colourful reputation, Annabella said diplomatically. I will not say that he hasn't improved during his time here. Honestly, the crowd he ran with in London was not the most salubrious but you should know that he came to us rather under a cloud of scandal. I know all about that, Patience sniffed, tossing her head a little smugly. You do? Annabella asked, surprised. In fact, Tom told me himself. Patience was pleased to see that Annabella was taken completely by surprise with this revelation. She looked away for a moment, processing this piece of information. Did he indeed? Well, that is certainly a credit to him, Annabella acknowledged graciously. She tilted her head a little, considering. I had not expected such transparency from him, I'm not afraid to admit. Honestly, I hadn't either, Patience admitted. They were under the shade of the trees that lined the drive, with the gates coming nearer as the horses trotted along. I thought at first he might mean to frighten me off, but... She trailed off, unsure what it meant now. Perhaps it was nothing more than he wanted her help to extricate himself from a tricky situation, or he simply wished to remain in the Duke and Duchess's good graces. Annabella squeezed Patience's hands again. Darling, you know that I am not our mother, 
Please do not feel like you must hide things from me. Patients began to respond, but Annabella hurried on. But please also do not feel like you must disclose everything to me. You are allowed to keep the secrets of your heart, whatever they may be. You, you aren't shocked or upset by my, my friendship with Tom? Patients asked hesitantly. Not as such, no, Annabella replied easily. You have become far more confident these past weeks, and I expect he has had something to do with that. By the same token, however, I would simply say that I do not know if he is the marrying sort. Meaning? Patience asked, her eyes on the looming, ornate wrought iron gates. A crooked old man hurried out of the gatehouse to unlatch them as the riders approached, the gate swinging open with a groan as if it too thought it too early to be up and about. Meaning that I do not want you to be hurt, Annabella said firmly. I do not tell you not to have your feelings, as it is only natural and right. I simply do not wish you to pin your hopes to something that is unlikely. Patience did not say anything in response to that, simply because Annabella had hit on the very thing that she feared. While they might have some sentiment for each other, there was nothing to suggest that Tom was thinking of marriage. Patience, too, was unsure if she was ready for that step. She was just beginning to experience life after all. The carriage rolled on in silence through the gates and out to the main road. They crested a hill, and there some south-facing fields awaited. They were shorn bare, save for a small patch. Bundles of harvested wheat, neatly stooked, were leaned against each other, drying in preparation for the thrashing. The driver parked the lando at the head of the field, near an old stone fence and the Duke and Tom pulled their horses up alongside. At first there was only the sounds of birdsong and the occasional snort or pouring hoof from one of the horses. Slowly, quietly at first, the sound of singing began to swell from down the road they had just driven up. The field workers, men and women alike, began to appear. The women were dressed in their best dresses and kerchiefs, the men in fresh shirts and homespun waistcoats. Around them, children frolicked or toddled alongside, the girls with ribbons in their hair. They sang a harvest song as they came, some with jugs of cider slung over their shoulders. Occasionally a child would dart out of the procession to snatch up a likely-looking stone from the side of the road. Patients had never heard rural music at length before, save for occasionally passing by the open door of an inn while travelling. She could not understand the words fully, as they were in a local dialect that was lost on her. The melody, however, was low and vivacious. There seemed to be a sort of call-and-response aspect to it, with a strong tenor voice ringing out and the others answering en masse. They were not alone, being accompanied by other riders and small vehicles from the village. Patience, peering about, caught sight of the vicar, Gertrude, Imogen and Cassandra among the expectant faces. The whole of the village was relying on this harvest, and its completion was a time of great celebration and relief. At the head of the procession a young man stood out. He wore a wide straw hat, and though his cheeks were ruddy, there was an unmistakable sheen of pride to his aspect this merry morning. He wore a red kerchief about his neck, and a sprig of wheat had been pinned to his lapel. The crowd of harvesters approached the waiting carriage and riders. The young man at the head of the column glanced up shyly as the procession came to a halt and the singing died off. Where be the harvest master? the duke called out into the expectant hush. The young man, hesitating, was nearly shoved forward by older hands behind him. Ha, here I be, your grace, he stammered, quickly taking a knee. Come and claim your prize and our gratitude, the duke replied. Timidly, the young man came forward, and with hands red from the morning scrubbing, accepted a silver coin that the Duke handed to him. This was, in addition to wages he earned, a bonus for leading the harvesters in their duties for the past weeks. The harvest master was elected by his fellow labourers, with the tradition being that he was a young fellow with a strong back and trying to win the heart of a young lady. The coin paid out by the Duke was usually the last bit a young man needed to secure enough funds to wed his sweetheart. True enough, Patience spotted the harvest master glancing over his shoulder to a milkmaid with pink cheeks and her hair in a long braid down her back. 
The sight of this simple affection gladdened Patience's heart. She couldn't help but glance over to Tom, who watched the spectacle with a quiet bemusement. As there was now a duchess in residence, the first in over a decade, there was another part to be played in this centuries-old ritual. Shyly, the harvest master stepped up to the carriage, sweeping his hat off his head and revealing a shock of bright red hair. I'm... I'm ready to serve, Your Grace, he said quietly to Annabella, who smiled down at him like an indulgent mother. Rising from her seat, she beckoned the young man closer and leaned down, pressing a kiss to his forehead, then passed him a fine white handkerchief that she herself had embroidered. This set the poor fellow to blushing so intensely that it reached the tips of his ears. Patience pressed her fingers to her mouth to conceal a laugh, but this was proved unnecessary. In the next moment, the harvest master turned around and the assembled sent up a laughing cheer. Thus blessed, they turned and began to file into the field. So, what do you make of our rural custom, Tom? Annabella asked, settling herself back in. She nodded benevolently to the harvesters as they passed, smiling down at the children who looked up at her shyly. I'm actually quite charmed by it, Tom said. There's a kind of pastoral simplicity that I admire. They rise, they know what the day holds, and they turn their hands to it. Is it your work that you admire or their jugs of cider? The Duke teased. Tom grinned, leaning forward and resting one arm on the neck of his horse. Well. I'll own that, no mistake. It's a fine scrumpy you press on your estate, and I'm looking forward to it. Nay, your lordship, a field hand said, overhearing and pausing. He was a man with a face creased by sun and work. He grinned up at Tom, a glazed clay jug of cider balanced on one of his shoulders. Judging by the rosy tint to his cheeks, Patience suspected he had already been sampling his cargo, and thus spoke with the aid of liquid courage. The first press of ciders, the remit of the field workers. Of course, he added with a sly grin, should your lordship wish to join us, we might see clear to giving you a tipple. Tom sat up straight in the saddle again, peering down at the man. Patience waited with bated breath. This was a test of Tom's character, whether his pride and vanity would allow him to be challenged in such a manner. To Patience's, and apparently everyone else's, great surprise, Tom broke into an easy smile, kicked his feet free of the stirrups, and slid out of the saddle. A few more of the field hands noticed his sudden dismount and paused to watch as he unbuttoned his jacket and threw it over the saddle, leaving him in only a shirt. Patience inhaled sharply, for his shirt was quite open at the neck, being without a cravat and stock to hold it closed. His collarbones peaked from the open slit. He seemed unbothered by this, which was almost as much of a shock to Patience. Taking his horse's reins in one hand, he passed the carriage and hitched it to the gatepost, placing his hat atop. The field hand, carrying the jug of cider on his shoulder, laughed, and a few others whooped encouragement, clapping Tom on the back. Tom grinned back at them, and Patience had a glimpse of the boy he must have been. With unconcerned movements, he began rolling his cuffs, revealing his forearms. This was more than Patience had ever seen of a man, and she found that her mouth was suddenly dry and she had difficulty swallowing. Annabella too seemed surprised, for she murmured a low, Oh my. Patience watched, transfixed as Tom set off across the field, surrounded by fraternal slaps on the back and playful jests. The other field hands had already begun lifting the bundles of wheat onto their shoulders, ferrying them to a massive waiting cart. The sun had at last broken above the tree line, and the field was no longer a dull yellow, but rich gold. Before he bent to the task at hand, Tom turned, a grin still lifting one side of his mouth. His hair, long enough to cover his forehead and ears, was caught by a breeze and ruffled. Patience thought she might faint there and then from the sight. She'd read countless descriptions of romantic heroes, everyone from princes to pure-hearted shepherds but she'd had no real notion of what the words meant until this moment. Tom's casual grace coupled with the shining sun was more than Patience had ever considered. She knew she was staring, and for once in her life she could not have cared less what anyone thought. 
as if feeling her gaze on him, Tom's eyes locked onto hers. He still smiled, but something languid and warm passed over his face when he saw Patience. Time slowed as they shared this moment, the harvest songs and shouts as the children threw their stones, the last patch of wheat simply fading from existence. Patience didn't know what the future held for her, but she knew without a doubt that she would always treasure this morning. Chapter 29 the sun was warm and Tom's shoulder ached. Though the wheat wasn't particularly heavy on its own, the repeated weight was enough to wear out any man. It was not helped by the fact that it became a de facto contest among the young men to see who could take the most bundles at once to the cart. Tom acquitted himself well, but graciously admitted defeat when an ox of a farm boy managed to take seven at once without flinching. Still, Tom found that he did not mind the throbbing in his shoulder or the stiffness in his arms, he could not remember feeling so satisfied with his physical efforts. Though many of the workers were wary at first at a nobleman being among them, they warmed up quickly when they realised that he was sincere in his offer of help. Tom had never given them much credence, passing over them as they were part of the scenery rather than actual people. He had a real mind for intrigue, and he was delighted to learn that these people too had a complex web of relationships and romantic schemes. He was also quite tickled to see that, unlike the society he had been brought up in, the young men made no bonies about their regard for this maid or that. They boasted openly, showing off and poking fun at their fellows. The young ladies too flirted shamelessly, waving kerchiefs and egging on their exploits, laughing at the more ridiculous among them. Tom was no revolutionary, he believed firmly in the natural order of society. But he could not help but wonder if there was something the ton missed out on by being so circumspect. The cart was fully loaded by midday, the wheat piled high. Children clamoured over it, jumping up and landing flat on their bottoms, sending dust and bits of straw floating on the breeze. When it was packed tightly, a young lady stepped forward and was helped to top the wagon. She wore a crown of plaited straw, but from her expression it may as well have been gold. This was the Harvest Queen, a comely lass from the village with dark eyes and dark blonde hair. When she was settled, the workers let out another whoop, and they set off back down the lane whence they came. Tom allowed himself to be swept along, pausing to retrieve his horse and lead him on. The cart creaked along, pulled by two massive dray horses, the workers following in its wake. It would be paraded down through the village, to the massive stone barn where the arduous threshing would be done once the wheat had finished drying a bit more. Tom peeled away from the procession, despite invitations to join the workers for a midday repast. Once alone again, Tom did not bother remounting Brutus, but led him down the drive to the Duke's manor house. This was the slowest that Tom had chosen to move down the country roads and lanes since he had left boyhood. It was as if it were a new experience, and each new thing sparked a quaint sort of wonder. The breeze ruffled the changing leaves becomingly, and the last of the season's songbirds flitted along hither and thither. He had mocked Patience's appreciation for the beauty of everyday life, but she had awoken in him a desire to experience things for himself. Not that he intended to cast off the trappings of high society entirely. He was still fond of a well-cut coat, and the notion of a night at the theatre nearly made his mouth water. But these past weeks had made Tom question what it was in life that he truly enjoyed. He'd taken a hard look at his life, and found there were aspects that simply did not engender joy. To his surprise, he found that he even enjoyed labouring out of doors. It was a good sort of tiredness in his limbs, one that was accompanied by a sense of pride. He owed much of this new philosophy to Patience. He wished to repay her kindness, and also to introduce her to all of the pleasures that London had to offer the ton. She was a completely blank slate, and Tom had no doubt that she would find many things that struck her fancy. This thought brought a smile to his face. Watching her face light up with joy and wonder at all of the new things he would show her was a prospect that delighted him. Tom's steps slowed for a moment as he passed under the oaks that shaded the long drive. 
This was the first time he had considered what a future with patients might look like. Truthfully, he'd never considered a future with any woman. He'd been too busy having fun, focused on the present without a jot of thought for what might be. Patience was different, though. She was unimpeachably honest, and her years spent only with herself for company had given her a strong sense of self. He doubted that he would ever be bored with her. That much was for certain. God's teeth. Do you really mean to make an offer for patience? His mind demanded of his heart. Without question, his heart beat in response, and Tom knew that to be true in the way that he knew his own name. There was only one problem. There was no guarantee that he would have that option. His future may have been decided for him, arranged while he was away from London. It was not outside of the realm of possibility that his father and Lady Stanton would have come to some sort of an arrangement. He would scarcely be the first nor the only headstrong son to have his affairs settled for him and be told whom to marry. That thought settled like a black cloud across his previously merry mood. He could feel a scowl forming on his face. He had fully stopped in the middle of the lane, the gravity and folly of his life to this point, fully weighing on him as it never had before. The idea of having to wed against his will had always been a sort of background dread that he simply ignored. He'd never considered that he may have to do so instead of marrying someone he wished to. Brutus impatiently nudged Tom's back with his nose, nearly knocking Tom off balance. He turned back to the horse, who stood churlishly looking at him, no doubt eager to have his saddle taken off at last. Tom sighed and began to walk up the lane with more purpose again. If I were a wise man, I would simply stay far, far away from patience for both our sakes, he lamented to himself. He emerged from the shaded lane then, the wide circular drive in front of the manor spreading out like a white river. Across the immaculate lawns, the tables that had been set out the night before were now covered with simple white tablecloths. Tom paused, blinking in the bright light. A flock of maids swarmed about the tables, straightening chairs and tablecloths. A pair worked in tandem, lifting the white linens as they unfolded and letting them catch the air as they settled on the tables. Movement caught his eye, a spot of colour among the black and white maids' uniforms. It was Lady Patience, having changed into a daydress of amber, the colour of the last leaves of autumn. It was in the new romantic style, with a gathered neck and puffed sleeves that tapered to her wrists. She wore no chemisette under it, and her neck rose up elegantly, white and long as a swan's. About her waist, a belt of gold ribbon with indigo-coloured flowers embroidered on it was pulled tight, accentuating her figure. Though she had dressed for the day, her hair was still in the same simple style of this morning, her long braid simply coiled at the back of her head. Several short locks of hair contrived to escape the hairpins, falling becomingly about her face. In one arm she carried a small jar with a flower arrangement, blooms of yellow and purple. Tom jerked to a halt again, which caused Brutus to snort and stamp in frustration, so close to the promise of a good brushing and sweet hay. Tom felt rooted to the spot, his feet simply refusing to obey him. It was positively unnatural to simply move past this scene of such pastoral, organic charm. Tom had never once wished to be French in his entire life, but now he felt himself idling, wishing that he was. Surely they had a word for this type of moment, this scene of simple, ideal beauty. Patience bent to place the jar of flowers on one of the tables, straightened and raised her hand to her forehead, brushing some hair back. Looking about to survey the progress, she espied Tom standing and watching in the middle of the drive. She ducked her head demurely, looking for all the world like a bashful statue of Persephone. Entranced, Tom started forward again, pausing quickly to shrug into his forgotten jacket. He was still fighting with the sleeves as he stepped forward, his eyes never leaving patience. You survived the harvest then? she asked softly, still a little abashed. I did, he said, looking her over boldly. There was a tiny yellow flower that had gotten tangled in her hair, and without thinking, Tom deftly reached up and plucked it free. Patience looked up, eyes wide and round. 
He held the flower up between his thumb and forefinger, and Patience laughed breathily and accepted it. Here, she said, turning aside and finding one of the simple tin cups being set out for the harvest supper. She glanced over her shoulder once, as if to ensure that Tom was still there, and then filled the cup from a ceramic jug of cool water set out for the servants. Shyly, she passed it to Tom, who accepted it gratefully. That's quite refreshed me, thank you, he said, returning the cup. Patience tilted her head a little, regarding Tom again in all his dishevelled glory. What's this? No snide commentary about the rustic nature of drinking water from a humble cup? Tom shrugged. I am attempting to embrace your philosophy. Oh, and what is that? Patience asked, stepping around him to continue her task of arranging the flowers. There was a wheeled tray of them set out, and she lifted another jar and headed towards an empty table. I am asking myself what it is that I like. What it is that I want, he said. Patience stopped short, slightly bent at the waist as she set a jar of flowers down. The emphasis had obviously not been lost on her. In short, I am attempting to break free of expectation, my own and the tons. Slowly, Patience straightened and turned to him. In the spirit of complete honesty, I must confess that I am taking a leaf from your book as well. Oh? Yes, she said, her pink lips curling up in a smile. I am attempting to enjoy what's before me. My experiences are few, and I should like to change that. I wish to know as much about life and what it holds as I can. Lady Patience Carnegie, intrepid explorer, Tom teased, returning her smile. They stayed in this attitude for some time, sharing a moment of genuine camaraderie and friendship. Abruptly, Patience turned away, as if remembering that she had a task to complete. Are you looking forward to the harvest supper? she asked. I am, he replied, particularly as it means that I shall get to sit next to you at the head table. With that, Tom turned away, grinning a little mischievously. He had always enjoyed making a memorable exit and he had little doubt that making such an overt flirtation was a memory that Patience would entertain for quite some time. Chapter 30 The harvest supper began as it had for centuries. The people from the village, the labourers, the farmers and their families all came up the lane in a great procession. They were accompanied by more song and joviality, with the younger ones gambling about. At the head of the column, the harvest master and the harvest queen lead them, both holding aloft the last of the wheat harvested. It had been tied with green ribbons, supplied by the duchess. When the column of people had arrived to the lawns where the tables were set up, a reverent hush fell over the crowd. Deliberately, with great care, the harvest master and queen stepped forward to the head table, which was taller than the others. Behind it, the Duke and Duchess had risen from their fine back chairs and waited. If one did not know Annabella well, it would have been impossible to tell that she was nervous. From Patience's viewpoint to her right, she could see the tightness in her sister's shoulders. As if it were a religious artefact, the bundle of wheat was laid before the Duke and Duchess for their inspection. The Duke nodded his acceptance, and in a great voice so that all could hear, he asked, is the harvest complete, harvest master? It is, Your Grace, the lad replied, looking with some apprehension directly into the Duke's face. This was the first and only time that such a liberty could be taken, without him needing to doff his hat or pull his forelock. Today they were equals, if only for a few hours. Taking her cue, Annabella offered the harvest master a tankard of beer, and the harvest queen a smaller mug of mead made from the honey of the hives kept in her own gardens. I bid you welcome to the harvest supper, she said in a steady voice that betrayed none of her nerves. Eat plenty, drink deeply and be merry. You are all to be congratulated and have our gratitude. With that, a great cheer went up and the crowd began finding seats in a great hurry of activity. Patients could practically feel the relief pouring off Annabella her duty discharged. Hidden by the table, Patience reached down and squeezed Annabella's fingers. 
Annabella turned and sent her a grateful smile, then resumed her seat. Patience followed suit, her eyes glancing down the table to where Lord Tom sat. Despite his assumption that he would be next to her, he had been placed at the Duke's left hand, no doubt in the hopes of guaranteeing good behaviour. Still, Patience let her gaze linger down the table, hoping to catch his eye before she sat. He seemed to have the same notion, and when their eyes met, Patience could feel her cheeks growing warm. When everyone was seated, a procession of footmen began ferrying out platter after platter of food. The star of the feast was undoubtedly a whole roasted pig, carried in on a pole on the shoulders of two hall boys. Oh my, Patience murmured. She had never seen anything like this. Her own mother had been hands-off on the more personal aspects of running the estate. The traditions on the Brandon estate were long-seated and steeped in the history of the county. I know what you mean, Annabella replied. We are a very long way from London. It's positively medieval, Patience whispered. A cry broke out from one of the tables, accompanied by uproarious laughter and the slapping of the table. But it's undeniably charming too. Annabella smiled, surveying her tenants like a proud mother. It is that, she agreed. I had worried that they would not accept me, but so far they have been nothing but warm and cordial. Patience reached over and squeezed Annabella's hand. She was happy for her sister, truly. As the afternoon blurred into the evening, long torches were lit and stuck into the ground, and lanterns and candles were placed on the tables. One of the farmers broke out a fiddle, while another gave a few experimental notes on a wooden flute. This was all the encouragement the tenants needed to begin lifting the tables, shifting them to the sides, and forming a loose area for dancing. Eager and curious, Patience leaned forward. She had never seen country dancing before, having been schooled by dancing masters and only allowed to practice in approved settings. To her surprise, there was a great deal of physical contact. Waists were held, hands clasped continuously. The women were even lifted on occasion. Her eyes shone in waning evening light as she watched. What they lacked in grace, they more than made up for with enthusiasm and athleticism. She was sure she ought to find the display uncouth, but their joy was infectious, and Patience found herself clapping along in time with the music. When the sky was beginning to darken, the Duke and Duchess rose and with the arms linked, they made it a point to visit with some of the more prominent tenants. Patience was left at the table, but she did not feel alone. This was such a contrast with the bundle of nerves she had been when she arrived. Taking advantage of the suddenly open space, Tom slid across the chairs, settling in next to Patience. Instantly, she felt her cheeks flush, warming. She glanced over and found that he too was watching the dancing. Are you very shocked by the display? he asked with a grin. And here I was about to ask you the same thing, Patience replied, matching his grin. Tom chuckled under his breath. I imagine that they shall all have sore feet and heads tomorrow. Very likely, Patience agreed, though I am sure that they think it worth it. We shall be retiring soon, so enjoy the spectacle while you can, Tom said, nodding out toward the dancers. Oh? Oh yes, it's tradition that the Duke's family retires at eight o'clock sharp. The revellers carry on into the small hours, and then limp home with whatever food and drink they can carry, Tom explained. Right on cue, the stable clock began to chime out. Tom rose and offered Patience his elbow. She too stood and hesitatingly accepted it. Instinctually, she glanced about to see if anyone had noticed and disapproved. The only person who seemed to note this was Annabella, who only quirked her eyebrows. Patience allowed Tom to escort her inside following the Duke and Duchess. The procession was regal and dignified until the moment the door was shut and the bolt thrown. Then Annabella sagged, laying her head against the Duke's shoulder. Relieved, my dear, the Duke asked, looking down fondly at his wife. More than I can say, Annabella said. With a happy sigh, she bent and flung her shoes off. Not least because I can finally do that. 
The Duke chuckled, but lifted a finger and lectured her as if she were a schoolgirl. I am not asking. I am telling you that you should get right to bed. Annabella, her face tired by joyful, seemed inclined to agree. She looked to Patience, who had dropped Tom's arm the moment they were indoors. In fact, she had made it a point to stand some paces away from him across the marble-tiled foyer. Will you be able to fend for yourselves? Annabella asked, giving Patience a pointed look. Will you be all right alone with him? Was the silent question that she was really asking her. Oh, yes, Patience said readily. I might have a cup of tea and will likely retire myself. It has been a long day. This answer seemed to mollify Annabella, who inclined her head in assent. The Duke, meanwhile, was attempting to usher his wife upstairs. Annabella allowed herself to be squired away, twisting around once to look back at Patience again. Patience stood quietly, her hands folded behind her back. Her heart beat quickly, like a bird trapped within her chest. I shall send Mary in to ensure that you needn't ring for anything, Annabella called backward. This was only right and proper, ensuring that Patience and Tom were not left unchaperoned. Whatever their relation or familiarity, it was important that these things be observed. The Duke, however, clearly could not give a fig about these assurances at this moment. Having grown tired of his wife's procrastinating, he simply bent and scooped her up his arms beneath her back and her bent knees. Annabella, duly surprised, gave a little squeak but obligingly wrapped her arms about her husband's neck. Content, she laid her head against his shoulder and allowed him to bear her away. Thus Patience and Tom were left quite alone, standing carefully apart, both with their hands behind their backs. The foyer was dim, the light outside having faded, and only a few candles being lit so far. Pointedly, Patience avoided making eye contact with Tom. She feared that if she did, she would give way entirely to so far unnamed sentiments. A strange little thrill went through her, very much like the kind she would experience when sneaking about the house at night. After a few minutes of silence, Patience finally dared a look at Tom. She was unsurprised to find him looking right back at her, with a bemused, almost coy look. Does something amuse my lord? Patience asked archly. Tom gave an elegant little shrug. Just wondering what is happening inside that head of yours. Oh, Patience asked, turning and sauntering away slowly, but tipping her head in such a way that indicated Tom should follow. And here I thought I was a transparent little country girl. To my great surprise, Tom said, lengthening his stride to catch up to her. I am finding that I may have been wrong on a number of points regarding country pursuits. Have you indeed? Patience responded blithely, turning left into the front parlour. That is good to hear, if it makes you happy. It does, Tom agreed. Of course I still find that more urbane pursuits still have their charms. Patience laughed briefly. Of that I have no doubt one cannot expect a tiger to wholly change his spots. A tiger, am I? Tom said, his grin widening a little so that more of his perfect white teeth were on display. Patience merely gave him a look and flopped in a rather unladylike fashion onto a settee, draping herself over the arm. There was a low fire going in the grate, and she contentedly stretched her feet out toward it, warming the soles of her shoes. Tom, watching this, seemed a little transfixed for a moment. At length, he shook himself a little and pulled the bell rope. When the footman appeared, Tom requested tea for himself and the lady, and asked that her maid be informed of their whereabouts. Patience, wearied from the doings of the day, smiled behind her closed eyes at the consideration for her. Cracking one eye open, she observed Tom, cutting quite a figure next to the mantel. He had leaned one arm atop it and crossed his long legs at the ankle. Feeling her eyes on him, his gaze shifted to her and a mercurial smile lighted on his face again. Yes, my lady, he inquired. Caught. Patience blushed a little, but recovered. Just wondering at what all of your Tony friends would think of you working in a wheat field. Likely they wouldn't believe you, Tom laughed. Mary entered the parlour then, bearing a tea tray. 
She looked a little disgruntled, her mouth a straight line. Patience felt a pang of guilt at pulling her away from the festivities. It seemed entirely likely that there was a farmer's son that she was sweet on, given the longing glances that she shot toward the windows on occasion. Thank you, Mary, dear, Patience said, straightening. The light in here is so poor, I don't want you to strain your eyes, she continued, all innocence as she began pouring tea. Why don't you sit over by the window where the light is a little better? There are so many torches out there, it casts a merry glow. Mollified, Mary bobbed a hasty curtsy and eagerly complied. She settled herself quickly in a chair and promptly began to pretend that she was studiously darning something. In reality, she was looking out the window with moonlike eyes. Glancing up, Patience saw that Tom had caught on to this as well, and he was studiously concentrating on not laughing. Pursing her lips, Patience did her best to not betray their amusement either. Well, since I've already been very brave and duly expanded my horizons, Tom said, lifting a teacup, how about you try something new tonight as well? Chapter 31 Of all the entertainments that Tom had enjoyed throughout the harvest celebration, he was hard-pressed to find one as amusing as the stricken look that Patience gave him. To her credit, she did her best to smooth her features over, determined to not appear concerned. Oh? she asked faintly. And what did you have in mind? Unable to help himself, Tom bit down on a grin and stepped closer, lowering his voice. A most wicked pursuit, he said with a quirk of his brows, one that many respectable dowagers disapprove of most heartily. Patience's breath hitched visibly and with wide eyes she stared up at him. She did not shy away entirely, and Tom felt a little swell of pride at her newfound bravery. Of course, he also did not miss the little glance that she shot to the maid. I'm... are you... she began. Tom interrupted her, pulling a deck of cards from the inner pocket of his jacket with a flourish. Patience blinked rapidly for a moment, then burst into amused laughter. You cad, she said, playfully swatting him on the arm, which only made Tom grin wider. You have opened my eyes to the delights of simple pastimes. Now allow me to corrupt you with the wicked games of London, he said, tilting his head to a card table toward the back of the parlour. Patience rose and followed him, and he helped her to a chair. She watched with rapt attention as he shuffled, her eyes following the quick movements of his hands. Tom was keen to show off for her, so he added little flourishes and flicks of the cards, demonstrating his dexterity. He was feeling rather proud of himself and his skills when Patience wryly said, Well, you have certainly done nothing to dissuade the assumption that you have spent many an hour around the card table. Tom attempted to give her a withering look, but he found her expression of bemusement too adorable to really commit to it. Do you know how to play any games? he asked, tapping the cards back into order on the edge of the table. Not really, Patience admitted. It wasn't something really taught by my governess or tutors. Ah, good, Tom said with another tap of the deck. This means that you haven't any questionable habits and that we shan't quarrel over any differences in rules. Grown men quibble over card games frequently then, Patience asked, sceptical. You'd be surprised, Tom muttered. Now, as there are only the two of us, and, he said, sliding his eyes over to Mary, I don't expect your maid is a gambling woman. There is only one game to be played, piquet. Piquet? Patience repeated as if tasting the word. Very well, I await the master's instructions. Tom chuckled a little and quickly ran through the dealing and basic rules. Patience asked no questions, merely sitting up straight in her chair, her hands folded in her lap. Her eyes, however, were alive with interest, dancing over the table and following the cards. Her rapt attention was gratifying to Tom, and he was pleased to discover that she was a quick study. In fact, she declared that she was ready to play, and Tom obliged, dealing out a dozen cards to each of them. Her face was serious as she looked at the hand dealt to her and her indigo-hued eyes flicked up to Tom 
who had not even looked at his yet. Caught off guard, Tom quickly scooped up his own cards and attempted to focus. To his great surprise, Patience did not hesitate or dawdle as many novice players did. She was decisive, watching carefully as the cards were traded and shown. Her face was serene even, as Tom announced his best suit, and she looked him square in the eye when her turn came. No good, she said coolly, with only the barest upturn of her chin indicating her triumph. Tom resisted the urge to frown. He had not expected Patience to be such a quick study, and found that she was more than able to keep up with him. The fact that she had an eager, clever mind only intrigued him further. I had not anticipated you to be such a dab hand with cards, he said, rearranging his hand. And why is that? Well, Tom said, hedging his words carefully, it is outside of your realm of experience. True she acknowledged, studying her own cards. But then, I am in the habit of learning things for myself. Is that what you do in the library for days on end? Three cards? he said, placing three in his hand to the side and picking up three more. Certainly it is, Patience said, reaching to trade two of her own cards. I have taught myself the nesting habits of pheasants, Greek philosophy, and memorised the steps of the gallop walzer. A waltz? Why, I am shocked, Tom said in mock outrage, placing a hand to his chest. I very much doubt that, Patience said, and with a flourish laid out her hand. I believe that is my trick, she added unnecessarily. Tom simply stared for a moment. It was indeed a victory for Patience, who was doing her best to look magnanimous in her triumph. Staring up from the green felt of the card table was a trick of six cards beginning with a king. It was a hand that anyone would be jealous of, yet she had shown no sign of it, her face betraying nothing during the play. Aware that his mouth was hanging open a little, Tom snapped it shut. And now I see why ladies are not encouraged to play piquet, he muttered darkly, reaching for a slip of paper and a tiny pencil to note down Patience's score. I've won then? Patience asked leaning back in her chair and tossing her head a little. This round goes to you, Tom agreed. How very unexpected. I had no idea you had such a good hand, you gave no sign at all. Patience gave a little shrug, a cat-like grin on her face. Ladies are very practised in hiding their inner selves from the world, she said, passing her cards over to Tom. Perhaps that is the real reason we aren't encouraged to gamble. Tom, not for the first time during their game, found himself staring at Patience. He was half leaned over the table, gathering up the cards, arrested in the movement. She had a divinely sweet face, cherubic even, with her round eyes and demure little mouth. It was only now that Tom realised that it was likely harbouring a streak of unyielding cleverness. It also seemed that Patience was aware of this, knew that her youth and her delicate face and bearing meant that people would continually underestimate her. Why, Lady Patience, Tom said, half teasing and half awed. You little mercenary thing, you. Patience blushed, ducking her head a little to the side and laughed. Very well, then, he continued, putting the cards back in order. How about we make this more interesting, then? You mean, actually wagering? Patience said lowering her voice and leaning forward. I'm not sure I have anything... No, no, I would never be so crass as to suggest you wager something as common as money, Tom said, lifting his chin and wrinkling his nose aristocratically. I propose we play for something of much greater value. Oh, and what is that? she asked faintly. A kiss, Tom said, staring across the table at her. If I win, you bestow a kiss upon me. Patience's eyebrows shot up, her eyes widening. Automatically, her eyes darted to the maid, who was slumped over in her chair, snoring softly. Tom watched her carefully, fully prepared for her to back down, even to leap up from the table and storm off. It was an audacious ask, and he suggested it mostly as a means of testing her. It was certainly not because he wanted an excuse to kiss her. Never mind that the thought of winning had warmed him all over. To his pleasant surprise, Patience cleared her throat and scooted her chair a little closer to the table. 
I accept your terms, she said unflinching. But if I win, I want something of equal value. Oh ho, Tom said, smirking across the table. And what might that be? Patience hesitated before speaking, her eyes sweeping over his face. I want you to tell me why you were sent away from London. Tom's stomach did a little flip. His first inclination was panic, peppered with a healthy dose of irritation. He took a deep, steadying breath, taking a moment to consider. She had a right to know, he supposed, and part of him did want it simply out in the open. Perhaps it would be the first step in a kind of accountability. But he also was afraid it could very well mean the end of whatever complicated flirtatious dance he was doing with patience. He locked eyes with her, contemplating. She stared right back at him, unflinching, her face barely illuminated with the scant couple of candles in the room, and the fire burned low. I accept, he found his mouth saying without quite realising it. It's worth the risk, he thought, nearly hypnotised as he watched her lips curl ever so slightly into a smile. Tom shook his head a little, discreetly poking himself in the thigh, hard. He could not afford to get distracted. With renewed focus, he began dealing out the requisite twenty-four cards in batches of three. They played silently this time the only sound being the whisper of the cards across the felt-top table and the occasional soft snore from Mary. Tom glanced down at his hand, his breath catching in his throat. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. He declared his position cautiously, then hoping against hope exchanged three cards. When he picked them up, it was all he could do to stop himself from crowing in triumph. He locked eyes with patience and one by one began laying them out. Huitiem, he murmured softly. Almost as an afterthought, he added, Pique. Patience stared down at the table for a moment, her throat moving as she swallowed. Her lips parted as if she meant to say something, but instead simply looked at Tom. He smiled at her and slowly, deliberately, stood from the table. Approaching her carefully, as if she were a fawn that might be startled off, Tom held out his hand to her. Patience automatically reached out to accept, but hesitated, drawing her hand back a little, the delicate fingers curling slightly. A glance up at him, and then she placed her hand in his, their palms barely touching. Lifting her hand, Tom encouraged her to stand, reaching down for her other hand with his. He pressed in closer to her, staring down at her. To his surprise, and his delight. She did not look up at him in fear or apprehension, but with a warm, accepting curiosity. With the same slow, deliberate movements, Tom lifted her hands and placed them against his chest, trapping them there with one hand. Lifting his free hand, he delicately touched the edge of Patience's jaw, his fingers feather light. Obligingly, Patience lifted her head slightly, and Tom ghosted his fingers along her face to gently hold her chin. They were standing so close together that there was scarcely a breath between them. Tom leaned in closer, impulsively, irresistibly running his thumb over her lower lip, which pouted like an overripe rose. They were so close now that their noses were almost touching, not even enough space for a whisper between them. Patience's large blue eyes fluttered closed languidly at last for which Tom was grateful. He was in very great danger of falling forward and drowning in them if he was not careful. Patience was standing perfectly still, but he could feel how taut she was, like a bowstring. Patience, he murmured, barely audible. Her eyes opened, heavy-lidded. I will not kiss you like this, he said. Patience's eyes flew open, and Tom dropped his hands, releasing her and stepping back. It was a Herculean effort, that single step feeling as if he had anchors tied to his feet. Even though the light was low, he could clearly see the blush spreading over her cheeks. Her eyes shone with emotion, and she simply stared at him for a moment. Tom was not sure if she was disappointed, offended, or relieved. It was entirely possible that she was all three. 
Suddenly Patience was looking down and away, swallowing hard again. Crossing her arms over herself, she rubbed her upper arms a couple of times as if she were cold. The moment between them was broken, and Tom couldn't help but immediately regret his words. He didn't know how to explain to her that he didn't want a stolen kiss as payment for a silly debt in a dark parlour. He wanted her to want to kiss him in the open, in daylight. He had made the bet partly as a jest, but when she had accepted. But that was gone now. Patience loudly cleared her throat and addressed the maid. Mary, I am ready to retire to my couch now. Would you bring a light upstairs? The maid awoke with a snort, starting and automatically standing before she was fully aware, as evidenced by the sleepy blinking. I bid you good night, Lord Tom. Thank you for a, an evening, Patience finished abruptly, bobbing a hasty curtsy without looking at Tom. The maid had already crossed the parlour and opened the door for Patience, and stood waiting there with a candlestick and waning taper. Tom had the strangest feeling that he had erred greatly, probably in more ways than one this evening. Patience had already turned away, and was about to leave when Tom impulsively snared her about the wrist. I wait, no, let me explain, he began. That is hardly necessary. Thank you for the lesson, Patience said without looking at him. Her voice sounded strange, hard and brassy. It was unclear as to what she was referring to, if it were the cards or something else. Pulling her arm free, Tom allowed her hand to slip through his, resisting the urge to grasp her fingers. There was nothing for him to do but to watch her go, and to regret. Chapter 32 The sounds of revelry had at last completely died out, but sleep still eluded patience. She did not even bother tossing and turning, resignedly laying flat on her back and staring up at the canopy of her bed. Against the dark fabric, visions of the evening played out again and again. She could not help but analyse them to the minutest degree, trying to ascertain the meaning of what exactly had happened. None of it made sense, which only added to the crushing sense of confusion and disappointment. To her, Admittedly inexperienced mind, Tom had been blatantly flirtatious with her the whole of the day. He had given every sign that he wished to, well, patience wasn't entirely sure what, but his attentions had been noted. They had been right at the precipice of a kiss, which she ought to have been shocked by, but instead found herself longing for. It was outrageously improper for a young lady to feel these things, she knew this, but it couldn't be helped. The only conclusion that she could reach for hours was that she had erred egregiously in some way. She had been too clumsy, had not responded correctly. This was a dance of which she was completely ignorant of the steps involved. She had no idea how to flirt, how to make her interest known. This was nothing like the romances she liked to read, where everyone just somehow knew where to put their affections. As the clock in the hall began to chime the fourth hour, Patience let out a large groan. There is another possibility, her mind whispered to her. You know his reputation. You know what everyone says about him. He's not like that anymore, she muttered up to the bed drapes. Even as the words left her mouth, they could not completely root out the seed of doubt that was planted in her stomach. This is likely a rehearsed scene for him, one that he has played out dozens of times. Why shouldn't he have used this trick to steal kisses from other ladies? The logical side of her brain argued back. It's... surely I would have seen... She tried to protest, her voice small. Your own sister tried to warn you about him. There was no arguing with that particular point. Annabella had been exceedingly fair to Tom during his stay, doing her utmost to be civil. They had even built a tenuous rapport. Annabella would have had no reason to warn Patience off of him, other than her care for her sister, and Patience had blithely ignored her. Why Patience had ever thought that she knew better than her sister, when she'd had no experience of the world, was beyond her now. Frustration, desperation swirled together in Patience's breast until she couldn't stand it any longer. With her right hand, she grasped for one of the lush feather pillows and pressed it tightly to her face. Suitably muffled, 
she indulged in something she didn't think she had ever done before. She screamed into it, giving voice to all of the pent-up anger from years of loneliness and crushed hopes. There was a decided atmosphere at breakfast. The servants were all moving slowly. Annabella doubted that some of them had been to bed at all. She had contemplated staying abed herself. It was the Duchess right, after all, and she had been sorely tempted. There was much to be done, however, and it was more in her character to simply get up and get on with the day. Putting the estate back in order following the harvest supper was almost as much work as preparing for it. Annabella was suitably distracted then, when Patience made her appearance. She replied quietly when Annabella greeted her, but that was not unusual, especially given that it had been a very late night for her. The Duke, as was his habit, was already buried in the newspaper, occasionally remarking things out to his wife and the table at large. Seems the Regent's in a bit of a spat with his wife again, the Duke said offhandily. Not entirely sure how that qualifies as news any more these days. It's entirely an unsurprising turn of events, Annabella agreed. I suppose people are bored with Napoleon and they must sell their newspapers. The Duke hummed an agreement and turned the page. Annabella looked across the table to Patience, who was staring down intently at her plate. I hope that I can count on your help, Patience, darling, to get things organised today. Patience did not answer merely poked the food on her plate with her fork. Patience, Annabella asked, raising her voice slightly. Startled, Patience looked up and about the table. Hmm? What? Oh, yes, she answered distractedly, and immediately went back to scooting her food around her plate. Annabella frowned a little. She looked a little closer at Patience, noting the dark circles about her eyes and the simple way her hair was put up. That could all have been easily explained, as it had been a rather hectic day yesterday, and Annabella could not be sure when Patience had retired last night. Still, there was something else that nagged at Annabella. She could not quite place her finger on it, but she had a suspicion that there was more to Patience's fugue than mere fatigue. She was in the midst of trying to figure out a way to delicately ask Patience if something had happened yesterday when Lord Tom appeared. Annabella was not even aware that he was in the room at first, for she was studying patience. It was a most curious thing. Seemingly unconsciously, patience straightened up and looked about. When she spotted Tom, she looked down hastily again. Annabella watched all of this happen, fascinated and suspicious all at once. Her eyes turned to observe Lord Tom's reaction. He coloured briefly, high on his sharp cheekbones then reached up to self-consciously straighten his tie. Good morning, all, he said in a voice that resounded with forced evenness. Good morning, the Duke replied from behind his newspaper. Annabella said nothing, her eyes shifting between Tom and Patience. She had suspected for some weeks that some kind of tendra had been brewing on the part of Patience, and that it might lead to trouble of some kind. She had tried to warn her off of Tom as gently as she could, not wishing to completely dash the girl's hopes. She had also hoped, perhaps naively, that Lord Tom would not notice and would not act upon this affection. Tom, meanwhile, was dithering in the doorway a little, as if he were unsure of where to go. His habit had been to sit at the foot of the table, far from everyone else. Now, though, he walked to the chair and then passed it as if he meant to sit on the side of the table next to Annabella, across from Patience. "'Shall you breakfast with us?' the Duke said pointedly, regarding Tom with a look over his newspaper. "'Yes, I was just—' "'Yes,' Tom said, moving to the other side of the table with a set jaw in spite of his hesitating words. With a flourish, he pulled out the chair next to Patience and settled into it. It took all of Annabella's training as a shopkeeper to keep her eyebrows from shooting all the way up into her hair. This was all the confirmation that she needed. Why else would Tom have chosen to sit there, today of all days? Would you all please excuse me? I, I have rather a headache, Patience announced, practically leaping from her chair the moment that Tom was seated. Tossing down her napkin, she carefully avoided the eyes of all at the table, 
sweeping from the room as quickly as politeness would allow. The Duke's newspaper crinkled a little as he folded it back a little to regard Annabella. Is she all right, do you think? he asked, tilting his head toward the open doorway that Patience had exited through. I'm sure she's just worn out from yesterday, Annabella replied. Though she spoke to the Duke, her eyes were firmly on Tom, who had the good sense to dip his head and look a little chagrined. Ah, the Duke nodded. He too turned to look at Tom. And what of you? Have you recovered from your efforts yesterday? Tom's head snapped up, and he looked down the table at the Duke, stricken. From the harvesting, the Duke pressed, I heard from Granger that you put in a commendable effort. Oh, Tom replied, sounding more than a bit relieved. That is good of him to say. He seems to think that you may have missed your calling as a farmer. What say you? Would you like to give up your London dandyism for an honest living? The Duke continued, unaware that he was making Tom shift uncomfortably in his chair. Annabella, however, watched him squirm with just a bit of relish. A tempting prospect, Tom answered softly. He glanced up at Annabella once again, then back down at his plate. Yes, she said, signalling to one of the footmen standing at attention by the wall that she was done. I imagine that's not the only tempting prospect to be had on the estate. With a last withering look at Tom, Annabella rose, kissed the Duke on the forehead, and followed after Patience. It was not difficult to find her, for Patience could only be in the library or her room. It proved to be the latter, nestled into the padded window seat again. That same massive volume was on the windowsill, open to a page that Patience was staring down at. A piece of her bronze-coloured hair had worked its way loose from the braid wrapped about the back of her head and fell forward. Not wishing to startle or disturb her, Annabella knocked softly on the door jamb as she entered the room proper. Patience? Is everything all right? Patience looked up listlessly, shrugging limply. I'm not sure, in all honesty, she admitted. You seemed in such high spirits yesterday, I hate to see you cast so down, Annabella said, sweeping forward to sit across from Patience. Please, tell me if I might help. There was only silence from Patience in reply, her eyes looking out the window, down to the book, and back out again. If one of the farmers has said something unkind to you, Patience shook her head, and Annabella's forehead creased, her suspicions beginning to get the better of her. Has Lord Tom done something to upset you? That caused Patience to look up sharply, then back out the window. Annabella sighed, leaning forward on one hand to tuck the errant lock of hair behind Patience's ear. She couldn't help but feel a little guilty on this score. She knew what sort of reputation Tom had, a rake and young buck of the fast set. But she had given him nearly free reign under roof because he was the Duke's cousin. She could have, should have warned Patience more clearly. She also understood that this was Patience's first exercise of the heart, and she would have to tread carefully with her approach. She didn't want to embarrass her sister after all. Patience, you mustn't think. What do you know of a Lady Eva Stanton? Patience interrupted abruptly, still looking out the window. Annabella had a hard time following this sudden shift in thought, and just stared for a moment. I'm... I'm not sure, she admitted. I see, Patience said, her shoulders slumping a little. I thought you might have, since she made an appearance at your dinner party. Annabella exhaled audibly through her nose. There were admittedly a lot of interlopers that evening. I'm also not overly familiar with much of the ton to be candid. Silence stretched between them, and Annabella felt increasingly like she had failed Patience. I can ask the Duke, if you like. He's far more likely to know. Absently, Patience nodded. Yes, thank you. Annabella was at the point of standing when Patience suddenly seized her arm. Discreetly, please, she added, looking up at Annabella with an expression of some anxiety. Of course, never you mind, Annabella reassured her. Annabella's eyes shifted over to the book in the windowsill, the one that Patience had clearly been poring over for some time. 
It was a copy of Burke's, unmistakably. The family trees and crests were impossible to miss. Of course, she thought. Patience had been preparing for society in the only way that she knew how. Annabella felt a stab of guilt for how little time she had been spending with Patience of late. She also believed that Patience was in desperate need of a distraction. I tell you what, she said with forced brightness, we've only a few days before the Duke's birthday ball, and I need the help of a clever young lady who can keep a secret. Who, me? Patience asked. Of course you, Annabella replied as if it were patently obvious. You did such a magnificent job with the harvest supper. Do you want me to organise the flowers again? Patience asked flatly. Heavens no, Annabella said. It so happens that I have engaged the services of a dance troupe to perform. These events frequently need a grand spectacle to highlight the evening. Is that why you went to London? Patience asked, her face showing a little more interest. Partly yes, Annabella admitted. They shall need to have accommodations arranged, and the Duke cannot know anything about it. They will also need to be smuggled up to the ballroom at the right moment. Annabella paused, waiting for Patience's reaction. Well? Patience couldn't help but smile just a little. Well, you do know how much I love a good intrigue. Annabella smiled in return and leaned over to briefly embrace Patience. Thank you so much. I can't tell you what a great help that is to me. She spoke truthfully and she hoped fervently that it would help to distract Patience. There was a modicum of doubt that persisted, however. Patience wore an air of sadness about her as heavy and enduring as an albatross about her neck. Chapter 33 It was a week of flurried preparations, with all hands to the proverbial wheel. This was a blessing and a boon to Patience, who found that life was infinitely more bearable if she had something to do. She had spent much of her life in idle boredom, and found unexpected pleasure in having something of practical value to occupy her thoughts. Annabella had been as good as her word, asking if the Duke had any knowledge of a Lady Eva Stanton. He had responded in the negative, but said that his father had spoken of the late Lord Stanton in less than flattering terms. It was the Duke's general impression that the widow Stanton had fallen on hard times, but he could not say for certain one way or the other. The daughter was an unknown quantity. Patience did not know what to do with this information, so she merely stored it away as if it were a pair of winter gloves, perhaps useful later, but impractical for daily life when not called for. She found that this approach was becoming more and more necessary lately. She had similarly placed that verboten evening with Tom into a box and promptly locked it away. It was easy enough to avoid thinking about him and shockingly easy to avoid him as a person as well. There was much to be done, and the estate was so large that she simply ensured that she was engaged elsewhere whenever it looked as if he might approach her. She had resumed her long, rambling walks whenever possible, and found that the crisp air did much to restore her spirits. Books, her traditional refuge, proved to be so once again. Patience felt as if she had lost all sense of herself over the past few weeks, and it was reassuring to indulge in these familiar pastimes again. The day of the ball was the coldest thus far in the season, with the first frost falling across the gardens and lawns, sparkling in the morning sun. The ladies rose early so that their hair might be dressed in the height of fashion with the application of curling tongs and papers. Annabella had promised to loan patients some jewels for the occasion, and was as good as her word. She had also gifted Patience a new ribbon to wear about her waist, the colour of old gold that she had meticulously worked in silk in a motif of little flowers and leaves. Despite her misery, it made Patience's heart glad to know that Annabella had not completely given up her art. Much as the ladies were, the ballroom had similarly been festooned in great swathes of silk and velvet. There was a grand chandelier of gilt and crystal, and the floors and windows reflected the light in a dazzling array. One wall was hung with big, framed mirrors, so that the room appeared much larger than it was. This also had the effect of making the guests look as if they were paintings come to life. 
Patience was finely arrayed in a gown of warm cream-coloured silk, with a velvet robing over it the colour of amber. She wore the new ribbon about her waist and a simple necklace of sapphires. Her hair was curled and pinned atop her head, showing off her long white neck. She could scarcely recognise herself when she looked in the mirror. A fashionable young lady with delicate features and sad eyes stared back at her. Downstairs, the occasional errant notes could be heard as the hired musicians had arrived and were tuning their instruments. The dancers had arrived earlier, and patients had seen that they were comfortably attended to downstairs. Their leader was a tall, elegant man with white blonde hair who spoke well, but patients had barely heard him. She sat at her dressing table idling, in spite of the hour growing later and later. The sun was beginning to fade, and guests would begin arriving soon, if they had not already. She knew that she would be expected downstairs to greet the arrivals along with the Duke and Duchess, but the thought was too much. It did not fill her with the usual anxiety, but a kind of stony emptiness. So she sat feeling more than ever like the cursed princess in a fairy tale, alone, in her tower, but this time a prison of her own making. This was supposed to be a trip for her to explore her new freedom, to experience more of life before she had to face society again. There is no night coming to save you. The realisation hit her like a thunderbolt, jolting her all the way to her core. This new knowledge made her heart beat faster, her limbs, once heavy with sadness, now prickling with electricity. Patience leapt up from her dressing table, her legs restless. She had spent so many years alone in the tomb-like rooms of her mother's house that she had never realised that she could save herself. This new determination was something that she had never experienced. She beheld herself in the full-length mirror of her dressing room, appraising herself anew. Eva Stanton may have been a greater beauty, but Patience had the inherent dignity and regal bearing of her mother. Her forebear had been kin to a king, after all. Patience reached for the headpiece that sat waiting for her on a velvet cushion, a beautiful warm gold in the shape of leaves with little sapphire flowers. She placed it on her head carefully and lifted her chin. I'm the daughter of a duke, she said slowly to her reflection, and I will not crumple to pieces at the first slight of a rake. And with that, she turned and marched from her dressing room through her apartments, out into the hallway, and down the stairs with her head held so high that she may well have been a queen. Tom was a firm believer in the notion of being fashionably late. As a rule, he never arrived somewhere on time if it could be helped. There was a long-running joke in London that this was because he spent so long fussing over his hair and toilette, but the real truth was that he liked to make an entrance. The feeling of all eyes on him, some envious, others approving, was heady and intoxicating. He enjoyed pulling up to this ball or that dinner in his high flyer pulled by a pair of spirited blood bay horses at the last possible moment. He carefully maintained his reputation as a Corinthian, and he knew that he cut quite a dash alighting from his vehicle. Not so tonight. No, he was as jumpy as a racehorse at the gates of Newmarket. For the first time in his life, he paid little mind to what he was wearing hurrying along the footman assigned to look after him. He did not even spend the usual ten minutes fussing about in the mirror with the knot and fall of his cravat. He was scarcely dressed before he was out the door of his apartments like a shot, not even caring if he scuffed his shined dancing pumps in his haste. Tom had resolved that tonight he would declare himself to patience and damn the consequences. He did not know what his future held, if he even still had any prospects to offer the daughter of a duke. He only knew that he did not care to contemplate a future without her. She was challenging, interesting, and kind. She made him laugh. She made him think. He had endeavoured to better himself simply for her sake. As a consequence of his alacrity, Tom found himself standing alone in the ballroom with only footmen for company. The musicians had not even begun playing yet. It took some effort to restrain himself from dashing back out and locating patients. More likely than not, she was hovering near Annabella and would make her way in shortly. With forced casualness, 
Tom folded his hands behind his back, strolling through the ballroom as if he had all the time in the world. When the first guests began piling in, Tom's heart nearly leapt into his throat. Though there were several eligible ladies that were clearly attempting to catch his eye, their dance cards dangling beguilingly from their wrists on green tassels, they may as well have been invisible for all that Tom cared. He had eyes for exactly one person tonight, and that was Patience. The ballroom was slowly filling, and the musicians began to pick out an unobtrusive air as the sounds of conversation and laughter began to swell. Still, Tom did not stop his prowling, his eyes always on the door for Patience's arrival. You're the Earl of Chester's boy, Mum, a plummy voice said next to Tom's elbow, startling him. He turned to find a man in the scarlet coat of an officer staring at him with the most prodigious moustaches that Tom had ever seen. I suppose I am, Tom replied, forcing himself to look away and continue his search of the crowd. He was paying little attention to the man, his mind solely focused on finding patience. I'm to understand that congratulations may soon be in order, the officer continued, gesturing carelessly with a glass of punch. I expect so, Tom answered absently, trying not to pay any heed to the man. It was difficult to look at him, hat with his bushy facial topery, and the way the buttons of his jacket pulled most alarmingly across his belly. Wait, congratulations? May I ask why, sir? Tom said, snapping back to look at the officer. Oh, you needn't be coy with me, chappy, the officer said, his eyes crinkling up in a smile. He nudged Tom playfully with his elbow. She doesn't come with the best prospects, but there's no better ornament for a man's arm. I, what? Tom demanded, his eyes narrowing. It's an understood fact in London, circles that you and the Stanton girl will be signing marriage contracts soon, the officer said unconcerned. He punctuated his sentence by gulping down the last of his punch. Icy dread creep down Tom's spine as if poured form a bucket over his head. He simply stared at the man for a moment, agog. He didn't know how to respond. A denial formed on his lips, but it would surely ring hollow. If this is what's being said in London, then... With widened eyes, he turned and began searching for patience again in earnest. Without so much as a by your leave, he simply turned on his heel and walked away from the officer, who was left to bluster a little to no one in particular about young rascals with modern manners. The crowd was thick about the edges of the ballroom, as the dancing would surely commence soon. Tom was busy craning his head when he felt a gentle tap on his shoulder. He turned, hoping that it was patience, but found him staring instead directly at Annabella. Have you seen patience? she asked without preamble. I haven't laid eyes on her all night, and she's frequently in your company during these events. Annabella trailed off, glancing behind Tom as if he might have secreted her in some hidden pocket. I have not, he confirmed. I've been looking for her myself. Have you indeed? Annabella replied, refocusing her attention on Tom. Her large green eyes assessed him. And why might that be? Tom nervously ran his fingers through his hair, and then immediately regretted it, for they were now sticky with pomatum. He opened his mouth to give a blasé answer, as was his first instinct, but Annabella quirked an eyebrow at him. He knew that it would do no good to lie to her, or to give a half answer, as she was far too perceptive for that. I must speak with her, he said earnestly. I must tell her. A kind of hush fell over the crowd then. Not silence exactly, but the collective sound of most turning to appreciate something new. There was the rustling of silk gowns, and a sort of group sigh, as one might utter at the sight of something pleasing, like a sunset. Tom and Annabella turned as well, and Tom thought that he might die from the perfection of the moment. Atop the short flight of stairs that led from the double-doored entrance of the ballroom stood Patience. She was perfectly poised aloof and regal, outfitted in shades of gold and amber. She looked every bit the part of a harvest goddess, putting Demeter to shame. Her late arrival, intentional or otherwise, had been perfectly timed for the greatest impact. The footman who had been announcing guests obligingly announced patience in a voice that rang out across the ballroom. 
Lady Patience Carnegie, daughter of the late Duke of Carnegie. This announcement was met with yet another murmur of the crowd, which greeted Patience as she descended the few stairs. Tom could hear the people about him nudging and whispering to each other, catching snippets of disbelief that this was the same reclusive girl. That's the Carnegie lass, the unmarried one. Impossible. It must be her, she has the Duke's famous eyes. I'd heard she was hiding somewhere in the countryside again. It would seem at least that rumour was true. It's hard to countenance that it's the same girl. She's blossomed into a real beauty. Tom heard these words but did not register them. He felt like a Greek hero of myth, bewitched out of his senses. His feet simply carried him forward, sidling past people without a care as to who he offended. It was impossible to tell if he even breathed in that moment. His eyes were fixed on patients, who moved through the crowd with ease. Conversation resumed around them again, the attention of the guests being a short and fickle thing. Tom kept his eyes fixed upon her, willing her to see him. As if she had heard his unspoken wishes, Patience's indigo eyes slid to Tom as she strolled slowly. She did not turn her head, merely looking at him askance through hooded eyes, as if she were deigning to acknowledge him. It was a magnificent display of well-cultured snobbery, and Tom loved every second of it. He found one side of his mouth curling up in an approving grin, pausing in his tracks. The moment was short-lived, however, as Patience passed before a group of guests, all eyes turned to watch her as she went. Tom was fixated on her, such that he did not notice for several moments that one of the guests was staring right back at him. He would have known those dark, nearly obsidian eyes anywhere, the fetching curve of the lips. It turned out that he had been breathing, for all of the air whooshed out of him in a trice as if he had been struck in the stomach. It was Lady Eva Stanton smirking at him cat-like, as if he were a mouse in a corner. Chapter 34 To say that Tom was a man caught between two consuming desires would be an understatement. On the one hand, he maintained his need to speak to patience, to declare and declaim all that was in his heart. On the other hand, his desire to avoid Eva until everything was settled. He was inclined to ignore Eva and her mocking smile and continue in his pursuit of patience, until he saw that Eva was not alone. Beside her, the loyal and capricious Kitty Johnson, which was not wholly unexpected. However, it was the sight of his father, looming like a gargoyle over Eva's shoulder that really made his blood run cold. Well, that settles it, Tom decided at once. He was contemplating how to flee without being seen when Annabella called for everyone's attention. Honoured guests, she began a little timidly but gaining in strength as she spoke, I am so happy to see so many of you here to celebrate my darling husband's birthday. Tom knew that it was impolite to blind his ears to what she was saying, but Annabella had unwittingly provided him an out, and he was keen to take swift advantage of it. Without a second thought, Tom pivoted and ducked his way into the crowd. He didn't have a long-term plan other than simply avoiding the trio that surely bode ill for him. If he could, he might make it safely to the stables. And then... And then what indeed? His inner self asked ruefully. It really would be quite rude to steal one of the Duke's horses, especially on his birthday. Once again, indecision proved to be a fatal flaw. From behind him, he could hear the unmistakable voice of Lady Eva. Tom, if you would wait a moment. Ah, there you are, Tom said, playing as if he had just recognised someone across the crowd. Ducking a little to hide his tall frame, he dove back into the crowd. And this pattern continued for at least a quarter of an hour, with Tom slouching his way through the crowd, which was pressed in along the edges of the ballroom. Tom was fairly certain that they appeared like something out of a satirical cartoon, the young ladies chasing the eligible nobleman all across the ballroom. He was just beginning to feel a little smug about his escape, when in a moment he was looking over his shoulder, he ran smack into patience. Tom, whatever are you? she asked, her face limbed with confusion. Glancing over his shoulder again, Tom grasped patience by the shoulders. 
Listen to me, Patience. It is of vital importance that you don't listen to a thing anyone says tonight. Does that include you? she asked archly, lifting one eyebrow. What? No. Maybe, I don't know just now, but I will come and find you when I'm able. Tom, I really do not have the patience for these games. Patience began, but was cut off by a sudden dimming of the lights. Several of the candles were being snuffed, plunging the ballroom into dimness. Out on the dance floor, a troop of professional dancers was taking to the floor in an array of costumes. Tom took quick advantage of this distraction, quietly slipping away from Patience and making for the door. Tom didn't take a breath until he was fully out of the ballroom. He made his way on light feet to a drawing room, slipping quietly through the door that had been closed to discourage curious guests. With a sigh, he quietly pushed the door to open and was at the point of latching it when a voice from behind him spoke. Sneaking off from a ball again. Didn't that cause you a bit of bother the last time you did that? Tom was not too proud to admit that he nearly gave a very unmanly shriek of surprise. He turned slowly, his heart pounding. Lady Eva sat within the drawing room, her arms folded and an expectant look on her face. At her side was a lone candlestick perched on a side table, casting a macabre light over her face. Eva? How in the world did you... Oh, please, Tom, she said with a dismissive wave of one gloved hand. I should think that I know you well enough after all these years to know when you'll be scarpering from a ballroom. It only stood to reason that you choose a room with a closed door, and Kitty was waiting for you in the sitting room. Fair enough, he admitted grudgingly. I imagine your little impish friend will be joining us shortly then. I imagine so, Eva agreed. Now, I understand that you have been in quite the fix these past few weeks. Tom said nothing, not wishing to betray his position or lack of knowledge on the subject. There's no need to look so severe, Eva admonished him. I'm not here to ruin you. Aren't you? He was unable to help but reply. Heavens no, Eva said, her teeth showing a little in the dark as she smiled. I, for one... I'm not ready to have my entire future decided by one drunken kiss. Drunken kiss, Tom repeated, his eyes narrowing. Wait, at the assembly room that night your mother flew into such a rage. The very same, Eva confirmed. That's it? A kiss? Tom demanded incredulously. As if young men haven't been stealing hundreds of kisses the entirety of this season out from under chaperone's noses. I thought... You thought it was something far worse, yes, Eva supplied. I do believe that was the angle my mother was scheming for. She wished to trap you into a marriage and, well, you know our circumstances. I can offer her no defence except to say that she is a mother in a situation that grows more desperate. Tom blew out a sigh and floundered about for a chair into which he threw himself. Then, then I'm a free man. I'm absolved. Completely, Ava agreed. I snuck to your father's house and told him the whole of it. He was quite grumpy with me and still thinks you've been wasting your time in London, but overall on a far more even keel. Oh, thank the gods, Tom muttered, putting his forehead in his palm. That's only slightly offensive, Eva said with a pointed look at him. I don't mean to be, I just... I have a clear glimpse of my future for the first time, and I don't wish to jeopardise it. Ah, yes, Eva said, smiling again. Kitty told me that she'd met your little paramour in London. She's not, at least. I don't think she is. Maybe. She's a very good friend, Tom explained. Well, I can't say I'm an expert on the matter, but I believe that marriage between friends is the best sort, don't you? Eva asked. She stood and shook out her gown, smoothing some of the wrinkles in the silk. Are you sure about all of this? Tom asked, catching Eva's arm as she attempted to pass by him. You'd tell me if you weren't, wouldn't you? I'm sure, Eva said. Shall we seal our new understanding with a kiss? Ha! Tom said, but obligingly lifted his cheek. Eva pressed a brief kiss to him, squeezed his arm and was gone. In her wake, 
Tom was left in a swirl of emotions, relief and hope paramount among them. All that remained was to sort things out with his father, which may not have been helped by his dashing around and avoiding the Earl all night. And of course there was Patience. He immediately began to plan a proper proposal for Patience. She deserved more than a hasty declaration in a crowded ballroom. She deserved every romantic gesture that she had ever wanted, dreamed about, read in one of her novels. Flattened against the wall, Patience closed her eyes and wished herself invisible. She wished for this, not simply so she could avoid detection as the door to the drawing room opened and Lady Eva stepped out, but also so that she might be exempt from visible emotion as well. She held her breath, hoping against hope that she would continue to remain unnoticed. Her body was still, but her mind and her heart reeled. She had not intended to get caught up in whatever intrigue Tom was embroiled in. But when she had seen Lady Eva watching him and leaving the ballroom, well, Patience had read enough novels to know when a plot was afoot. She had been tempted to follow Miss Johnson, but had seen Tom and decided to try to find him instead. Her mother had told her more than once that listening at doorways would cause her nothing but misery, and this prophecy at last caught up with Patience. She had hovered outside the door, which was open only a crack. It was clear that she had arrived in the midst of some conversation, possibly even a tryst. But I believe that marriage between friends is the best sort, don't you? Patience heard Lady Eva ask. Are you sure about all of this? came Tom's reply. You'd tell me if you weren't, wouldn't you? And then, the final nail in the coffin. I'm sure, Eva said. Shall we seal our new understanding with a kiss? That was too much for patience. Her heart ached, her legs felt strange and weak. Beyond the hurt was anger, both at Tom and herself. She simply couldn't countenance that she had developed affections for a man so unworthy. So, and Tom. She had believed that he had reformed, that he was becoming someone worthy of her regard. Now she could see it clearly. He would do anything to get what he wanted, stealing kisses in dark rooms at any opportunity. The truly damning thing was that it seemed as if he and Lady Eva had reached an understanding. They'd probably announce it soon. Patience wished she could be far away when it happened preferably on the moon, but at least across the ocean. She couldn't even really begrudge them this, for they seemed infinitely well suited. Tom clearly needed a woman that was as fast as he was, that could keep up with him, with a mercenary streak. Tears, hot and heavy as molten lead, blurred Patience's vision. Blindly she turned and fled through the main hall, hands outstretched to find the stairway railing. She thought she heard Annabella call her name once but Patience would not be deterred. Up in the quiet sanctuary of her room, she locked herself away, physically and mentally. Chapter 35 It was so late that it was early, and the guests had mostly either found their rooms or their carriages. The house was quieting, though an occasional shriek of laughter, usually followed by hurried steps and a slamming door, still rang out. The drawing room, however, remained shrouded in darkness and silence. Tom was grateful for this, as he wished to remain undetected for the time being. He was worried that if he should speak to anyone, then the whole of his heart would simply come tumbling out, and he wished to confess to Patience first and foremost. He may have dozed, for he was suddenly jolted to awareness. The candle had burnt itself out, the wick gone a cold. Out in the hall... Voices speaking in the hushed but urgent tones of trying to contain an impending disaster bandied back and forth. Groggily, Tom stood, rubbing at one eye with a fist. He debated about simply ignoring whatever was happening, but his curiosity overcame his hesitation. He poked his head out in the hallway and was greeted by a committee of irritated persons. The moment the door creaked open, all turned to stare at him with varying degrees of accusation and hostility. The Duke and Duchess, his father, the butler, and Miss Johnson. You! his father cried, marching forward. What have you done this time? I what? 
Tom stuttered, uncomprehending. I'm not sure that's fair, Lord Chester, Annabella began, clearly wishing to mediate whatever shouting match was brewing. Let's simply figure out what Tom may know. Well, at least we know it's not an elopement, Lord Chester muttered darkly. It still might be, Kitty piped up, her cheerful tone completely incongruous with the tension in the air. She simply could have gone ahead, and he plans to meet her. That is not in Patience's character, and I shall thank you kindly to keep your assumptions about my sister to yourself, Annabella snapped. Chastened, Kitty fell quiet, but not without casting sullen looks at Tom. The Duke stepped forward, raising his hand for silence. Tom, when is the last time you saw Patience? Glancing from face to face, attempting to understand his part in this, Tom said, earlier, just as the performers were beginning. The Duke stared hard at Tom, clearly attempting to ascertain the truth of his words. You haven't seen her since. Did she say anything to you of her plans? Plans? What plans? Tom demanded, his own eyes narrowing now. What precisely is happening? The Duke looked to Annabella, who bit her lip but relented and addressed Tom. She seems to have left. She rang for her maid shortly after midnight and ordered the carriage. She seems to have packed only the bare essentials. A letter was left on her pillow. What did it say? Tom asked. That she did not feel like herself any longer and knew what her place was now. She said that she was foolish to hope for anything different, Annabella said, her eyes filling and her throat working. This is all my fault, she sobbed, her face suddenly crumpling. She put her hand to mouth, trying to contain herself. I knew that all was not well with her, and I was just so busy with my own petty problems that I... Annabella, hush, the Duke said, pulling Annabella to himself and placing a sheltering arm about her shoulders. I have never known a more dedicated and devoted sister. What time is it now? Tom demanded, looking at the assembled. Half past four in the morning, the Duke replied. She can't have gotten far. The road will be dark and no offence, but these country roads are not built for speed, Tom said, pacing a little. Do you know where she's gone? Annabella asked, her face and her voice watery. I have a suspicion, Tom said grimly. I expect back to her mother's. I believe she intends to shut herself up again. Oh, oh no, she can't, Annabella gasped. We have to reach her before then. I have to reach her before then, Tom said already setting off for the stairs. He would dash up, find an overcoat and boots as quick as he could. If he set off now, he could... Wait, why you? Miss Johnson asked, wrinkling up her little nose. Oh, oh, do you intend to make a declaration? Once again, all eyes were upon Tom. Undeterred, Tom straightened and lifted his chin. I am not ashamed to admit that I love her beyond all reason. Oh, Kitty said, her nose wrinkling farther. Then you should probably know that it is likely she overheard you and Eva earlier last night. Heard you what? Lord Chester demanded, his voice rising. Boy, if you are creating mischief again, calm yourself, my lord, or you'll rupture something, a smooth voice said from behind the earl. All turned to find Lady Eva standing there, her hair down and dressed in a warm dressing gown. You know that Tom was innocent in all of that. Here, she said, coming forward and putting a small letter into Tom's hand. I had a notion that this might come in handy. What is this? Tom asked, turning it over in his hands. Don't worry, Eva said with a warm smile. It will set everything right. Now I am off to bed, and you've a damsel to go and rescue. This was all the encouragement that Tom needed. He didn't hesitate, simply bowled through everyone and set off up the stairs. To his surprise, there were no protests, only a kind of shocked silence after his departure. He took the stairs two at a time, bounding down the hall without a care for who heard him. Once in his room, he attempted to shimmy out of his jacket, tearing at the buttons. The cut was so close that he struggled for a moment to do it on his own before he felt a pair of gentle hands helping him. Startled, he whirled and found Annabella staring back at him evenly. Come, turn around and let's find you a riding jacket, 
she murmured. With her help, he managed to shrug out of his evening tales, casting them aside carelessly. He clawed at his high stock and cravat desperately trying to loosen them. While he did so, Annabella located a dark blue riding jacket, polished leather boots and hat. Working in concert, they managed to get him outfitted in record time. Annabella said nothing further, merely squeezed his arm once he was dressed. Tom understood that this was all the sign of support that she could give. She was helping him to pursue her sister, and that was all that needed to be said. Tom paused only long enough to press a quick kiss to her cheek, and then he was off, back down the stairs. Downstairs the hall was empty, everyone presumably having scattered to bed. Tom, his smooth leather soles skittering a little on the polished wooden floor, stumbled and galloped his way out the door into the stables. The Duke was waiting in the mews, a fiery chestnut with long legs bridled and saddled next to him. This is High Flyer, the Duke said. Her grandfather raced at Newmarket, and I dare say she's a sight faster than Brutus. Tom didn't hesitate, merely sprang up into the saddle as the Duke handed the reins over the horse's head. She stamped and gnawed at the bit, Tom's own nerves and eagerness infectious. He was about to put his heels into her sides when the Duke reached up and caught one of the reins. They'll have taken the toll road, you can cut them off if you cut through the orchard over the stone wall and across old Norman's farm, the Duke said, pointing westward. Tom nodded once. The Duke released the horse and Tom set off, the horse's hooves clattering on the paved brick of the stable yard. Highflyer was as good as her name and eagerly lengthened her stride the moment they hit the gravel drive. She ate up the distance eagerly, the iron gates looming ahead. Tom's stomach dropped. He'd completely forgotten about them and would have to wait as the ancient gatehouse attendant opened them. To his surprise, a figure stepped out of the arched doorway of the gatehouse, standing straight and tall. As Tom neared the gate, the figure became clearer. It was his father, his face inscrutable. With some difficulty, Tom pulled his mount up, who pranced sideways in frustration. The Earl said nothing for a moment, the two staring at each other in a silent battle of wills. At last, the Earl stepped forward, unlatched the gate, and with a strength Tom didn't know he had, pushed the gate forward. Father, Tom asked, confused but grateful. If you truly love her, then do not hesitate, his father said. Go and get her. He grinned up at his son and added, Let's see if you're good for anything in the saddle except chasing after foxes. Tom couldn't help but grin in response. Once again he dug his heels into the horse's sides and they were off like a shot in the dark. It was a risky thing, galloping across the countryside before the sun was up. But Tom was willing to risk anything, everything if it meant that he could have patience. Epilogue The sky was beginning to lighten, and Patience leaned sullenly against the window. She had a blanket across her lap, her eyes heavy. Sleep beckoned her, but every time she dozed off, she was jolted back to wakefulness by the memory of Tom's words to Eva. If her eyes hadn't felt so tired and swollen, she might have cried more. As it was, she was resolved to shed no more tears for someone who did not deserve it. Across from her, Mary, the poor thing, dozed openly, her head lolling back against the squabs. She snored lightly, her mouth open. Patience sighed to herself, wishing that her mood weren't so black so she could laugh at the sight as was warranted. Instead, she folded her hands up in the blanket tighter, for the autumn morning was chilly. So preoccupied with her own misery, Patience did not notice the gradual increase in speed of the carriage. They had been forced to travel at a slow pace, hampered by the dark and the sleepy reluctance of the horses. It wasn't until they were moving at quite a clip that Patience realised that they were travelling quite quickly, especially given that the sun wasn't wholly risen. She sat up, looking about in alarm. She thought that she might have heard a man's voice shouting, but the constant clatter of the carriage wheels was too hard to hear over properly. Mary, ignorant of any impending trouble, snored on. Mary! Patience hissed, kicking Mary's foot with her own. Wake up! 
With a snort like that of a narcoleptic pig, Mary startled Wake. She blinked at Patience, looking about with sleepy confusion. My lady? What? Stop the carriage! There was no mistaking it now. There was a man that was shouting at the driver. Fast-moving hooves were heard as well. A rider was bearing down on them. Mary and Patience exchanged a look, their faces draining of colour. Highwaymen were a possibility, they both knew that, but it hadn't occurred to either that they could possibly be held up in such a manner. Patience had even entertained girlish fantasies about dashing robbers at one point, but the reality was entirely different. Your jewellery, quick! Mary hissed, reaching forward to help Patience unclasp the little gold crucifix about her neck. Patience quickly pulled her gold and pearl ear bobs out as well, not having time to remove them after she changed from the ball. She bent as if to put them in her shoe, but Mary caught her hand. No, not there. They'll look for sure. Quickly, my lady, in your stays. Patience was contemplating the merits of shoving her precious items into her stays when the carriage suddenly lurched and ground to a halt. The action was so sudden that Patience, unprepared, tumbled off the bench and into Mary's lap. Judging by the shouting of the driver, someone had seized one of the lead horse's heads. There was scarcely a moment for Patience to right herself, so she simply turned on the carriage floor to face the door. Her legs were coiled up as she leaned backward on her hands. There were a few agonising moments of silence, in which there were no sounds except for the snorts and neighs of horses. When at last the door was wrenched open, Patience kicked out blindly with her feet, catching whoever it was squarely in the torso. There, oof, the person grunted, sprawling backward onto the ground outside. My lady, Mary gasped in awe and surprise. Patience, meanwhile, was attempting to scramble up and see who it was. Perched on the edge of the bench, she leaned out and saw, Tom, she asked in disbelief, staring out at Tom, flopped inelegantly on the ground. With wide eyes, he glared back up at Patience. Well, I'm not sure I warrant the warmest of welcomes, but I'm not sure I deserved that, he groused. Slowly, he climbed to his feet, brushing his hands off on his coat. I'm so sorry, I thought you were a highwayman and... Patience stopped short, her eyes narrowing. Wait, what on earth are you doing here? I can't think of anything we have to say to each other. You're wrong on that score. We've a great deal to say to each other, Tom said, prowling forward like a predator. Placing one hand on each side of the doorframe, he leaned in to glare at Patience. For starters, how dare you make me fall in love with you and run off like this? You worried us all sick. I'm only going to my mother's house, not... Once again, Patience found herself stopping short as she spoke. A curious feeling was blooming in her chest, and her heart was beating rapidly. You... you're in love with me, she asked, her voice small and breathy. Of course I am, Tom said, as if it were the most obvious thing in the world. I suspect I have been for some time. Patience merely stared, unable to take it all in. From the corner of her eye, she could see Mary trying very hard to not look like she was listening intently. I don't know what to say, Patience said merely because she felt that she needed to say something. Wait, yes I do, she continued, recovering herself. I'm sure that this will interfere with your plans for Lady Eva. To her surprise, Tom merely sighed. Honestly, Patience, it is a good thing you're not in society. You'd put all the gossips to shame. There is no understanding between Lady Eva and myself. No? I heard you both declare as much last night. Patience retorted, lifting her chin proudly. Just read this, if you please, Tom said, fishing about in his inner jacket pocket. He withdrew a small cream-coloured letter. Wary, Patience glanced at Mary, who nodded imperceptibly. With hesitating fingers, Patience accepted the letter, ripping past the wax seal. Tom did her the courtesy of allowing her to read the missive in silence. It was short, only a few lines long, and Patience read them twice over. The second read was a little more difficult, however, for her eyes were beginning to blur with tears again. 
Well, Tom demanded at last, what does she say? Patience cleared her throat, trying to swallow around the lump that had formed there. She says that I'm a fool to accept you, she began, Tom visibly slumping at this declaration. She also says that I'm an even greater fool if I do not marry you, Patience finished, smiling through her tears. Even through her impaired vision, she could see Tom's face break into a handsome smile. Well, what say you then? he asked. Suddenly, to everyone's great shock, Patience was launching herself at Tom, throwing her arms about her neck. For a shy young lady, this was so unexpected as to be shocking. Tom stumbled backward a step or two, but wrapped his arms about her waist nonetheless. Their faces were only a breath apart, and then Patience's soft lips were on Tom's. She did not have experience with kissing, but what she lacked in expertise, she more than made up for with feeling. For the third time in short succession, Tom found himself nearly falling over there in the road. He recovered himself quickly, tightening his embrace. When they parted at last, Tom released her just enough to stand on the road, but still holding her close. Now, I'm not complaining, but I must know. What on earth was that? he asked, looking a little dazed. I owed you a kiss, Patience explained, feeling a little smug and light-headed all at once. My mother always says that a lady pays her debts. I'm inclined to agree, Tom replied easily, and pulled Patience to him again. This time, he cradled the back of her head in one hand, savouring a kiss the like of which he had never known to exist. And that is how Lady Patience, second daughter of a duke, great-great-granddaughter of a king, and a thoroughly proper young lady, became engaged in the middle of a road. But what about Lady Eva Stanton? Well, there is only one lord who can teach her the steps of the dance of love. But can five lessons lead to a lifetime of love? Read Ava's story now. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video, and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.